Chapter One of Tommy and Grizel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beyond Utopia, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry. Chapter One How Tommy Found a Way. O. P. Pym the colossal Pym, that vast and rolling figure, who never knew what he was to write about until he dipped grandly an author in such demand that on the foggy evening which starts our story his publishers have had his boots removed lest he slip thoughtlessly round the corner before his work is done, as was the great man's way. Shall we begin with him, or with Tommy, who has just arrived in London, carrying his little black box and leading a lady by the hand. It was Pym, as we are about to see, who in the beginning held Tommy up to the public gaze. Pym, who first noticed his remarkable indifference to female society. Pym, who gave him but a lack. Does no one remember Pym for himself? Is the king of the penny number already no more than a button? that once upon a time kept Tommy's person together? And we are at the night when they first met. Let us hasten into Marylebone before little Tommy arrives, and Pym is swallowed like an oyster. This is the house, 22 Little Owlet Street, Marylebone, but which were his rooms it is less easy to determine, for he was a lodger, who flitted placidly from floor to floor according to the state of his finances carrying his apparel and other belongings in one great armful and spilling by the way on this particular evening he was on the second floor front which had a fireplace in the corner furniture all his landladies and mostly horsehair little to suggest his calling save a noble saucer full of ink and nothing to draw attention from pym who lolled gross and massive on a sofa one leg over the back of it the other drooping his arms extended and his pipe which he could find nowhere thrust between the buttons of his waistcoat an agreeable pipe rack he wore a yellow dressing gown or could scarcely be said to wear it, for such of it as was not round his neck he had converted into a cushion for his head, which is perhaps the part of him we should have turned to first. It was a big, round head, the plentiful grey hair in tangles, possibly because in Pym's last flitting the comb had dropped over the banisters the features were ugly and beyond life-size yet the forehead had altered little except in colour since the day when he was near being made a fellow of his college there was sensitiveness left in the thick nose humour in the eyes though they so often watered the face had gone to flabbiness at last but not without some lines and dents as if the head had resisted the body for a space before the whole man rolled contentedly downhill. He had no beard. Young man, let your beard grow. Those who have forgotten all else about Pym may recall him in these words. They were his one counsel to literary aspirants, who, according as they took it are now bearded and prosperous or shaven and on the rates to shave costs threepence another threepence for loss of time nearly ten pounds a year three hundred pounds since pym's chin first bristled with his beard he could have bought an annuity or a cottage in the country he could have had a wife and children, and driven his dog-cart, and been made a church-warden. All gone, all shaved, and for what? 
when he asked this question he would move his hand across his chin with a sigh and so bravely to the barber's pym was at present suffering from an ailment that had spread him out on that sofa again and again acute disinclination to work meanwhile all the world was waiting for his new tale so the publishers two little round men have told him they have blustered they have fawned they have asked each other out to talk it over behind the door has he any idea of what the story is to be about he has no idea then at least pym excellent pym sit down and dip and let us see what will happen he declined to do even that while all the world waited this was pym's ultimatum i shall begin the damned thing at eight o'clock outside the fog kept changing at intervals from black to white as lazily from white to black the monster blinking there was not a sound from the street save of pedestrians tapping with their sticks on the pavement as they moved forward warily afraid of an embrace with the unknown it might have been a city of blind beggars one of them a boy at eight o'clock pym rose with a groan and sat down in his stocking soles to write his delicious tale he was now alone but though his legs were wound round his waste-paper basket and he dipped often and loudly in the saucer like one ringing at the door of fancy he could not get the idea that would s set him going he was still dipping for inspiration when t sandis who had been told to find the second floor for himself knocked at the door and entered quaking i remember it vividly pym used to say when questioned in the after years about his first sight of tommy and i hesitate to decide which impressed me more the richness of his voice so remarkable in a boy of sixteen or his serene countenance with its noble forehead behind which nothing base could lurk pym pym it is such as you that makes the writing of biography difficult the richness of tommy's voice could not have struck you for at that time it was a somewhat squeaky voice and as for the noble forehead behind which nothing base could lurk how could you say that pym when you had such a noble forehead yourself no all that pym saw was a pasty-faced boy sixteen years old and of an appearance mysteriously plain hair light brown and waving defiance to the brush nothing startling about him but the expression of his face which was almost fearsomely solemn and apparently unchangeable he wore his sunday blacks of which the trousers might with advantage have borrowed from the sleeves and he was so nervous that he had to wet his lips before he could speak he had left the door ajar for a private reason but pym misunderstanding thought he did it to fly the more readily if anything was flung at him and so concluded that he must be a printer's devil pym had a voice that shook the mantelpiece ornaments he was all on the same scale as his ink pot your christian name boy he roared hopefully for it was thus he sometimes got the idea that started him thomas replied the boy pym gave him a look of disgust you may go he said but when he looked up presently thomas was still there he was not only there but whistling a short encouraging whistle that seemed to be directed at the door he stopped quickly when pym looked up but during the remainder of the interview 
he emitted this whistle at intervals always with that anxious glance at his friend the door and its strained joviality was in odd contrast with his solemn face like a cheery tune played on the church organ be gone cried pym my full name explained tommy who was speaking the english correctly but with a scots accent is thomas sandus and fine you know who that is he added exasperated by pym's indifference i'm the t sandus that answered your advertisement pym knew who he was now you young ruffian he gasped i never dreamt that you would come i have your letter engaging me in my pocket said tommy boldly and he laid it on the table pym surveyed it and him in comic dismay then with a sudden thought produced nearly a dozen letters from a drawer and dumped them down beside the other it was now his turn to look triumphant and tommy aghast pym's letters were all addressed from the dub of prosen farm near thrums n b to different advertisers care of a london agency and were tommy's answers to the wants in a london newspaper which had found its way to the far north x y z was in need of a chemist's assistant and from his earliest year said one of the letters chemistry had been the study of studies for t sandus he was glad to read was t sandus that one who did not object to long hours would be preferred for it seemed to him that those who objected to long hours did not really love their work their heart was not in it and only where the heart is can the treasure be found one two three had a vacancy for a page boy glasgow man for photographer page boy must not be over fourteen photographer must not be under twenty i am a little over fourteen but i look less wrote t sandys to one two three i am a little under twenty he wrote to glasgow man but i look more his heart was in the work to be a political organizer if h and h who advertised for one only knew how eagerly the undersigned desired to devote his life to political organizing in an answer to scholastic's advertisement for janitor in a boys school t sandus begged to submit his name for consideration undoubtedly the noblest letter was the one applying for the secretaryship of a charitable society salary to begin at once but the candidate selected must deposit one hundred pounds the application was noble in its offer to make the work a labor of love and almost nobler in its argument that the hundred pounds was unnecessary rex had a vacancy in his drapery department t sandus had made a unique study of drapery lastly anon wanted an amanuensis salary said anon who seemed to be a humorist salary large but uncertain he added with equal candor drudgery great but to an intelligent man the pickings may be considerable pickings is there a finer word in the language t sandys had felt that he was particularly good at pickings but amanuensis the thing was unknown to him no one on the farm could tell him what it was but never mind his heart was in it all this correspondence had produced one reply the letter on which tommy's hand still rested it was a brief note signed o p pym and engaging mr sandys on his own recommendation if he really felt quite certain that his heart treasure included was in the work so far so good tommy had thought when he received this answer 
but there was nothing in it to indicate the nature of the work nothing to show whether o p pym was scholastic or one two three or rex or any other advertiser in particular stop there was a postscript i need not go into details about your duties as you assure me that you are so well acquainted with them but before you join me please send in writing a full statement of what you think they are there were delicate reasons why mr sandys could not do that but oh he was anxious to be done with farm labour so he decided to pack and risk it the letter said plainly that he was engaged what for he must find out slyly when he came to london so he had put his letter firmly on pym's table but it was a staggerer to find that the gentleman was in possession of the others one of these was pym's by right the remainder were a humorous gift from the agent who was accustomed to sift the correspondence of his clients pym had chuckled over them and had written the reply that he flattered himself would stump the boy then he had unexpectedly come into funds he had found a forgotten check while searching his old pockets for tobacco crumbs and in that glory t sandus escaped his memory result that they were now face to face a tiny red spot not noticeable before now appeared in tommy's eyes it was never there except when he was determined to have his way pym my friend yes and every one of you who is destined to challenge tommy wear that red light well which am i demanded pym almost amused tommy was so obviously in a struggle with the problem the saucer and blank pages told nothing whichever you are the boy answered heavily it's not herding nor foddering cattle and so long as it's not that i'll put my heart in it and where the heart is there the treasure he suddenly remembered that his host must be acquainted with the sentiment easy-going pym laughed and then said irritably of what use could a mere boy be to me then it's not the page boy exclaimed tommy thankfully perhaps i am scholastic suggested pym no said tommy after a long study of his face pym followed this reasoning and said touchily many a schoolmaster has a red face not that kind of redness explained tommy without delicacy i am h and h said pym you forget you wrote to me as one person replied tommy so i did that was because i am the chemist and i must ask you thomas for your certificate tommy believed him this time and pym triumphantly poured himself a glass of whisky spilling some of it on his dressing gown not you said tommy quickly a chemist has a steady hand confound you cried pym what sort of boy is this if you had been the draper you had would have wiped the drink off your gown continued tommy thoughtfully and if you had been glasgow man then you would have sucked it off and if you had been the charitable society you wouldn't swear in company he flung out his hand i'll tell you who you are he said sternly you're a non under this broadside pym succumbed he sat down feebly right he said with a humorous groan and i shall tell you who you are i am afraid you are my amanuensis tommy immediately whistled a louder and more glorious note than before don't be so cocky cried pym in sudden rebellion you are only my amanuensis if you can tell me what that is if you can't out you go he had him at last not he an amanuensis said tommy calmly 
is one who writes to dictation. Am I to bring in my box? It's at the door. This made Pym sit down again. You didn't know what an amanuensis was when you answered my advertisement, he said. As soon as I got to London, Tommy answered, I went into a bookseller's shop, pretending I wanted to buy a dictionary, and I looked the word up. Bring in your box, Pym said with a groan. But it was now Tommy's turn to hesitate. Have you noticed, he asked awkwardly, that I sometimes whistle? Don't tell me, said Pym, that you have a dog out there. It's not a dog, Tommy replied cautiously. Pym had resumed his seat at the table and was once more toying with his pen. Open the door, he commanded, and let me see what you have brought with you. Tommy obeyed gingerly, and then Tim gaped, for what the open door revealed to him was a tiny roped box with a girl of twelve sitting on it. She was dressed in some dull-colored wincy, and looked cold and patient and lonely, and as she saw the big man staring at her, she struggled in alarm to her feet, and could scarce stand on them. Tommy was looking apprehensively from her to Pym. "'Good God, boy!' roared Pym. "'Are you married?' "'No,' cried Tommy in agony. "'She's my sister.' and we're orphans, and did you think I could have the heart to leave Elspeth behind? He took her stoutly by the hand. And he never will marry, said little Elspeth almost fiercely. Will you, Tommy? Never, said Tommy, patting her and glaring at Pym. But Pym would not have it. Married! he shouted, magnificent, and he dipped exultantly, for he had got his idea at last. Forgetting even that he had an amanuensis, he wrote on and on and on. He smells of drink, Elspeth whispered. All the better, replied Tommy cheerily. Make yourself at home, Elspeth. He's the kind I can manage. Was there ever a kind I could not manage? He whispered, top-heavy with conceit. There was Grizel, Elspeth said rather thoughtlessly, and then Tommy frowned. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Tommy and Grizel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry. Chapter 2 The Search for the Treasure. Six years afterwards, Tommy was a famous man, as I hope you do not need to be told. But you may be wondering how it came about. The whole question, in Pym's words, resolves itself into how the solemn little devil got to know so much about women. It made the world marvel when they learned his age, but no one was quite so staggered as Pym, who had seen him daily for all those years, and been damning him for his indifference to the sex during the greater part of them. It began while he was still no more than an amanuensis, sitting with his feet at the waste-paper basket, Pym dictating from the sofa, and swearing when the words would not come unless he was perpendicular. Among the duties of this amanuensis was to remember the name of the heroine, her appearance, and other personal details. For Pym constantly forgot them in the night, and he had to go searching back through his pages for them, cursing her so horribly that Tommy signed to Elspeth to retire to her tiny bedroom at the top of the house. He was always most careful of Elspeth, and with the first pound he earned he insured his life, leaving all to her but told her nothing about it, lest she should think it meant his early death. As she grew older, he also got good dull books for her from a library, and gave her a piano on the higher system, and taught her many things about life, very carefully selected from his own discoveries. Elspeth out of the way, he could give Pym all the information he wanted. 
Her name is Felicity, he would say at the right moment. She has curly brown hair in which the sun strays, and a blushing neck, and her eyes are like blue lakes. Height, roared Pym. Have I mentioned it? No, but she is about five feet six. How the— Could you know that? You tell Percy's height in his stocking soles, and when she reached to his mouth and kissed him, she had to stand on her tiptoes so to do. Tommy said this in a most businesslike tone, but could not help smacking his lips. He smacked them again when he had to write, Have no fear, little woman, I am by your side. Or, What a sweet child you are. Pym had probably fallen into the way of making the Percys revel in such epithets, because he could not remember the girl's name. But this delicious use of the diminutive, as addressed to full-grown ladies, went to Tommy's head. His solemn face kept his secret, but he had some narrow escapes, as once, when saying good night to Elspeth, he kissed her on the mouth, eyes, nose, and ears, and said, "'Shall I tuck you in, little woman?' He came to himself with a start. "'I forgot,' he said hurriedly, and got out of the room without telling her what he had forgotten." Pym's publishers knew their man, and their arrangement with him was that he was paid on completion of the tale. But always before he reached the middle he struck for what they called his honorarium, and this troubled them, for the tale was appearing week by week as it was written. If they were obdurate, he suddenly concluded his story in such words as these. Several years have passed since these events took place, and the scene changes to a lovely garden by the bank of Old Father Thames. A young man sits by the soft flowing stream, and he is calm as the scene itself, for the storm has passed away, and Percy, for it is no other, has found an anchorage. As he sits there musing over the past, Felicity steals out by the French window and puts her soft arms around his neck. My little wife, he murmurs, the end, unless you pay up by messenger. This last line, which was not meant for the world, but little would Pym have cared, though, had it been printed usually brought his employers to their knees, and then, as Tommy advanced in experience, came the pickings. For Pym, with money in his pockets, had important engagements round the corner, and risked entrusting his amanuensis with the writing of the next installment, all except the bang at the end. Smaller people, in Tommy's state of mind, would have hurried straight to the love passages, but he saw the danger and forced his pegasus away from them. Do your day's toil first, he may be conceived, saying to that animal, and at even fall I shall let you out to browse. So, with this reward in front, he devoted many pages to the dreary adventures of pretentious males, and even found a certain pleasure in keeping the lady waiting. But as soon as he reached her he lost his head again. Oh, you beauty, you small pet, he said to himself, with solemn transport. As the artist in him was stirred, great problems presented themselves. For instance, in certain circumstances, was darling, or little one, the better phrase? Darling in solitary grandeur is more pregnant of meaning than little one, but little has a flavor of the patronizing which darling perhaps lacks. He wasted many sheets over such questions, but they were in his pocket when Pym or Elspeth opened the door. It is wonderful how much you can conceal between the touch on the handle and the opening of the door, if your heart is in it. Despite this fine practice, however, he was the shyest of mankind in the presence of women, and this shyness grew upon him with the years. Was it because he never tried to uncork himself? Oh, no. It was about this time that he, one day, put his arm around Clara, the servant, not passionately, but with deliberation, as if he were making an experiment with machinery. He then listened as if to hear Clara ticking. He wrote an admirable love letter, warm, dignified, sincere, to nobody in particular, and carried it about in his pocket in readiness. But in love-making, as in other arts, those do it best who cannot tell how it is done, and he was always stricken with a palsy when about to present that letter. It seemed that he was only able to speak to ladies when they were not there. Well, if he could not speak, he thought the more, he thought so profoundly that in time the heroines of Pym ceased to thrill him. This was because he had found out that they were not flesh and blood. But he did not delight in his discovery. It horrified him, for what he wanted was the old thrill. To make them human, so that they could be his little friends again. Nothing less was called for. This meant slaughter here and there of the great Pym's brain work, and Tommy tried to keep his hands off, but his heart was in it. In Pym's pages the ladies were the most virtuous and proper of their sex, though dreadfully persecuted 
but he merely told you so at the beginning and now and again afterwards to fill up and then allowed them to act with what may be called rashness so that the story did not really suffer before tommy was nineteen he changed all that out went this because she would not have done it and that because she could not have done it fathers might now have taken a lesson from t sandys in the upbringing of their daughters he even sternly struck out the diminutives with a pen in his hand and a woman in his head he had such noble thoughts that his tears of exultation damped the pages as he wrote and the ladies must have been astounded as well as proud to see what they were turning into that was tommy with a pen in his hand and a handkerchief hard by but it was another tommy who when the finest bursts were over sat back in his chair and mused the lady was consistent now and he would think about her and think and think until concentration which is a pair of blazing eyes seemed to draw her out of the pages to his side and then he and she sported in a way forbidden in the tale while he sat there with eyes riveted he had her to dinner at a restaurant and took her up the river and called her little woman and when she held up her mouth he said tantalizingly that she must wait until he had finished his cigar this queer delight enjoyed back he popped her into the story where she was again the vehicle for such glorious sentiments that elspeth to whom he read the best of them feared he was becoming too good to live in the meantime the great penny public were slowly growing restive and at last the two little round men called on pym to complain that he was falling off and pym turned them out of doors and then sat down heroically to do what he had not done for two decades read his latest work elspeth go upstairs to your room whispered tommy and then he folded his arms proudly he should have been in a tremble but latterly he had often felt that he must burst if he did not soon read some of his bits to pym more especially the passages about the hereafter also the opening of chapter seventeen at first pym's only comment was it is the same old drivel as before what more can they want but presently he looked up puzzled is this chapter yours or mine he demanded it is about half and half said tommy is mine the first half where does yours begin that is not exactly what i mean explained tommy in a glow but backing a little you wrote that chapter first and then i i you rewrote it roared pym you dared to meddle with he was speechless with fury i tried to keep my hand off tommy said with dignity but the thing had to be done and they are human now human who wants them to be human the fiends seize you boy you have been tinkering with my heroine's personal appearance what is this you have been doing to her nose i turned it up slightly that's all said tommy i like them down roared pym i prefer them up said tommy stiffly where cried pym turning over the leaves in a panic where is the scene in the burning house it's out tommy explained but there is a chapter in its place about it's mostly about the beauty of the soul being everything and mere physical beauty nothing oh mr pym sit down and let me read it to you but pym read it and a great deal more for himself no wonder he stormed for the impossible had been made not only consistent but unreadable the plot was lost for chapters the characters no longer did anything and then went and did something else you were told instead how they did it you were not allowed to make up your own mind about them you had to listen to the mind of t sandys he described and he analyzed the road he had tried to clear through the thicket was impassable for chips a few more weeks of this said pym and we should all three be turned out into the streets tommy went to bed in an agony of mortification but presently to his side came pym where did you copy this from he asked it is when we are thinking of those we love that our noblest thoughts come to us and the more worthy they are of our love the nobler the thought hence it is that no one has done the greatest work who did not love god i copied it from nowhere replied tommy fiercely it's my own well it has nothing to do with the story and so is only a blot on it and i have no doubt the thing has been said much better before still i suppose it is true it's true said tommy and yet go on i want to know all about it and yet said tommy puzzled i've no noble thoughts come to me when i was listening to a brass band pym chuckled funny things noble thoughts he agreed he read another passage it was the last half hour of the day when i was admitted with several others to look upon my friend's dead face a handkerchief had been laid over it i raised the handkerchief 
I know not what the others were thinking, but the last time we met he had told me something. It was not much, only that no woman had ever kissed him. It seemed to me that as I gazed, the wistfulness came back to his face. I whispered to a woman who was present, and stooping over him, she was about to, but her eyes were dry and I stopped her. The handkerchief was replaced, and all left the room save myself. Again I raised the handkerchief. I cannot tell you how innocent he looked. "'Who was he?' asked Pym. "'Nobody,' said Tommy, with some awe. "'It just came to me. Do you notice how simple the wording is? It took me some time to make it so simple.' "'You are just nineteen, I think.' "'Yes.' Pym looked at him wonderingly. "'Thomas,' he said, "'you are a very queer little devil.' He also said, "'And it is possible you may find the treasure you are always talking about.' Don't jump to the ceiling, my friend, because I say that. I was once after the treasure myself, and you can see whether I found it. From about that time, on the chances that this mysterious treasure might spring up in the form of a new kind of flower, Pym zealously cultivated the ground, and Tommy had an industrious time of it. He was taken off his stories, which at once regained their elasticity, and put on to exercises. If you have nothing to say on the subject, say nothing was one of the new rules, which few would have expected from Pym. Another was, as soon as you can say what you think, and not what some other person has thought for you, you are on the way to being a remarkable man. Without concentration, Thomas, you are lost. Concentrate, though your coattails be on fire. Try your hand at description, and when you have done chortling over the result, reduce the whole by half without missing anything out. Analyze your characters and their motives at the prodigious length in which you revel, and then, my sonny, cut your analysis out. It is for your own guidance, not the reader's. I have often noticed, you are always saying, this story has nothing to do with you. Obliterate yourself. I see that will be your stiffest job. Stop preaching. It seems to me the pulpit is where you should look for the treasure. Nineteen, and you are already as didactic as seventy. And so on. Over his exercises, Tommy was now engrossed for so long a period that, as he sits there, you may observe his legs slowly lengthening and the coming of his beard. No, his legs lengthened as he sat with his feet in the basket, but I feel sure that his beard burst through prematurely some night when he was thinking too hard about the ladies. There were no ladies in the exercises, for, despite their altercation about noses, Pym knew that on this subject Tommy's mind was a blank but he recognized the sex's importance, and becoming possessed once more of a black coat, marched his pupil into the somewhat shoddy drawing-rooms that were still open to him, and there ordered Tommy to be fascinated for his future good. But it was as it has always been. Tommy sat white and speechless and apparently bored, could not even say, you sing with so much expression, when the lady at the pianoforte had finished. Shyness I could pardon, the exasperated Pym would roar, but want of interest is almost immoral. At your age the blood would have been coursing through my veins. Love! You are incapable of it. There is not a drop of sentiment in your frozen carcass. Can I help that? growled Tommy. It was an agony to him even to speak about women. If you can't, said Pym, all is over with you. An artist without sentiment is a painter without colors. Young man, I fear you are doomed. And Tommy believed him, and quaked. He had the most gallant struggles with himself. He even set his teeth and joined a dancing class, though neither Pym nor Elspeth knew of it, and it never showed afterwards in his legs. In appearance he was now beginning to be the Sandys of the photographs, a little over the middle height and rather heavily built, nothing to make you uncomfortable until you saw his face. That solemn countenance never responded when he laughed, and stood coldly by when he was on fire. He might have winked for an eternity, and still the onlooker must have thought himself mistaken. In his boyhood the mask had descended scarce below his mouth, for there was a dimple in the chin to put you at ease, but now the short brown beard had come, and he was forever hidden from the world. He had the dandy's taste for superb neckties, velvet jackets, and he got the ties instead of dining. He panted for the jacket, knew all the shop windows it was in, but for years denied himself with a moan, so that he might buy pretty things for Elspeth. When eventually he got it, Pym's friends ridiculed him. When he saw how ill his face matched it, he ridiculed himself. Often when Tommy was feeling that now at last the ladies must come to heel, he saw his face suddenly in a mirror, and all the spirit went out of him. 
but still he clung to his velvet jacket. I see him in it, stalking through terrible dance moves, a heroic figure at last. He shuddered every time he found himself on one leg. He got sternly into everybody's way. He was the butt of the little noodle of an instructor. All the social tortures he endured grimly, in the hope that at last the cork would come out. Then, though there were all kinds of girls in the class, merry, sentimental, practical, coquettish, prudes, there was no kind, he felt, whose heart he could not touch. In love-making, as in the favorite Thrums game of the Dambrod, there are sixty-one openings, and he knew them all. Yet at the last dance, as at the first, the universal opinion of his partners, shop-girls mostly, from the large millinery establishments, who had to fly like Cinderella's when the clock struck a certain hour, was that he kept himself to himself, and they were too much the lady to make up to a gentleman who so obviously did not want them. Pym encouraged his friends to jeer at Tommy's want of interest in the sex, thinking it a way of goading him to action. One evening, the bottles circulating, they mentioned one dolly, goddess at some bar, as a fit instructress for him. Coarse pleasantries passed, but for a time he writhed in silence, then burst upon them indignantly for their unmanly smirching of a woman's character, and swept out, leaving them a little shamed. That was very like Tommy. But presently a desire came over him to see this girl, and it came because they had hinted such dark things about her. That was like him also. There was probably no harm in Dolly, though it is a man's proud right to question it in exchange for his bitters. She was tall and willowy, and stretched her neck like a swan, and returned you your change with a disdainful languor. To call such a haughty beauty Dolly was one of the minor triumphs for man, and Dolly they all called her, except the only one who could have given an artistic justification for it. This one was a bearded stranger who, when he knew that Pym and his friends were elsewhere, would enter the bar with a cigar in his mouth and ask for a whiskey and water, which was heroism again, for smoking was ever detestable to him, and whiskey more offensive than quinine. But these things are expected of you, and by asking for the whiskey you get into talk with Dolly. That is to say, you tell her several times what you want, and when she has served every other body you get it. The commercial must be served first. In the bar room he blocks the way like royalty in the street. There is a crown for us all somewhere. Dolly seldom heard the bearded one's good evening. She could not possibly have heard the deer, for though it was there it remained behind his teeth. She knew him only as the stiff man who got separated from his glass without complaining, and at first she put this down to forgetfulness and did nothing, so that he could go away without drinking. But by and by, wherever he left his tumbler, cunningly concealed behind a water bottle, or temptingly in front of a commercial, she restored it to him, and there was a tringle in her eye. "'You little rogue, so as you see through me!' Surely it was an easy thing to say, but what he did say was, "'Thank you!' Then to himself he said, "'Ass, ass, ass!' Sitting on the padded seat that ran the length of the room, and surreptitiously breaking his cigar against the cushions to help it on its way to an end, he brought his intellect to bear on Dolly at a distance, and soon had a better knowledge of her than could be claimed by those who had dollied her for years. He also wove romances about her, some of them of too lively a character, and others so noble and sad and beautiful that the tears came to his eyes, and Dolly thought he had been drinking. He could not have said whether he would prefer her to be good or bad. These were but his leisure moments, for during the long working hours he was still at the exercises, toiling fondly and right willing to tear himself asunder to get at the trick of writing. So he passed from exercises to the grand experiment. It was to be a tale, for there they had taken for granted lay the treasure. Pym was most considerate at this time, and mentioned woman with an apology. I have kept away from them in the exercises, he said, in effect, because it would have been useless, as well as cruel, to force you to labor on a subject so uncongenial to you, and for the same reason I have decided that it is to be a tale of adventure, in which the heroine need be little more than a beautiful sack of coals, which her cavalier carries about with him on his left shoulder. I am afraid we must have her to that extent, Thomas, but I am not asking much of you. Dump her down as often as you like. And Thomas did his dogged best, the red light in his eye, though he had not, and never could have had, the smallest instinct for story-writing. He knew to the fingertips how it is done. But forever he would have gone on breaking all the rules of the game. How he wrestled with himself. 
sublime thoughts came to him nearly all about that girl and he drove them away for he knew they beat only against the march of his story and whatever befall the story must march relentlessly he followed in the track of his men pushing the dreary dogs on to deeds of valor he tried making the lady human and then she would not march she sat still and he talked about her he dumped her down and soon he was yawning this weariness was what alarmed him most for well he understood that there could be no treasure where the work was not engrossing play and he doubted no more than pym that for him the treasure was in the tale or nowhere had he not been sharpening his tools in this belief for years strange to reflect now that all the time he was hacking and sweating at that novel the last he ever attempted it was only marching towards the waste paper basket he had a fine capacity as has been hinted for self-deception and in time of course he found a way of dodging the disquieting truth this equally of course was by yielding to his impulses he allowed himself an hour a day when pym was absent in which he wrote the story as it seemed to want to write itself and then he cut his piece out which could be done quite easily as it consisted only of moralizings thus was his day brightened and with this relaxation to look forward to be plodded on at his proper work delving so hard that he could avoid asking himself why he was still delving what shall we say he was digging for the treasure in an orchard and every now and again he came out of his hole to pluck an apple but though the apple was so sweet to the mouth it never struck him that the treasure might be growing overhead at first he destroyed the fruit of his stolen hour and even after he took to carrying it about fondly in his pocket and to rewriting it in a splendid new form that had come to him just as he was stepping into bed he continued to conceal it from his overseer's eyes and still he thought all was over with him when pym said the story did not march it is a dead thing pym would roar flinging down the manuscript a dead thing because the stakes your man is playing for a woman's love is less than a wooden counter to you you are a fine piece of mechanism my solemn-faced don but you are a watch that won't go because you are not wound up nobody can wind the artist up except a chit of a girl and how you are ever to get one to take pity on you only the gods who look after men with a want can tell it becomes more impenetrable every day he said no use your sitting there tearing yourself to bits out into the street with you i suspend these sittings until you can tell me you have kissed a girl he was still saying this sort of thing when the famous letters were published t sandy's author letters to a young man about to be married was the full title and another almost applicable would have been bits cut out of a story because they prevented its marching if you have any memory you do not need to be told how that splendid study so ennobling so penetrating of woman at her best took the town tommy woke a famous man and except elspeth no one was more pleased than big-hearted hopeless bleary pym but how the has it all come about he kept roaring a woman can be anything that the man who loves her would have her be says the letters and oh said woman everywhere if all men had the same idea of us as mr sandys to meet mr t sandys leaders of society wrote it on their invitation cards their daughters a thirst for a new sensation thrilled at the thought will he talk to us as nobly as he writes and oh how he was willing to do it especially if their noses were slightly tilted end of chapter two chapter three of tommy and grizel this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry. Chapter 3 Sandy's on Woman. Can you kindly tell me the name of the book I want? It is the commonest question asked at the circulating library by dainty ladies just out of the carriage, and the librarian after looking them over can usually tell in the days we have now to speak of however he answered without looking them over sandy's letters ah yes of course may i have it please i regret to find that it is out then the lady looked naughty why don't you have two copies she pouted madam said the librarian we have a thousand a small and very timid girl of eighteen with a neat figure that shrank from observation, 
although it was already aware that it looked best in grey, was there to drink in this music, and carried it home in her heart. She was Elspeth, and that dear heart was almost too full at this time. I hesitate whether to tell or to conceal how it even created a disturbance in no less a place than the House of Commons. She was there with Mrs. Jerry, and the thing was recorded in the papers of the period in these blasting words. The Home Secretary was understood to be quoting a passage from Letters to a Young Man, but we failed to catch its drift, owing to an unseemly interruption from the ladies' gallery. "'But what was it you cried out?' Tommy asked Elspeth, when she thought she had told him everything. Like all true women, she always began in the middle. "'Oh, Tommy, have I not told you? I cried out, "'I'm his sister!' Thus, owing to Elspeth's behavior, it can never be known which was the passage quoted in the house, but we may be sure of one thing, that it did the house good. That book did everybody good. Even Pym could only throw off its beneficent effects by a tremendous effort, and young men about to be married used to ask at the bookshops, not just for the letters, but simply for Sandy's on Women. Sandy's on Woman. Acknowledging Tommy as the authority on the subject, like Mill on Jurisprudence, or Thompson and Tate on the Differential Calculus. Controversies raged about it. Some thought he asked too much of man, some thought he saw too much in women. There was a fear that young people, knowing at last how far short they fell of what they ought to be, might shrink from the matrimony that must expose them to each other, now that they had Sandys to guide them, and the persons who had simply married and risked it, and it was astounding what a number of them there proved to be, wrote to the papers suggesting that he might yield a little in the next edition. But Sandys remained firm. At first, they took for granted that he was a very aged gentleman. He had indeed hinted at this in the text, and when the truth came out, and just fancy he's not even married, the enthusiasm was doubled. Not engaged, they cried. Don't tell that to me. No unmarried man could have written such a eulogy of marriage without being on the brink of it. Perhaps she was dead. It ran through the town that she was dead. Some knew which cemetery. The very first lady Mr. Sandys ever took in to dinner mentioned this rumor to him, not with vulgar curiosity, but delicately, with a hint of sympathy in waiting, and it must be remembered, in fairness to Tommy, that all artists love sympathy. This sympathy uncorked him, and our Tommy could flow comparatively free at last. Observe the delicious change. Has that story got abroad, he said simply, the matter in one which I need not say I have never mentioned to a soul. Of course not, the lady said, and waited eagerly. If Tommy had been an expert, he might have turned the conversation to brighter topics, but he was not. There had already been long pauses, and in dinner talk it is perhaps allowable to fling on any faggot rather than let the fire go out. It is odd that I should be talking of it now, he said musingly. I suppose, she said gently, to bring him out of the reverie into which he had sunk, I suppose it happened some time ago? Long, long ago, he answered. Having written as an aged person, he often found difficulty in remembering suddenly that he was two and twenty. But you are still a very young man. It seems long ago to me, he said with a sigh. Was she beautiful? She was beautiful to my eyes, and as good, I am sure, as she was beautiful. Ah, me, said Tommy. His confidant was burning to know more and hoping they were being observed across the table, but she was a kind, sentimental creature, though stout, or because of it, and she said, I'm so afraid that my questions pain you. No, no, said Tommy, who was very, very happy. Was it very sudden? 
fever. Ah, but I meant your attachment. We met and we loved, he said with gentle dignity. That is the true way, said the lady. It is the only way, he said decisively. Mr. Sandys, you have been so good. I wonder if you would tell me her name. Felicity, he said with emotion. Presently he looked up. It's very strange to me, he said wonderingly, to find myself saying these things to you who an hour ago were a complete stranger to me. But you are not like other women. No, indeed, said the lady warmly. That, he said, must be why I tell you what I have never told to another human being. How mysterious are the workings of the heart. Mr. Sandys, said the lady, quite carried away, no words of mine can convey to you the pride with which I hear you say that. Be assured that I shall respect your confidences. She missed his next remark because she was wondering whether she dared ask him to come to dinner on the 25th, and then the ladies had to retire, and by the time he rejoined her, he was as tongue-tied as at the beginning. The cork had not been extracted. It had been knocked into the bottle, where it still often barred the way, and there was always, as we shall see, a flavor of it in the wine. You will get over it yet. The summer and the flowers will come to you again, she managed to whisper to him kind-heartedly as she was going. Thank you, he said, with that inscrutable face. It was far from his design to play a part. He had, indeed, had no design at all, but an opportunity for sentiment having presented itself, his mouth had opened as at a cherry. He did not laugh afterwards, even when he reflected how unexpectedly Felicity had come into his life. He thought of her rather with affectionate regard, and pictured her as a tall, slim girl in white. When he took a tall, slim girl in white into dinner, he could not help saying huskily, you remind me of one who was a very dear friend of mine. I was much startled when you came into the room. You mean someone who is dead? She asked in awestruck tones. Fever, he said. You think I am like her in appearance? In every way, he said dreamily. The same sweet, pardon me, but it is very remarkable. Even the tones of the voice are the same. I suppose I ought not to ask your age. I shall be twenty-one in August. She would have been twenty-one in August had she lived, Tommy said with fervor. My dear young lady, this was the aged gentleman again, but she did not wince. He soon found out that they expect authors to say the oddest thing, and this proved to be a great help to him. My dear young lady, I feel that I know you very well. That, she said, is only because I resemble your friend outwardly. The real me, she was a bit of a philosopher also. You cannot know it all. He smiled sadly. Has it ever struck you, he asked, that you are very unlike other women? Oh, however could you have found that out, she exclaimed, amazed. Almost before he knew how it came about, he was on terms of very pleasant sentiment with this girl, for they now shared between them a secret that he had confided to no one. His face, which had been so much against him hitherto, was at last in his favor. It showed so plainly that when he looked at her more softly or held her hand longer than is customary, he was really thinking of that other of whom she was the image or, if it did not precisely show that, it suggested something or other of that nature which did just as well. There was a sweet something between them which brought them together and also kept them apart. It allowed them to go a certain length, while it was also reason why they could never, never exceed that distance. And this was an ideal state for Tommy, who could be most loyal and tender so long as it was understood that he meant nothing in particular. She was the right kind of girl, too, and admired him the more. 
and perhaps went a step further, because he remained so true to Felicity's memory. You must not think him calculating and cold-blooded, for nothing could be less true to the fact. When not engaged, indeed, on his new work, he might waste some time planning scenes with exquisite ladies, in which he sparkled and or had a hidden sorrow, he cared not which. But these scenes seldom came to life. He preferred very pretty girls to be rather stupid. Oh, the artistic instinct of the man. But instead of keeping them stupid, as he wanted to do, he found himself trying to improve their minds. They screwed up their noses in the effort, meaning to thrill the celebrated beauty who had been especially invited to meet him. He devoted himself to a plain woman, for whose plainness a sudden pity had mastered him. For, like all true worshippers of beauty and women, he always showed best in the presence of plain ones. With the intention of being a gallant knight, to lady I won't tell the name, a whim of the moment made him so stiff to her that she ultimately asked the reason. And such a charmingly sad reason presented itself to him that she immediately invited him to her Riverside party on Thursday week. He had the conversations and incidents for that party ready long before the day arrived. He altered them and polished them as other young gentlemen in the same circumstances overhaul their boating costumes. But when he joined the party, there was among them the children's governess. And seeing her slighted, his blood boiled and he was her attendant for the afternoon. Elspeth was not at this pleasant jink in high life. She had been invited, but her ladyship had once let Tommy kiss her hand for the first and last time, so he decided sternly that this was no place for Elspeth. When temptation was nigh, he first locked Elspeth up and then walked into it. With two in every three women, he was still as shy as ever. But the third he escorted triumphantly to the conservatory. She did no harm to his work, rather sent him back to it refreshed. It was as if he were shooting the sentiment, which other young men get rid of more gradually by beginning earlier, and there were such accumulations of it that I don't know whether he ever made up on them. Punishment sought him in the night, when he dreamed constantly that he was married, to whom scarcely mattered. He saw himself coming out of a church, a married man, and the fright woke him up. But with the daylight came again his talent for dodging thoughts that were lying in wait, and he yielded as recklessly as before to every sentimental impulse. As illustration, take his humorous passage with Mrs. Jerry. Geraldine something was her name, but her friends called her Mrs. Jerry. She was a wealthy widow, buxom, not a day over thirty when she was married, which might be at inappropriate moments, as immediately after she had expressed a desire to lead the higher life. But I have a theory, my dear, she said solemnly to Elspeth, that no woman is able to do it who cannot see her own nose without the help of a mirror. She had taken a great fancy to Elspeth and made many engagements with her and kept some of them, and the understanding was that she apprenticed herself to Tommy through Elspeth, he being too terrible to face by himself, or, as Mrs. Jerry expressed it, all knows. So Tommy had seen very little of her and thought less, until one day he called by passionate request to sign her birthday book, and heard himself proposing to her instead. For one thing, it was twilight, and she had forgotten to ring for the lamps. That might have been enough, but there was more. She read to him part of a letter in which her hand was solicited in marriage. And for the life of me, said Mrs. Jerry, almost in tears, I cannot decide whether to say yes or no. This put Tommy in a most awkward position. There are probably men who could have got out of it without proposing, but to him there seemed at the moment no other way open. 
The letter complicated matters also by beginning Dear Jerry and saying Little Jerry further on, expressions which stirred him strangely. Why do you read this to me, he asked, in a voice that broke a little. Because you are so wise, she said. Do you mind? Do I mind? he exclaimed bitterly. Take care, you idiot, he said to himself. I was asking your advice only. Is it too much? Not at all. I am quite the right man to consult at such a moment, am I not? It was said with profound meaning, but his face was as usual. That is what I thought, she said in all good faith. You do not even understand, he cried, and he was also looking longingly at his hat. Understand what? Jerry, he said, and tried to stop himself with the result that he added. Dear little Jerry, what am I doing? he groaned. She understood now. You don't mean, she began in amazement. Yes, he cried passionately. I love you. Will you be my wife? I am lost. Gracious, exclaimed Mrs. Jerry, and then on reflection she became indignant. I would not have believed it of you, she said scornfully. Is it my money or what? I'm not at all clever, so you must tell me. With Tommy, of course, it was not her money. Except when he had Elspeth to consider, he was as much a Quixote about money as Pym himself and at no moment of his life was he a snob. "'I'm sorry you should think so meanly of me,' he said with dignity, lifting his hat, and he would have got away then, which, when you come to think of it, was what he wanted, had he been able to resist an impulse to heave a broken-hearted sigh at the door. "'Don't go yet, Mr. Sandys,' she begged. "'I may have been hasty, and yet... Why, we are merely acquaintances. He had meant to be very careful now, but that word sent him off again. Acquaintances, he cried. No, we were never that. It almost seemed to me that you avoided me. You noticed it, he said eagerly. At least you do me that justice. Oh, how I tried to avoid you. It was because, alas, she was touched, of course, but still puzzled. We know so little of each other, she said. I see, he replied, that you know me very little, Mrs. Jerry, but you, oh, Jerry, Jerry, I know you as no other man has ever known you. I wish I had proof of it, she said helplessly. Proof? She should not have asked Tommy for proof. I know, he cried how unlike all other women you are. To the world you are like the rest, but in your heart you know that you are different. You know it, and I know it, and no other person knows it. Yes, Mrs. Jerry knew it, and had often marveled over it in the seclusion of her boudoir, but that another should have found it out was strange and almost terrifying. I know you love me now, she said softly. Only love could have shown you that. But, oh, let me go away for a minute to think, and she ran out of the room. Other suitors have been left for a space in Tommy's state of doubt, but never, it may be hoped, with the same emotions. Oh, heavens, if she should accept him. He saw Elspeth sickening and dying of the news. His guardian angel, however was very good to Tommy at this time, or perhaps, like cannibals with their prisoner, the god of sentiment, who has a tail, was fattening him for a future feast, and Mrs. Jerry's answer was that it could never be. Tommy bowed his head, but she hoped he would let her be his very dear friend. It would be the proudest recollection of her life that Mr. Sandys had entertained such feelings for her. Nothing could have been better, and he should have found difficulty in concealing his delight. But this strange Tommy was really feeling his part again. It was an unforced tear that came to his eye. Quite naturally, he looked long and wistfully at her. Jerry, Jerry, he articulated huskily, 
and whatever the words mean in these circumstances he really meant. Then he put his lips to her hand for the first and last time, and so was gone, broken but brave. He was in splendid fettle for writing that evening. Wild animals sleep after gorging, but it sent this monster refreshed to his work. Nevertheless, the incident gave him some uneasy reflections. Was he indeed a monster? Was one that he could dodge as yet? But suppose Mrs. Jerry told his dear Elspeth of what had happened. She had said she would not, but a secret in Mrs. Jerry's breast was like her pug in her arms, always kicking to get free. Elspeth, said Tommy, what do you say to going north and having a sight of Thrums again? He knew what she would say. They had been talking for years of going back. It was a great day that all her correspondence with old friends in Thrums looked forward to. They made little of you, Tommy, she said, when we left, but I'm thinking they will all be at their windows when you go back. Oh, replied Thomas, that's nothing, but I should like to shake Cor by the hand again. And Aaron, said Elspeth. She was knitting stockings for Aaron at that moment. And Gavinia, Tommy said. And the Domini. And A. Lee. And then came an awkward pause, for they were both thinking of that independent girl called Grizel. She was seldom discussed. Tommy was oddly shy about mentioning her name. He would have preferred Elspeth to mention it, and Elspeth had misgivings that this was so, with the result that neither could say Grizel without wondering what was in the other's mind. Tommy had written twice to Grizel, the first time unknown to Elspeth, but that was in the days when the ladies of the penny numbers were disturbing him, and against his better judgment, for well he knew she would never stand it, he had begun his letter with these mad words. Dear little woman, she did not answer this, but soon afterwards she wrote to Elspeth, and he was not mentioned in the letter proper, but it carried a sting in its tail. P.S., it said, how is sentimental Tommy? None but a fiend in human shape could have written thus, and Elspeth put her protecting arms around her brother. Now we know what Grizel is, she said. I am done with her now. But when Tommy had got back his wind, and he said nobly, I'll call her no names. If this is how she likes to repay me for, for all my kindness, let her. But Elspeth, if I have the chance, I shall go on being good to her just the same. Elspeth adored him for it. But Grizel would have stamped had she known. He had that comfort. The second letter he never posted. It was written a few months before he became a celebrity and had very fine things indeed in it. For old Dr. McQueen, Grizel's dear friend, had just died at his post and it was a letter of condolence. While Tommy wrote it, he was in a quiver of genuine emotion as he was very pleased to feel, and it had a specially satisfying bit about death, and the world never being the same again. He knew it was good, but he did not send it to her, for no reason I can discover, save that postscripts jarred on him. End of chapter 3 Recording by Sheila Blunt Chapter 4 of Tommy and Grizel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry. Chapter 4 Grizel of the Crooked Smile. To expose Tommy for what he was to appear to be scrupulously fair to him so that I might really damage him the more. That is what I set out to do in this book, and always when he seemed to be finding a way of getting round me, as I had a secret dread he might do. I was to remember Grizel 
and be obdurate. But if I have so far got past some of his virtues without even mentioning them, and I have, I know how many opportunities for discrediting him have been missed, and that would not greatly matter, there are so many more to come, if Grizel were on my side. But she is not. Throughout those first chapters, a voice has been crying to me. Take care. If you hurt him, you will hurt me. And I know it to be the voice of Grizel, and I seem to see her, rocking her arms as she used to rock them when excited in the days of her innocent childhood. Don't, don't, don't. She cried at every cruel word I gave him, and she, to whom it was ever such agony to weep, dropped a tear upon each word, so that they were obliterated. And surely I knew him best, she said, and I always loved him. And she stood there defending him, with her hand on her heart, to conceal the gaping wound that Tommy had made. Well, if Grizel had always loved him, there was surely something fine and rare about Tommy. But what was it, Grizel? Why did you always love him? You who saw into him so well and demanded so much of men. When I ask that question, the spirit that hovers round my desk to protect Tommy from me rocks her arms mournfully, and as if she did not know the answer. It is only when I seem to see her as she so often was in life, before she got that wound and after bending over some little child and looking up radiant, and I think I suddenly know why she always loved Tommy. It was because he had such need of her. I don't know whether you remember, but there were once some children who played at Jacobites in the Thrums' den under Tommy's leadership. Elspeth, of course, was one of them, and there were Corpshiach and Gavinia, and lastly there was Grizel. Had Tommy's parents been alive, she would not have been allowed to join, for she was a painted lady's child. But Tommy insisted on having her, and Grizel thought it was just sweet of him. He also chatted with her in public places, as if she were a respectable character. And oh, how she longed to be respectable. But on the other hand, he was the first to point out how superbly he was behaving, and his ways were masterful. So the independent girl would not be captain's wife. If he said she was captain's wife, he had to apologize. And if he merely looked it, he had to apologize just the same. One night, the painted lady died in the den, and then it would have gone hard with the lonely girl had not Dr. McQueen made her his little housekeeper. Not out of pity, he vowed. She was so anxious to be told that, but because he was an old bachelor sorely in need of someone to take care of him, and how she took care of him. But though she was so happy now, she knew that she must be very careful, for there was something in her blood that might waken and prevent her being a good woman. She thought it would be sweet to be good. She told all this to Tommy, and he was profoundly interested, and consulted a wise man, whose advice was that when she grew up, she should be wary of any man whom she liked and mistrusted in one breath. Meaning to do her a service, Tommy communicated this to her, and then, what do you think? Grizel would have no more dealings with him. By and by the gods, in a sportive mood, sent him to labor on a farm, whence, as we have seen, he found a way to London, and while he was growing into a man, Grizel became a woman. At the time of the doctor's death, she was nineteen, tall and graceful, and very dark and pale. When the winds of the day flushed her cheek, she was beautiful, but it was a beauty that hid the mystery of her face. The sun made her merry but she looked more noble when it had set. Then her pallor shone with a soft, radiant light, as though the mystery and sadness and serenity of the moon were in it. The full beauty of Grizel came out only at night, like the stars. I had made up my mind that when the time came to describe Grizel's mere outward appearance, I should refuse her that word beautiful because of her tilted nose. But now that the time has come, I wonder at myself. Probably, when I am chapters ahead, I shall return to this one and strike out the word beautiful, and then, as likely as not, I shall come back afterwards and put it in again. 
Whether it will be there at the end, God knows. Her eyes, at least, were beautiful. They were unusually far apart and let you look straight into them and never quivered. They were such clear, gray, searching eyes, they seemed always to be asking for the truth. And she had an adorable mouth. In repose it was, perhaps, hard because it shut so decisively, but often it screwed up provokingly at one side, as when she smiled, or was sorry, or for no particular reason. For she seemed unable to control this vagary, which was perhaps a little bit of babyhood that had forgotten to grow up with the rest of her. At those moments, the essence of all that was characteristic and delicious about her seemed to have run to her mouth, so that to kiss Grizel on her crooked smile would have been to kiss the whole of her at once. She had a quaint way of nodding her head at you when she was talking. It made you forget what she was saying, though it was really meant to have precisely the opposite effect. Her voice was rich with many inflections. When she had much to say, it gurgled like a steam in a hurry. But its cooling note was best worth remembering at the end of the day. There were times when she looked like a boy. Her almost gallant bearing, the poise of her head, her noble frankness, they all had something in them of a princely boy who had never known fear. I have no wish to hide her defects. I would rather linger over them, because they were part of Grizel, and I am sorry to see them go one by one. Thrums had not taken her to its heart. She was a proud purse, they said, meaning she had a haughty walk. Her sense of justice was too great. She scorned frailties that she should have pitied. How strange to think that there was a time when pity was not the feeling that leaked to Grizel's bosom first. She did not care for study. She learned French and the piano fort to please the doctor, but she preferred to be sewing or dusting. When she might have been reading, she was perhaps making for herself one of those costumes that annoyed every lady of Thrums who employed a dressmaker. Or more probably, it was a delicious garment for a baby. For as soon as Grizel heard that there was a new baby anywhere, all her intellect deserted her, and she became a slave. Books often irritated her because she disagreed with the author, and it was a torment to her to find other people holding to their views when she was so certain that hers were right. In church, she sometimes rocked her arms, and the old doctor by her side knew that it was because she could not get up and contradict the minister. She was, I presume, the only young lady who ever dared to say that she hated Sunday, because there was so much sitting still in it. Sitting still did not suit Grizel. At all other times she was happy. But then her mind wandered back to the thoughts that had lived too closely with her in the old days, and she was troubled. What woke her from these reveries was probably the doctor's hand placed very tenderly on her shoulder. And then she would start and wonder how long he had been watching her and what were the grave thoughts behind his cheerful face. For the doctor never looked more cheerful than when he was drawing Grizel away from the ugly past, and he talked to her as if he had noticed nothing. But after he went upstairs, he would pace his bedroom for a long time, and Grizel listened and knew that he was thinking about her. Then perhaps she would run up to him and put her arms around his neck. These scenes brought the doctor and Grizel very close together, but they became rarer as she grew up. And then for once that she was troubled, she was a hundred times irresponsible with glee. And, oh, you dearest, darlingest, she would cry to him, I must dance, I must, I must, though it is a fast day, and you must dance with your mother this instant. I'm so happy, so happy. Mother was his nickname for her. And she delighted in the word. She lorded it over him as if he were her troublesome boy. How could she be other than glorious when there was so much to do? The work inside the house she made for herself, and outside the doctor made it for her. At last he had found for nurse a woman who could follow his instructions, literally, who understood that if he said five o'clock for the medicine, the chap of six would not do as well. 
who did not in her heart despise the thermometer, and who resolutely prevented the patient from skipping out of bed to change her pillow slips, because the minister was expected. Such tyranny enraged every sufferer who had been ill before and got better. But what they chiefly complained of to the doctor, and he agreed with a humorous sigh, was her masterfulness about fresh air and cold water. Windows were opened that had never been opened before. They yielded to her pressure with a groan. And as for cold water, it might have been said that a bath followed her wherever she went. Not, mark me, for putting your hands and face in, not even for your feet, but in you must go, the whole of you. As if, they said indignantly, there was something the matter with our skin. She could not gossip, not even with the doctor, who liked it of an evening when he had got into his carpet shoes. There was no use telling her a secret, for she kept it to herself forevermore. She had ideas about how men should serve a woman, even the humblest, that made the men gaze with wonder, and the women, curiously enough, with irritation. Her greatest scorn was for girls who made themselves cheap with men, and she could not hide it. It was a physical pain to Grizel to hide her feelings. They popped out in her face, if not in words, and were always in advance of her self-control. To the doctor, this impulsiveness was pathetic. He loved her for it, but it sometimes made him uneasy. He died in the scarlet fever year. I'm smitten, he suddenly said at a bedside, and a week afterwards he was gone. We must speak of it now, Grizel, he said, when he knew that he was dying. She pressed his hand. She knew to what he was referring. Yes, she said, I should love you to speak of it now. You and I have always fought shy of it, he said, making a pretense that it had altogether passed away. I thought that was best for you. Dearest, darlingest, she said, I know, I have always known. And you, he said, you pretended because you thought it was best for me. She nodded. And we saw through each other all the time, she said. Grizel, has it passed away altogether now? Her grip upon his hand did not tighten in the least. Yes, she could say honestly, it has altogether passed away. And you have no more fear? No, none. It was his great reward for all that he had done for Grizel. I know what you are thinking of, she said, when he did not speak. You are thinking of the haunted little girl you rescued seven years ago. No, he answered. I was thanking God for the brave, wholesome woman she has grown into, and for something else, Grizel, for letting me live to see it. To do it, she said, pressing his hand to her breast. She was a strange girl, and she had to speak her mind. I don't think God has done it at all, she said. I don't even think that he told you to do it. I think he just said to you, There is a painted lady's child at your door. You can save her if you like. No, she went on, when he would have interposed. I am sure he did not want to do it at all. He even left a little bit of it to me to do myself. I love to think that I have done a tiny bit of it myself. I think it is the sweetest thing about God that he lets us do some of it ourselves. Do I hurt you, darling? No, she did not hurt him, for he understood her. But you are naturally so impulsive, he said. It has often been a sharp pain to me to see you so careful. It was not a pain to me to be careful. It was a joy. Oh, the thousand dear delightful joys I have had with you. It has made you strong, Grizel, and I rejoice in that. But sometimes I fear that it has made you too difficult to win. I don't want to be won, she told him. You don't quite mean that, Grizel. No, she said at once. She whispered to him impulsively. It is the only thing I am at all afraid of now. What? Love. You will not be afraid when it comes. But I want to be afraid, she said. You need not, he answered. The man on whom those clear eyes rest lovingly will be worthy of it all. If he were not, they would be the first to find him out. But need that make any difference, she asked. Perhaps, though I found him out, I should love him just the same. Not unless you loved him first, Grizel. 
No, she said at once again, I am not really afraid of love. She whispered to him, you have made me so happy that I am afraid of nothing. Yet she wondered a little that he was not afraid to die. But when she told him this, he smiled and said, everybody fears death except those who are dying. And when she asked if he had anything on his mind, he said, I leave the world without a care. Not that I have seen all I would fain have seen. Many a time, especially this last year when I have seen the mother in you crooning to some neighbor's child, I have thought to myself, I don't know my Grizel yet. I have seen her in the bud only, and I would fain, he broke off. But I have no fears, he said. As I lie here with you sitting by my side, looking so serene, I can say for the first time for half a century that I have nothing on my mind. But Grizel, I should have married, he told her. The chief lesson my life has taught me is that they are poor critters, the men who don't marry. If you had married, she said, you might never have been able to help me. It is you who have helped me, he replied. God sent the child. He was the most reluctant to give any of us up. Eh, Grizel, that's what my life has taught me, and it's all I can leave to you. The last he saw of her, she was holding his hand, and her eyes were dry, her teeth were clenched, but there was a brave smile upon her face, for he had told her that it was thus he would like to see her at the end. After his death, she continued to live at the old house. He had left it to her. I wanted to remain in the family, he said. With all his savings, which were quite sufficient for the needs of such a manager, he had also left her plenty to do, and that was a still sweeter legacy. And the other Jacobites, what of them? Hi, where are you, Cor? Here he comes, grinning in his spleet new uniform to demand our tickets of us. He is now the railway porter. Since Tommy left Thrums, steam had arrived in it, and Cor had by nature given a gift for giving luggage the twist which breaks everything inside as you dump it down that he was inevitably appointed porter. There was no traveling to Thrums without a ticket. At Tilly Drum, which was the junction for Thrums, you showed your ticket and were then locked in. A hundred yards from Thrums. Corv leaked upon the train and fiercely demanded your ticket. At the station, he asked you threateningly whether you had given up your ticket. Even his wife was afraid of him at such times, and had her ticket ready in her hand. His wife was one Gavinia, and she had no fear of him except when she was traveling. To his face, she referred to him as a doited sump, but to Grizel, Pleading for him, she admitted that despite his warts and quarrelsome legs, he was a great big muckle sonsy, stout, birdly, well set up, wise like, havering man. When first Corp had proposed to her, she gave him a clout on the head, and so little did he know of the sex that this discouraged him. He continued, however, to propose, and she to clout him, until he heard, accidentally, he woke up in church, of a man in the Bible who had wooed a woman for seven years, and this example he determined to emulate. But when Gavinia heard of it, she was so furious that she took him at once. Dazed by his good fortune, he rushed off with it to his aunt, whom he wearied with his repetition of the great news. "'To your bed with you,' she said, yawning. "'Bed!' cried Cor indignantly. "'And so, Auntie,' says Gavinia. "'Yes,' says she. "'I hey you!' Those were her never-to-be-forgotten words. You pitiful object, answered his aunt. Men have been married afore now without making sick a stramish. I dar say, retorted Cor, but the hinna married Gavinia. And this is the best-known answer to the sneer of the cynic. He was a public nuisance that night and knocked various people up after they had gone to bed to tell them that Gavinia was to have him. He was eventually led home by kindly, though indignant, neighbors, but early morning found him in the country, carrying the news from farm to farm. No, I winna sit down, he said. I just cried in to tell you Gavinia is to Amy. Six miles from home, he saw a mud house on the top of the hill and ascended genially. 
He found at their porridge a very old lady with a nutcracker face and a small boy. We shall see them again. Old wifey, said Cor, I dinna ken you, but I've just stepped up to tell you that Gavinia is to hae me. It made him the butt of the sportive. If he or Gavinia were nigh, they gathered their fowls round them and then said, Hens, I didn't ye bring you here to feed you, but just to tell you that Gavinia is to hae me. This flustered Gavinia, but Grizel, who enjoyed her own jokes too heartily to have more than a polite interest in those of other people, said to her, How can you be angry? I think it was just sweet of him. But was it no vulgar? Vulgar, said Grizel. Why, Gavinia, that is how every lady would like a man to love her. And then Gavinia beamed. I'm glad you say that, she said, for though I wouldn't tell Corp for worlds, I felt like it did. But Grizel told Cor that Gavinia liked it. It was the proof, she said, smiling, that you have the right to marry her. You have shown your ticket. Never give it up, Cor. About a year afterwards, Cor, armed in his Sunday stand, rushed to Grizel's house, occasionally stopping to slap his shiny knees. Grizel, he cried, there's somebody come to Thrums without a ticket. Then he remembered Gavinia's instructions. Mrs. Sheach's compliments, he said ponderously, and it's a boy. Oh, Cor, exclaimed Grizel, and immediately began to put on her hat and jacket. Cor watched her uneasily. Mrs. Sheach's compliments, he said firmly, and he's our young to be bathed yet, and she's odd to show him off to you, he hastened to add. Tell Grizel, was her first words. Tell Grizel. They were among the first words of many mothers. None, they were aware, would receive the news with quite such glee as she. They might think her cold and reserved with themselves, but to see the look on her face as she bent over a baby, and to know that the baby was yours, what a way she had with them. She always welcomed them, as if in coming they had performed a great feat. That is what babies are agape for from the beginning. Had they been able to speak, they would have said, Tell Grizel themselves. And Mrs. Sheaf's compliments, Corb remembered, and she would be windy if you would carry the bairn out the christening. I should love it, Corb. Have you decided on the name? Lang Syne. Gin, if it were a lassie, we were to call her Grizel. Oh, how sweet of you. After the finest lassie we ever kent, continued Corb, stoutly. But I was sure it would be a laddie. Why? "'Because if it was a laddie, it was to be called after him,' he said with emphasis on the last word. "'And thinks I to myself, he'll find a way. "'What a critter he was for finding a way, Grizel, "'and he looked so holy at the time. "'Do you mind that swear word of is stroke? "'It just meant damn, but he could make even damn look holy. "'You are to call the baby Tommy? "'He'll be christened. Thomas Sandys Sheach, said Corp. I hankered after putting something out of the Jacobites until his name, and I says to Gavinia, let's call him Thomas Sandys Stroke Sheach, says I, and the minister'll be named the wiser. But Gavinia was scandalized. Grizel reflected. Cor, she said, I am sure Gavinia's sister will expect to be asked to carry the baby. I don't think I want to do it. After you promised, cried Cor, much hurt. I never kent you to break a promise afore. I will do it, Cor, she said at once. She did not know then that Tommy would be in church to witness the ceremony, but she knew before she walked down the aisle with T.S. Sheikh in her arms. It was the first time that Tommy and she had seen each other for seven years. That day he almost rivaled his namesake in the interests of the congregation who, however, took prodigious care that he should not see it. All except Grizel. She smiled a welcome to him, and he knew that her serene gray eyes were watching him. End of chapter 4 Recorded by Sheila Blunt Chapter 5 of Tommy and Grizel this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry, Chapter 5 The Tommy Myth On the evening before the christening, Aaron Latta, his head sunk farther into his shoulders, his beard gone grayer, no other perceptible difference in a dreary man since we last saw him in the book of Tommy's boyhood, had met the brother and sister at the station, a barrow with him for their luggage. It was a great hour for him as he wheeled the barrow homeward, Elspeth once more at his side, but he could say nothing heartsome in Tommy's presence, and Tommy was as uncomfortable in his. The old strained relations between these two seemed to begin again at once. They were as self-conscious as two mastiffs meeting in the street, and both breathed a sigh of relief when Tommy fell behind. "'You're Bonnie, Elspeth,' Aaron then said eagerly. "'I'm glad, glad to see you again.' "'And him too, Aaron?' Elspeth pleaded. "'He took you away from me. "'He has brought me back. "'Aye, and he has but to whistle to you, and away you go with him again. "'He's o'er grand to bide along here now. "'You don't know him, Aaron. "'We are to stay a long time. "'Do you know Mrs. McLean invited us to stay with her? "'I suppose she thought your house was so small. "'But Tommy said, "'The house of the man who befriended us when we were children "'shall never be too small for us.' "'Did he say that?' "'Ay, hey, but Elspeth.' I would rather hear what you said. I said it was to dear good Aaron Latta I was going back, and to no one else. God bless you for that, Elspeth. And Tommy, she went on, must have his old garret room again, to write as well as sleep in, and the little room you partitioned off the kitchen will do nicely for me. There's no window in it, replied Aaron, but it will do fine for you, Elspeth. He was almost chuckling, for he had a surprise in waiting for her. This way, he said excitedly, when she would have gone into the kitchen, and he flung open the door of what had been his warping room. The warping mill was gone. Everything that had been there was gone. What met the delighted eyes of Elspeth and Tommy was a cozy parlor, which became a bedroom when you opened that other door. You are a leddy now, Elspeth, Aaron said, husky with pride, and you have a leddy's room. Do you see the piano? He had given up the warping, having at last twa three hundred in the bank, and all the work he did now was at a loom which he had put into the kitchen to keep him out of languor. I have sorted up the garret too for you, he said to Tommy, but this is Elspeth's room. As if Tommy would take it from me, said Elspeth, running into the kitchen to hug this dear Aaron. You may laugh, Aaron replied vindictively, but he is taking it fra you already. And later, when Tommy was out of the way, he explained his meaning. I did it all for you, Elspeth. Elspeth's room, I called it. When I bought the mahogany armchair, that's Elspeth's chair, I said to myself. And when I bought the bed, it's hers, I said. Eh, but I was soon disannulled of that date, for in spite of me they were all got for him. Not a rhythm in that room is yours or mine, Elspeth. Every mullen belongs to him. But who says so, Aaron? I'm sure he won't. I dinna ken them. They are leddies that come here in their carriages to see the house where Thomas Sandys was born. But Aaron, he was born in London. They think he was born in this house, Aaron replied doggedly, and it's no for me to cheapen him. Oh, Aaron, you pretend. I was never very fond of him, Aaron admitted, but I win a cheapen Jean Miles Barn, and when they chap at my door and say they would like to see the room Thomas Sandys was born in, I let them see the best room I have. So that's how he has laid hands on your parlor, Elspeth. Afore I can get rid of them, they gee a squeak and cry, Was that Thomas Sandy's bed? And I says it was. That's him taking the very bed fra you, Elspeth. You might at least have shown them his bed in the garret, she said. It's a shilpit bit thing, he answered, and I win or cheapen him. They're curious, too, to see his favorite seat. It was the fender, she declared. 
It was, he assented, but it's no for me to cheapen him, so I let him see your new mahogany chair. Thomas Sandy's chair, they call it, and they sit down in it reverently. They winna even leave you the piano. Was this Thomas Sandy's piano? They spear? It was, says I, and sin they gulp at it. His under lip shot out, a sure sign that he was angry. I didn't blame him, he said, but he had the same masterful way of scooping everything into his lap when he was a laddie, and I like him none the mare for it, and from this position Aaron would not budge. Quite right, too, Tommy said when he heard of it, but you can tell him, Elspeth, that we shall allow no more of those prying women to come in. And he really meant this, for he was a modest man that day, was Tommy, Nevertheless, he was perhaps a little annoyed to find, as the days went on, that no more ladies came to be turned away. He heard that they had also been unable to resist the desire to shake hands with Thomas Sandy, schoolmaster. It must have been a pleasure to teach him, they said to Cathro. Ah, me, ah, me, Cathro replied enigmatically. It had so often been a pleasure to Cathro to thrash him. Genius is odd, they say. Did he ever give you any trouble? We were like father and son, he assured them. With natural pride, he showed them the ink pot into which Thomas Sandys had dipped as a boy. They were very grateful for his interesting reminiscence that when the pot was too full, Thomas inked his fingers. He presented several of them with the ink pot. Two ladies who came together bothered him by asking what the high black adder competition was. They had been advised to inquire of him about Thomas Sandy's connection therewith by another schoolmaster, a Mr. Ogilvy, whom they had met in one of the glens. Mr. Cathro winced and then explained with emphasis that the Hugh Black Adder was a competition in which the local ministers were the sole judges. He therefore referred the ladies to them. The ladies did go to a local minister for enlightenment, to Mr. Dishart, but after reflecting, Mr. Dishart said that it was too long a story, and this answer seemed to amuse Mr. Ogilvy, who happened to be present. It was Mr. McLean who retailed this news to Tommy. He and Ailey had walked home from church with the newcomers on the day after their arrival, the day of the christening, they had not gone into Aaron's house, for you are looked askance at in Thrums if you pay visits on Sundays. But they had stood for a long time gossiping at the door, which is permitted by the strictest. Ailey was in a twitter, as of old, and not able even to speak of her husband without an apologetic look to the ladies who had none. And, oh, how proud she was of Tommy's fame! Her eyes were an offering to him. Don't take her as a sample of the place, though, Mr. McLean warned him, for Thrums does not catch fire so readily as London. It was quite true. I was at the school with him, they said up there, and implied that this damned his book. But there were two faithful souls, or more strictly one, for Cor could never have carried it through without Gavinia's help. Tommy called on them promptly at their house in the Belly's Bray, four rooms but a lodger, and said, almost before he had time to look, that the baby had Cora's chin and Gavinia's eyes. They had made this up on the way. He also wanted to say, so desirous was he of pleasing his old friends, that he should like to hold the baby in his arms. But it was such a thundering lie that even an author could not say it. Tommy sat down in that house with a very warm heart for its inmates, but they chilled him. Gavinia with her stiff words and core by looking miserable instead of joyous. I expected you to come to me first, Cor, said Tommy reproachfully. I had scarcely a word with you at the station. He couldn't have presumed, replied Gavinia primly. I couldn't have presumed, said Cor with a groan. Fudge! Tommy said, you are my greatest friend, and I like you as much as ever, Cor. Cor's face shone, but Gavinia said at once, 
You weren't as sick great friends as that, were you, man? No, Cor replied gloomily. Whatever has come over you both? asked Tommy in surprise. You will be saying next, Gavinia, that we never played at Jacobites in the den. I didn't deny that Cor and me played, Gavinia answered determinedly, but you didn't. You said to us, think shame. You said to be playing vulgar games when you could be reading superior books. They were his very words, were they no, man? she demanded of her unhappy husband with a threatening look. They were, said Cor in deepest gloom. I must get to the bottom of this, said Tommy, rising, and as you are too great a coward, Cor, to tell the truth with that shameless woman glowering at you, out you go, Gavinia, and take your disgraced baron with you. Do as you are told, you besom, for I am Captain Stroke again. Cor was choking with delight, as Gavinia withdrew haughtily. I was sure you would sort her, he said, rubbing his hands. I was sure you wasn't the kind of be ashamed of old friends. But what does it mean? She has a notion, Cor explained, growing grave again, that it wouldn't do for you to own the like of us. We mauna cheapen him, she said. She wanted you to see that we hinna been cheapening you, he said in a sepulchral voice. There has been leddies here, and they want to kin what Thomas Sandys was like as a boy. It's me they spire for, but Gavinia, she just shoves me out of sight and says she, leave them to me. Cor told Tommy some of the things Gavinia said about Thomas Sandys as a boy, how he sat wrapped in church and instead of going bird nesting, lay on the ground listening to the beautiful little warblers overhead and gave all his pennies to poorer children and could repeat the shorter catechism beginning at either end and was very respectful to the aged and infirm, and of a yielding disposition, and said from his earliest years, I don't want to be great, I just want to be good. How could she make them all up, Tommy asked, with respectful homage to Gavinia. Cor, with his eye on the door, produced from beneath the bed a little book with colored pictures. It was entitled Great Boyhoods by Aunt Martha. She doesn't make them up, he whispered. She gets them out of this. And you back her up, Cor, even when she says I was not your friend? It was like a knife until me, replied loyal Cor. Every time I forswore you, it was like a knife. But I did it, I, and I'll go on doing it if you think my friendship cheapens you. Tommy was much moved and gripped his old lieutenant by the hand. He also called Gavinia Ben, and before she could ward him off, the masterful rogue had saluted her on the cheek. That, said Tommy, is to show you that I am as fond of the old times and my old friends as ever, and the moment you deny it, I shall take you to mean Gavinia that you want another kiss. He's just the same, Cor remarked ecstatically when Tommy had gone. I dinna deny, Gavinia said, but what he's fell taken, and for a time they ruminated. Gavinia, said Cor suddenly, I wouldn't have wondered, but what he's a gay lad with the women. What makes you think that, she replied coldly, and he had the prudence not to say. He should have followed his hero home to be disabused of this monstrous notion, for even while it was being propounded, Tommy was sitting in such an agony of silence in a woman's presence that she could not resist smiling a crooked smile at him. His want of words did not displease Grizel. She was of opinion that young men should always be a little awed by young ladies. He had found her with Elspeth on his return home. Would Grizel call and be friendly? He had asked himself many times since he saw her in church yesterday, and Elspeth was as curious. Each wanted to know what the other thought of her, but neither had the courage to inquire. They both wanted to know so much. Her name had been mentioned, but casually, not a word to indicate that she had grown up since they saw her last. The longer Tommy remained silent, the more he knew did Elspeth suspect him. He would have liked to say in a careless voice, rather pretty, isn't she? But he felt that this little Elspeth would see through him at once. 
for at the first glance he had seen what Grizel was, and a thrill of joy passed through him as he drank her in. It was but the joy of the eyes for the first moment, but it ran to his heart to say, This is the little hunted girl that was. And Tommy was moved with a manly gladness that the girl who once was so fearful of the future had grown into this. The same unselfish delight in her for her own sake came over him again when he shook hands with her in Aaron's parlor. This glorious creature with the serene eyes and the noble sh shoulders had been the hunted child of the double dykes. He would have liked to race back into the past and bring little Grizel here to look. How many boyish memories he recalled, and she was in every one of them. His heart held nothing but honest joy in this meaning after so many years. He longed to tell her how sincerely he was still her friend. Well, why don't you tell her, Tommy? It's a thing you are good at, and you have been polishing up the phrases ever since she passed down the aisle with Master Shiach in her arms. You have even planned out a way of putting Grizel at her ease, and behold, she is the only one of the three who is at ease. What has come over you? Does the reader think it was love? No, it was only that pall of shyness. He tried to fling it off, but could not. Behold Tommy being buried alive. Elspeth showed less contemptibly than her brother, but it was Grizel who did most of the talking. She nodded her head and smiled crookedly at Tommy, but she was watching him all the time. She wore a dress in which brown and yellow mingled as in woods on an autumn day, and the jacket had a high collar of fur over which she watched him. Let us say that she was watching to see whether any of the old Tommy was left in him. Yet, with this problem confronting her, she also had time to study the outer man. Tommy, the dandy, his velvet jacket, a new one, his brazen waistcoat, his poetic neckerchief, his spotless linen. His velvet jacket was to become the derision of Thrums. But Tommy took his bonneting haughtily, like one who was glad to suffer for a cause. There were to be meetings here and there where people told with awe how many shirts he sent weekly to the wash. Grizel disdained his dandy tastes. Why did not Elspeth strip him of them? And, oh, if he must wear that absurd waistcoat, could she not see that it would look another thing if the second button was put half an inch farther back? How sinful of him to spoil the shape of his silly velvet jacket by carrying so many letters in the pockets. She learned afterwards that he carried all those letters because there was a check in one of them. He did not know which, and her sense of orderliness was outraged. Elspeth did not notice these things. She helped Tommy by her helplessness. There is reason to believe that once in London, when she had need of a new hat, but money there was none, Tommy, looking very defiant, studied ladies' hats in the shop windows, brought all his intellect to bear on them, with the result that he did concoct out of Elspeth's old hat a new one, which was the admired of O.P. Pym and Friends who never knew the name of the artist. But obviously he could not take proper care of himself, and there is a kind of woman, of whom Grizel was one, to whose breasts this helplessness makes an unfair appeal. Oh, to dress him properly! She could not help liking to be a mother to men. She wanted them to be the most noble characters, but completely dependent on her. Tommy walked home with her, and it seemed at first as if Elspeth's absence was to be no help to him. He could not even plagiarize from Sandy's on woman. No one knew so well the kind of thing he should be saying, and no one could have been more anxious to say it. But a weight of shyness sat on the lid of Tommy. Having for half an hour raged internally at his misfortune, he now sullenly embraced it. If I am this sort of an ass, let me be it in the superlative degree, he may be conceived saying bitterly to himself. He addressed Grizel coldly as Miss McQueen, 
a name she had taken by the doctor's wish soon after she went to live with him. "'There is no reason why you should call me that,' she said. "'Call me Grizel, as you used to do.' "'May I?' replied Tommy, idiotically. He knew it was idiotic, but that mood now had grip of him. "'But I mean to call you Mr. Sandys,' she said decisively. He was really glad to hear it, for to be called Tommy by anyone was now detestable to him, which is why I always call him Tommy in these pages. So it was like him to say with a sigh, I had hoped to hear you use the old name. That sigh made her look at him sharply. He knew that he must be careful with Grizel, and that she was irritated, but he had to go on. It is strange to me, said sentimental Tommy, to be back here after all these years, walking this familiar road once more with you. I thought it would make me feel myself a boy again, but hi-ho, it has just the opposite effect. I never felt so old as I do today. His voice trembled a little. I don't know why. Grizel frowned. But you never were as old as you are today, were you? She inquired politely. It whisked Tommy out of dangerous waters and laid him at her feet. He laughed, not perceptibly or audibly, of course, but somewhere inside him the bell rang. No one could laugh more heartily at himself than Tommy, and none bore less malice to those who brought him to land. That, at any rate, makes me feel younger, he said candidly, and now the shyness was in full flight. Why? asked Grizel, still watchful. It is so like the kind of thing you used to say to me when we were boy and girl. I used to enrage you very much, I fear, he said half gleefully. Yes, she admitted with a smile, you did. And then how you rocked your arms at me, Grizel, do you remember? She remembered it all so well. This rocking of the arms, as they called it, was a trick of hers that signified sudden joy or pain. They hung rigidly by her side and then shook violently with emotion. "'Do you ever rock them now when people annoy you?' he asked. "'There has been no one to annoy me,' she replied demurely, since you went away. "'But I have come back,' Tommy said, looking hopefully at her arms. "'You see, they take no notice of you. They don't remember me yet. As soon as they do, they will cry out.' Grizel shook her head confidently, and in this she was pitting herself against Tommy, always a bold thing to do. I have been to see Cor's baby, he said suddenly. And this was so important that she stopped in the middle of the road. What do you think of him? she asked quite anxiously. I thought, replied Tommy gravely, and making use of one of Grizel's pet phrases, I thought he was just sweet. Isn't he? she cried and then she knew that he was making fun of her. Her arms rocked. Hooray, cried Tommy. They recognize me now. Don't be angry, Grizel, he begged her. You taught me long ago what was the right thing to say about babies, and how could I be sure it was you until I saw your arms rocking? It was so like you, she said reproachfully, to try to make me do it. It was so unlike you, he replied craftily, to let me succeed. And after all, Grizel, if I was horrid in the old days, I always apologized. Never, she insisted. Well then, said Tommy handsomely, I do so now. And then they both laughed gaily, and I think Grizel was not sorry that there was a little of the boy who had been horrid left in Tommy, just enough to know him by. He'll be vain, her aged maid, Maggie Ann, said curiously to her that evening. They were all curious about Tommy. I don't know that he is vain, Grizel replied guardedly. If he's no vain, Maggie Ann retorted, he's the first son of Adam, it could be said, oh, I jealous it's his bit book. He scarcely mentioned it. A eh, then, it's his beard. Grizel was sure it was not that. Then it'll be the women, said Maggie Ann. Who knows, said Grizel of the watchful eyes, but she smiled to herself. She thought not incorrectly that she knew one woman of whom Mr. Sandys was a little afraid. About the same time Tommy and Elspeth were discussing her, 
Elspeth was in bed, and Tommy had come into the room to kiss her good night. He had never once omitted doing it since they went to London, and he was always to do it, for neither of them was ever to marry. "'What do you think of her?' Elspeth asked. This was their great time for confidences. "'Of whom?' Tommy inquired lightly. "'Grizel. He must be careful. "'Rather pretty, don't you think?' he said, gazing at the ceiling." She was looking at him keenly, but he managed to deceive her. She was much relieved, and could say what was in her heart. Tommy, she said, I think she is the most noble-looking girl I ever saw. And if she were not so masterful in her manner, she would be beautiful. It was nice of Elspeth to say it, for she and Grizel were never very great friends. Tommy brought down his eyes. Did you think as much of her as that? he said. It struck me that her features were not quite classic. Her nose is a little tilted, is it not? Some people like that kind of nose, replied Elspeth. It's not classic, Tommy said sternly. End of chapter 5 Recorded by Sheila Blunt Chapter 6 of Tommy and Grizel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry. Chapter 6 Ghosts That Haunt the Den. Looking through the Tommy papers of this period, like a conscientious biographer, I find among them manuscripts that remind me how diligently he set to work on his new book the moment he went north, and also letters which, if printed, would show you what a wise and good man Tommy was. But while I was fingering those, there floated from them to the floor a loose page when I saw that it was a chemist's bill for oil and liniment. I remembered something I had nigh forgotten. Eureka! I cried. I shall tell the story of the chemist's bill and some other biographer may print the letters. Well, well, but to think that this scrap of paper should flutter into view to damn him after all those years. The date is Saturday, May 28th, by which time Tommy had been a week in Thrums, without doing anything very reprehensible, so far as Grizel knew. She watched for tell-tales as for a mouse to show at its hole, and at worst, I think, she saw only its little head. That was when Tommy was talking beautifully to her about her dear doctor. He would have done wisely to avoid this subject, but he was so notoriously good at condolences that he had to say it. He had thought it out, you may remember a year ago, but hesitated to post it. And since then, it had lain heavily within him, as if it knew it was a good thing, and pined up to be and strutting. He said it with emotion. Evidently, Dr. McQueen had been very dear to him, and any other girl would have been touched. But Grizel stiffened, and when he had finished, this is what she said, quite snappily. He never liked you. Tommy was taken aback, but replied with gentle dignity, Do you think, Grizel, that I would let that make a difference in my estimate of him? But you never liked him, said she, and now that he thought of it, this was true also. It was useless to say anything about the artistic instinct to her. She did not know what it was, and would have had plain words for it as soon as he told her. Pleased to picture Tommy picking up his beautiful speech and ramming it back into his pocket as if it were a rejected manuscript. I'm sorry you should think so meanly of me, Grizel, he said with manly forbearance, and when she thought it all out carefully that night, she decided that she had been hasty. She could not help watching Tommy for backslidings, but, oh, it was sweet to her to decide that she had not found any. It was I who was horrid, she announced to him frankly, and Tommy forgave her at once. She offered him a present. When the doctor died, I gave some of his things to his friends. It is the Scotch custom, you know. He had a new overcoat, it had been worn but two or three times. I would be so glad if you would let me give it to you for saying such sweet things about him. 
I think it will need very little alteration. Thus, very simply, came into Tommy's possession the coat that was to play so odd a part in his history. But, oh, Grizel, said he, with mock reproach, you need not think I don't see through you. Your deep design is to cover me up. You despise my velvet jacket. It does not, Grizel began and stopped. It is not in keeping with my doleful countenance, said Tommy candidly. That was what you were to say. Let me tell you a secret, Grizel. I wear it to spite my face. Shan't give up my velvet jacket for anybody, Grizel, not even for you. He was in gay spirits because he knew she liked him again, and she saw that was the reason, and it warmed her. She was least able to resist Tommy when he was most a boy, and it was actually watchful Grizel who proposed that he and she and Elspeth should revisit the den together. How often since the days of their childhood had Grizel wandered it alone, thinking of those dear times, making up her mind that if ever Tommy asked her to go into the den again with him, she would not go to the place that was so much sweeter to her than it could be to him. And yet it was Grizel herself who was saying now, Let us go back to the den. Tommy caught fire. We shan't go back, he cried defiantly, as men and women. Let us be boy and girl again, Grizel. Let us have that Saturday we missed long ago. I missed a Saturday on purpose, Grizel, so that we should have it now. She shook her head wistfully, but she was glad that Tommy would fain have had one of the Saturdays back. Had he waxed sentimental, she would not have gone a step of the way with him into the past. But when he was so full of glee, she could take his hand and run back into it. But we must wait until evening, Tommy said. Until Cor is unharnessed, we must not hurt the feelings of Cor by going back to the den without him. How mean of me not to think of Cor, Grizel cried. But the next moment she was glad she had not thought of him. It was so delicious to have proof that Tommy was more loyal. But we can't turn back the clock, can we, Cor? She said to the fourth of the conspirators, to which Cor replied, with his old sublime confidence, He'll find a way. And at first it really seemed as if Tommy had found a way. They did not go to the den four in a line or two abreast. Nothing so common as that. In the wild spirits that mastered him, he seemed to be the boy incarnate, and it was always said of Tommy by those who knew him best that if he leaped back into boyhood, they had to jump with him. Those who knew him best were with him now. He took command of them in the old way. He whispered as if Black Cathro were still on the prowl for him. Cor of Cor had to steal upon the den by way of the silent pool, Grizel by the Queen's Bower, Elspeth up the burnside, Captain Stroke down the reeky broth pot. Grizel's arms rocked with delight in the dark, and she was on her way to the Cuttle Well, the trysting place. Before she came to and saw with consternation that Tommy had been ordering her about. She was quite a sedate young lady by the time she joined them at the well, and Tommy was the first to feel the change. Don't you think this is all rather silly, she said when he addressed her as the Lady Griselda, and it broke the spell. Two girls shot up into women. A beard grew on Tommy's chin, and Cor became a father. Grizzle had blown Tommy's pretty project to dust just when he was most gleeful over it. Yet, instead of bearing resentment, he pretended not even to know that she was the culprit. Cor, he said ruefully, the game is up. And listen, he said, when they had sat down, crushed by the old cuddle well. Do you hear anything? It was a very still evening. I hear notched, said Cor. But the trickle or the burn, what do you hear? I thought I heard a baby cry, replied Tommy with a groan. I think it was your baby, Cor. Did you hear it, Grizel? She understood and nodded. And you, Elspeth? Yes. My bairn, cried the astounded Cor. "'Yours,' said Tommy reproachfully, "'and he has done for us, ladies and gentlemen. "'The game is up.' "'Yes, the game was up, and she was glad,' Grizel said to herself, "'as they made their melancholy pilgrimage "'of what had once been an enchanted land. 
but she felt that Tommy had been very forbearing to her, and that she did not deserve it. Undoubtedly he had ordered her about, but in so doing had he not been making half pathetic sport of his old self. And was it with him that she was annoyed for ordering, or with herself for obeying? And why should she not obey, when it was all a jest? It was as if she still had some lingering fear of Tommy. Oh, she was ashamed of herself. She must say something nice to him at once. About what? About his book, of course. How base of her not to have done so already. But how good of him to have overlooked her silence on that great topic. It was not ignorance of its contents that had kept her silent. To confess the horrid truth, Grizel had read the book suspiciously, looking as through a microscope for something wrong, hoping not to find it, but peering minutely. The book she knew was beautiful, but it was the writer of the book she was peering for, the Tommy she had known so well. What had he grown into? In her heart, she had exulted from the first in his success, and she should have been still more glad, should she not, to learn that his subject was woman. But no, that had irritated her. What was perhaps even worse, she had been still more irritated on hearing that the work was rich in sublime thoughts. As a boy, he had maddened her most in his grandest moments. I can think of no other excuse for her. She would not accept it as an excuse for herself now. What she saw with scorn was that she was always suspecting the worst of Tommy. Very probably there was not a thought in the book that had not been put in with his old complacent waggle of the head. Oh, am I not a wonder, he used to cry, when he did anything big, but that was no reason why she should suspect him of being conceited still. Very probably he really and truly felt what he wrote, felt it not only at the time, but also next morning. In his boyhood, Mr. Cathro had christened him Sentimental Tommy, but he was a man now, and surely the sentimentalities in which he had dressed himself were flung aside forever like old suits of clothes. So Grizel decided eagerly, and she was on the point of telling him how proud she was of his book, when Tommy, who had thus far behaved so well, of a sudden went to pieces. He and Grizel were together. Elspeth was a little in front of them, walking with a gentleman who still wondered what they meant by saying that they had heard his baby cry. For he's no here, Cor had said earnestly to them all, though I'm a wid for the time to come when I'll be able to bring him to the den and let him see the Jacobite's lair. There was nothing startling in this remark, so far as Grizel could discover, but she saw that it had an immediate and incomprehensible effect on Tommy. First, he blundered in his talk as if he was thinking deeply of something else. Then his face shone as it had been wont to light up in his boyhood when he was suddenly enraptured with himself. And lastly, down his cheek and into his beard, there stole a tear of agony. Obviously, Tommy was in deep woe for somebody or something. It was a chance for a true lady to show that womanly sympathy of which such exquisite things are said in the first work of T. Sandys. But it merely infuriated Grizel, who knew that Tommy did not feel nearly so deeply as she this return to the den, and therefore, what was he in such distress about? It was silly sentiment of some sort, she was sure of that. In the old days, she would have asked him imperiously to tell her what was the matter with him. But she must not do that now. She dare not even rock her indignant arms. She could only walk silently by his side, longing fervently to shake him. He had quite forgotten her presence. Indeed, she was not really there, for a number of years had passed, and he was Kor Shiach walking the den alone. Tomorrow he was to bring his boy to show him the old lair and other fondly remembered spots. Tonight he must revisit them alone. So he set out blithely, but to his bewilderment he could not find the lair. It had not been a tiny hollow where muddy water gathered. He remembered an impregnable fortress full of men whose armor rattled as they came and went. So this could not be the lair. 
He had taken the wrong way to it, for the way was across a lagoon up a deep flowing river, then by horse till the rocky ledge terrified all four-footed things. No, up a grassy slope had never been the way. He came night after night trying different ways, but he could not find the golden ladder, though all the time he knew that the lair lay somewhere over there. When he stood still and listened, he could hear the friends of his youth at play, and they seemed to be calling. Are you coming, Cor? Why does not Cor come back? But he could never see them, and when he pressed forward, their voices died away. Then at last he said sadly to his boy, I shall never be able to show you the lair, for I cannot find the way to it. And the boy was touched, and he said, Take my hand, father, and I will lead you to the lair. I found the way long ago for myself. It took Tommy about two seconds to see all this, and perhaps another half minute was spent in sad but satisfactory contemplation of it. Then he felt that for the best effect, Cor's home life was too comfortable. So Gavinia ran away with a soldier. He was now so sorry for Cor that the tear rolled down. But at the same moment, he saw how the effect could be still further heightened by doing away with his friend's rude state of health, and he immediately jammed him between the buffers of two railway carriages and gave him a wooden leg. It was at this point that a lady who had kept her arms still too long rocked them frantically, then said with cutting satire, Are you not feeling well, or have you hurt yourself? You seem to be very lame. And Tommy woke with a start to see he was hobbling as if one of his legs were timber to the knee. It is nothing, he said modestly. Something Cor said set me thinking, that is all. He had told the truth, and if what he imagined was twenty times more real to him than what was really there, how could Tommy help it? Indignant Grizel, however, who kept such a grip of facts, would make no such excuse for him. Elspeth, she called. There is no need to tell her, said Tommy. But Grizel was obdurate. Come here, Elspeth, she cried vindictively. Something Cor said a moment ago has made your brother lame. Tommy was lame. That was all Elspeth and Cor heard or could think of as they ran back to him. When did it happen? Was he in great pain? Had he fallen? Oh, why had he not told Elspeth at once? It is nothing, Tommy insisted a little fiercely. He says so, Grizzle explained, not to alarm us, but he is suffering horribly. Just before I called to you, his face was all drawn up in pain. This made the sufferer wince. That was another twinge, she said promptly. What is to be done, Elspeth? I think I could carry him, suggested Cor, with a forward movement that made Tommy stamp his foot, the wooden one. I'm all right, he told them testily, and looking uneasily at Grizel. How brave of you to say so, said she. It is just like him, Elspeth said, pleased with Grizel's remark. I'm sure it is, Grizel said so graciously. It was very naughty of her. Had she given him a chance, he would have explained that it was all a mistake of Grizel's. That had been his intention, but now a devil entered into Tommy and spoke for him. I must have slipped and sprained my ankle, he said. It is slightly painful, but I shall be able to walk home all right, Cor, if you let me use you as a staff. I think he was a little surprised to hear himself saying this, but as soon as it was said, he liked it. He was Captain Stroke playing in the den again, after all, and playing as well as ever, nothing being so real to Tommy as pretense. I dare say he even began to feel his ankle hurting him. Gently, he begged of Cor with a gallant smile, and clenching his teeth so that the pain should not make him cry out before the ladies. Thus, with his lieutenant's help, did Stroke manage to reach Aaron's house, making light of his mishap, assuring them cheerily that he should be all right tomorrow, and carefully avoiding Grizel's eye, though he wanted very much to know what she thought of him, and of herself, now. There were moments when she did not know what to think, and that always distressed Grizel, though it was a state of mind with which Tommy could keep on very friendly terms. The truth seemed too monstrous for belief. Was it possible she had misjudged him? Perhaps he really had sprained his ankle, but he had made no pretense of that at first, and besides, 
Yes, she could not be mistaken. It was the other leg. She soon let him see what she was thinking. I'm afraid it is too serious a case for me, she said, in answer to a suggestion from Cor, who had a profound faith in her medical skill. But if you like, she was addressing Tommy now, I shall call Dr. Gemmels on my way home and ask him to come to you. There is no necessity. A night's rest is all I need, he answered hastily. Well, you know best, she said, and there was a look on her face which Thomas Sandys could endure from no woman. On second thoughts, he said, I think it would be advisable to have a doctor. Thank you very much, Grizel. Cor, can you help me lift my foot onto that chair? Softly. Ah, ugh. His eyes did not fall before hers. And would you mind asking him to come at once, Grizel, he said sweetly. She went straight to the doctor. End of chapter 6 Recording by Sheila Blunt Chapter 7 of Tommy and Grizel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry. Chapter 7 The Beginning of the Duel. It was among old Dr. McQueen's sayings that when he met a man who was certified to be in no way remarkable, he wanted to give three cheers. There are few of them, even in a little place like Thrums, but David Gemmell was one. So McQueen had always said, but Grizel was not so sure. He is very good-looking, and he does not know it, she would point out. Oh, what a remarkable man! She had known him intimately for nearly six years now, ever since he became the old doctor's assistant on the day when, in the tale of some others, he came to Thrums, aged twenty-one, to apply for the post. Grizel had even helped to choose him. She had a quaint recollection of his being submitted to her by McQueen, who told her to look him over and say whether he would do. An odd position in which to place a fourteen-year-old girl, but Grizel had taken it most seriously and, indeed, of the two men only Gemmell dared to laugh. "'You should not laugh when it is so important,' she said gravely, and he stood abashed, although I believe he chuckled again when he retired to his room for the night. She was in that room next morning, as soon as he had left it, to smell the curtains, he smoked, and see whether he folded his things up neatly, and used both the brush and the comb, but did not use pomade, and slept with his window open, and really took a bath instead of merely pouring the water into it and laying the sponge on top. Oh, she knew them! And her decision, after some days, was that, though far from perfect, he would do, if he loved her dear darling doctor sufficiently. By this time David was openly afraid of her, which Grizel noticed, and took to be, in the circumstances, a satisfactory sign. She watched him narrowly for the next year, and after that she ceased to watch him at all. She was like a congregation become so sure of its minister's soundness that it can risk going to sleep. To begin with, he was quite incapable of pretending to be anything he was not. Oh, how unlike a boy she had once known! His manner, like his voice, was quiet. Being himself the son of a doctor, he did not daughter through life amazed at the splendid eminence which he had climbed to, which is the weakness of Scottish students when they graduate, and often for fifty years afterwards. How sweet he was to Dr. McQueen, never forgetting the respect due to gray hairs, never hinting that the new school of medicine knew many things that were hidden from the old, and always having the sense to support McQueen when she was scolding him for his numerous naughty ways. When the old doctor came home now on cold nights, it was not with his cravat in his pocket, and Grizel knew very well who had put it round his neck. McQueen never had the humiliation, so distressing to an old doctor, of being asked by his patients to send his assistant instead of coming himself. He thought they preferred him, and twitted David about it. But Grizel knew that David had sometimes to order them to prefer the old man. She knew that when he said good night and was supposed to have gone to his lodgings, he was probably off to some poor house, where, if not he, a tired woman must sit the long night through by a sufferer's bedside and she realized with joy that his chief reason for not speaking of such things was that he took them as part of his natural work and never even knew that he was kind 
he was not specially skillful he had taken no honors either at school or college and he considered himself to be a very ordinary young man if you had said that on this point you disagreed with him his manner probably would have implied that he thought you a bit of an ass when a new man arrives in thrums the women come to their doors to see whether he is good-looking they said no of tommy when he came back but it had been an emphatic yes for dr gemmell he was tall and very slight and at twenty-seven as at twenty-one despite the growth of a heavy moustache there was a boyishness about his appearance which is i think what women love in a man more than anything else they are drawn to him by it and they love him out of pity when it goes i suppose it brings back to them some early beautiful stage in the world's history when men and women played together without fear perhaps it lay in his smile which was so winning that wrinkled old dames spoke of it who had never met the word before smiles being little known in thrums where in a workaday world we find it sufficient either to laugh or look thrawn his dark curly hair was what grizel was most suspicious of he must be vain of that she thought until she discovered that he was quite sensitive to its being mentioned having ever detested his curls as an eyesore and in his boyhood clipped them savagely to the roots he had such a firm chin if there had been another such chin going a-begging i should have liked to clap it on to tommy sandys tommy sandys all this time we have been neglecting that brave sufferer and while we talk his ankle is swelling and swelling well grizel was not so inconsiderate for she walked very fast and with an exceedingly determined mouth to dr gemmell's lodgings he was still in lodgings having refused to turn grizel out of her house though she had offered to let it to him she left word the doctor not being in that he was wanted at once by mr sandys who had sprained his ankle now then tommy for an hour perhaps until she went to bed she remained merciless she saw the quiet doctor with the penetrating eyes examining that ankle asking a few questions and looking curiously at his patient then she saw him lift his hat and walk out of the house it gave her pleasure no it did not while she thought of this tommy she despised there came in front of him a boy who had played with her long ago when no other child would play with her and now he said you have grown cold to me grizel and she nodded assent and little wells of water rose to her eyes and lay there because she had nodded assent she had never liked dr gemmell so little as when she saw him approaching her house next morning the surgery was still attached to it and very often he came from there his visiting book in his hand to tell her of his patience even to consult her indeed to talk to grizel about his work without consulting her would have been difficult for it was natural to her to decide what was best for everybody these consultations were very unprofessional but from her first coming to the old doctor's house she had taken it as a matter of course that in his practice as in affairs relating to his boots and buttons she should tell him what to do and he should do it McQueen had introduced his assistant to this partnership half shamefacedly and with a cautious wink over the little girl's head and gemmell fell into line at once showing her his new stethoscope as gravely as if he must abandon it at once should she not approve which fine behavior however was quite thrown away on grizel who had he conducted himself otherwise would merely have wondered what was the matter with the man and as she was eighteen or more before she saw that she had exceeded her duties it was then of course too late to cease doing it she knew now how good how forbearing he had been to the little girl and that it was partly because he was acquainted with her touching history the grave courtesy with which he had always treated her and which had sometimes given her as a girl a secret thrill of delight it was so sweet to grizel to be respected she knew now to be less his natural manner to women than something that came to him in her presence because he who knew her so well thought her worthy of deference and it helped her more far more than if she had seen it turn to love yet as she received him in her parlor now her too spotless parlor for not even the ashes in the grate were visible which is a mistake she was not very friendly he had discovered what tommy was and as she had been the medium she could not blame him for that but how could he look as calm as ever when such a deplorable thing had happened what you say is true i knew it before i asked you to go to him and i knew you would find it out but please to remember that he is a man of genius whom it is not for such as you to judge that was the sort of haughty remark she held ready for him when they talked of other cases but it was never uttered for by and by he said and then there is mr sandy's ankle a nasty accident i am afraid 
Was he jesting? She looked at him sharply. Have you not been to see him yet? She asked. He thought she had misunderstood him. He had been to see Mr. Sandys twice, both last night and this morning. And he was sure it was a sprain? Unfortunately, it was something worse. Dislocation. Further mischief might show itself presently. Hemorrhage into the neighboring joint on inflammation? She asked scientifically and with scorn. Yes. Grizel turned away from him. I think not, she said. Well, possibly not, if Mr. Sandys was careful and kept his foot from the ground for the next week. The doctor did not know that she was despising him, and he proceeded to pay Tommy a compliment. I had to reduce the dislocation, of course, he told her, and he bore the wretch splendidly, though there is almost no pain more acute. Did he ask you to tell me that? Grizel was thirsting to inquire, but she forbore. Unwittingly, however, the doctor answered the question. I could see, he said, that Mr. Sandys made light of his sufferings to save his sister pain. I cannot recall ever having seen a brother and sister so attached. That was quite true, Grizel admitted to herself. In all her recollections of Tommy, she could not remember one critical moment in which Elspeth had not been foremost in his thoughts. It passed through her head. Even now, he must make sure that Elspeth is in peace of mind before he can care to triumph over me. And she would perhaps have felt less bitter had he put his triumph first. His triumph! Oh, she would show him whether it was a triumph. He had destroyed forever her faith in David Gemmell. The quiet, observant doctor, who had such an eye for the false, had been deceived as easily as all the others, and it made her feel very lonely. But never mind, Tommy should find out, and that within the hour, that there was one whom he could not cheat. Her first impulse, always her first impulse, was to go straight to his side and tell him what she thought of him. Her second, which was neater, was to send by messenger her compliments to Mr. and Miss Sandys, and would they, if not otherwise engaged, come and have tea with her that afternoon. Not a word in the note about the ankle, but a careful sentence to the effect that she had seen Dr. Gemmell today and proposed asking him to meet them. Maggie Ann, who had conveyed the message, came back with the reply. Elspeth regretted that they could not accept Grizel's invitation, owing to the accident to her brother being very much more serious than Grizel seemed to think. I can't understand, Elspeth added, why Dr. Gemmell did not tell you this when he saw you. Is it a polite letter? asked inquisitive Maggie Ann, and Grizel assured her that it was most polite. I hardly expected it, said the plain-spoken dame, for I'm thinking by their manner it's more than can be said of yours. I merely invited them to come to tea. And him, with his leg broke. Did you know Kenny was lying on chairs? I did not know it was so bad as that, Maggie Ann. So my letter seemed to annoy him, did it? said Grizel eagerly, and I fear well pleased. It angered her most terrible, said Maggie Ann, but no him. He gave sort of a laugh when he read it. A laugh? Ay, and since she says, it is most heartless of Grizel, she does not even ask how you are today, one would think she did not know of the accident. And, she says, I have a good mind to write her a very stiff letter. And says he in a noble, melancholic voice, We must not hurt Grizel's feelings, he says. And she says, Grizel thinks it was nothing because you bore it so cheerfully. Oh, how little she knows you, she says, and you are too forgiving, she says. And says he, if I have anything to forgive Grizel for, I forgive her willingly. And signed she quieted down and wrote the letter. Forgive her? Oh, how it enraged Grizel! How like the Tommy of old to put it in that way! There had never been a boy so good at forgiving people for his own crimes, and he always looked so modest when he did it. He was reclining on his chairs at this moment, she was sure he was, forgiving her in every sentence. She could have endured it more easily had she felt sure that he was seeing himself as he was. But she remembered him too well to have any hope of that. She put on her bonnet and took it off again. A terrible thing, remember, for Grizel to be in a state of indecision. For the remainder of that day she was not wholly inactive. Meeting Dr. Gemmell in the street, she impressed upon him the advisability of not allowing Mr. Sandys to move for at least a week. He might take a drive in a day or two, the doctor thought, with his sister. He would be sure to use his foot, Grizel maintained. If you once let him rise from his chair, you know they all do. And Gemmell agreed that she was right. So she managed to give Tommy as irksome a time as possible. But next day she called. To go through another day without letting him see how despicable she thought him was beyond her endurance. 
Elspeth was a little stiff at first, but Tommy received her heartily, and with nothing in his manner to show that she had hurt his finer feelings. His leg, the wrong leg, as Grizel remembered at once, was extended on a chair in front of him, but instead of nursing it ostentatiously as so many would have done, he made humorous remarks at its expense. "'The fact is,' he said cheerily, "'that so long as I don't move I never felt better in my life. And I dare say I could walk almost as well as either of you, only my tyrant of a doctor won't let me try.' "'He told me you had behaved splendidly,' said Grizel, while he was reducing the dislocation. "'How brave you are! You could not have endured more stoically, though there had been nothing the matter with it.' "'It was soon over,' Tommy replied lightly. "'I think Elspeth suffered more than I.' Elspeth told the story of his heroism. "'I could not stay in the room,' she said. "'It was too terrible.' And Grizel despised too tender-hearted Elspeth for that. She was so courageous at facing pain herself. But Tommy had guessed that Elspeth was trembling behind the door, and he had cried out, "'Don't cry, Elspeth. I am all right. It is nothing at all.' How noble was Grizel's comment when she heard of this, and then Elspeth was her friend again, insisted on her staying to tea, and went into the kitchen to prepare it. Aaron was out. The two were alone now, and in the circumstances some men would have given the lady the opportunity to apologize, if such was her desire. But Tommy's was a more generous nature. His manner was that of one less sorry to be misjudged than anxious that Grizel should not suffer too much from remorse. If she had asked his pardon then and there, I am sure he would have replied, Right willingly, Grizel, and begged her not to give another thought to the matter. What is of more importance, Grizel was sure of this also, and it was the magnanimity of him that especially annoyed her. There seemed to be no disturbing it. Even when she said, Which foot is it? he answered, The one on the chair, quite graciously, as if she had asked a natural question. Grizel pointed out that the other foot must be tired of being a foot in waiting. It had got a little exercise, Tommy replied lightly, last night and again this morning, when it had helped to convey him to and from his bed. Had he hopped? she asked brutally. No, he said. He had shuffled along. Half rising, he attempted to show her humorlessly how he walked nowadays, tried not to wince, but had to. Ugh, that was a twinge. Grizel sarcastically offered her assistance, and he took her shoulder gratefully. They crossed the room, a tedious journey. "'Now let me see if you can manage alone,' she says, and suddenly deserts him. He looked rather helplessly across the room. Few sights are so pathetic as the strong man of yesterday feeling that the chair by his fire is a distant object today. Tommy knew how pathetic it was, but Grizel did not seem to know. "'Try it,' she said encouragingly. "'It will do you good.' He got as far as the table and clung to it, his teeth set. Grizel clapped her hands. "'Excellently done,' she said, with fell meaning, and recommended him to move up and down the room for a little. He would feel ever so much the better for it afterwards. "'The pain was considerable,' he said. Oh, she saw that, but he had already proved himself so good at bearing pain, and the new school of surgeons held that it was wise to exercise an injured limb. Even then it was not a reproachful glance that Tommy gave her, though there was some sadness in it. He moved across the room several times, a groan occasionally escaping him. Admirable, said his critic. Bravo! Would you like to stop now? Not until you tell me to, he said determinedly, but with a gasp. It must be dreadfully painful, she replied coldly, but I should like you to go on. And he went on until suddenly he seemed to have lost the power to lift his feet. His body swayed. There was an appealing look on his face. Don't be afraid. You won't fall, said Grizel. But she had scarcely said it when he fainted dead away and went down at her feet. Oh, how dare you, she cried in sudden flame, and she drew back from him. But after a moment she knew that he was shamming no longer or she knew it and yet could not quite believe it, for hurrying out of the room for water, she had no sooner passed the door than she swiftly put back her head as if to catch him unawares, but he lay motionless. The sight of her dear brother on the floor paralyzed Elspeth, who could only weep for him, and called to him to look at her and speak to her. But in such an emergency Grizel was as useful as any doctor, and by the time Gemmell arrived in haste, the invalid was being brought to. The doctor was a practical man who did not ask questions while there was something better to do. Had he asked any as he came in, Grizel would certainly have said, 
He wanted to faint to make me believe he really has a bad ankle, and somehow he managed to do it. And if the doctor had replied that people can't faint by wishing, she would have said that he did not know Mr. Sandys. But, with few words, Gemmell got his patient back to the chairs, and proceeded to undo the bandages that were round his ankle. Grizel stood by, assisting silently. She had often assisted the doctors, but never before with that scornful curl of her lip. So the bandages were removed, and the ankle laid bare. It was very much swollen and discolored, and when Grizel saw this, she gave a little cry, and the ointment she was holding slipped from her hand. For the first time since he came to Thrums, she had failed Gemmell at a patient's side. "'I had not expected it to be like this,' she said in a quivering voice when he looked at her in surprise. "'It will look much worse tomorrow,' he assured them grimly. "'I can't understand, Miss Sandys, how this came about.' "'Miss Sandys was not in the room,' said Grizel, abjectly. "'But I was, and I—' Tommy's face was begging her to stop. He was still faint and in pain, but all thought of himself left him in his desire to screen her. "'I owe you an apology, doctor,' he said quickly, "'for disregarding your instructions. It was entirely my own fault. I would try to walk.' "'Every step must have been agony,' the doctor rapped out, and Grizel shuddered. "'Not nearly so bad as that,' Tommy said, for her sake. "'Agony,' insisted the doctor, as if for once he enjoyed the word." it was a mad thing to do as surely you could guess grizel why did you not prevent him she certainly did her best to stop me tommy said hastily but i suppose i had some insane fit on me for do it i would i am very sorry doctor his face was wincing with pain and he spoke jerkily but the doctor was still angry he felt that there was something between these two which he did not understand and it was strange to him and unpleasant to find grizel unable to speak for herself i think he doubted tommy from that hour all he said in reply however was it is unnecessary to apologize to me you yourself are the only sufferer but was tommy the only sufferer gemmell left and elspeth followed him to listen to those precious words which doctors drop as from a vial on the other side of a patient's door and then grizel who had been standing at the window with head averted turned slowly round and looked at the man she had wronged her arms which had been hanging rigid the fists closed, went out to him to implore forgiveness. I don't know how she held herself up and remained dry-eyed. Her whole being wanted so much to sink by the side of his poor, tortured foot and bathe it in her tears. So, you see, he had won. Nothing to do now but to forgive her beautifully. Go on, Tommy. You are good at it. But the unexpected only came out of Tommy. Never was there a softer heart. In London, the old lady who sold matches at the street corner had got all his pence. Had he heard her, or any other, mourning a son sentenced to the gallows, he would immediately have wondered whether he might take the condemned one's place. What a speech Tommy could have delivered from the scaffold! There was nothing he would not jump at doing for a woman in distress, except, perhaps, destroy his notebook. And Grizel was in anguish. She was his suppliant, his brave, lonely little playmate of the past, the noble girl of today, Grizel, whom he liked so much. As through a magnifying glass, he saw her top-heavy with remorse for life, unable to sleep of nights, crushed and— He was not made of the stuff that could endure it. The truth must out. Grizel, he said impulsively, you have nothing to be sorry for. You were quite right. I did not hurt my foot that night in the den, but afterwards, when I was alone, before the doctor came. I ricked it in here intentionally in the door. It sounds incredible. But I set my teeth and did it, Grizel, because you had challenged me to a duel, and I would not give in. As soon as it was out, he was proud of himself for having the generosity to confess it. He looked at Grizel expectantly. Yes, it sounded incredible, and yet she saw that it was true. As Elspeth returned at that moment, Grizel could say nothing. She stood looking at him only over her high collar of fur. Tommy actually thought that she was admiring him. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of Tommy and Grizel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry. Chapter Eight. 
what grizel's eyes said to be the admired of women how tommy had fought for it since first he drank of them in pym's sparkling pages to some it seems too easy but to him it was a labor of sisyphus everything had been against him but he concentrated no labor was too herculean he was prepared if necessary to walk round the world to get to the other side of the wall across which some men can step and he did take a roundabout way it is my opinion for instance that he wrote his book in order to make a beginning with the ladies that as it may be at all events he is on the right side of the wall now and here is even grizel looking wistfully at him had she admired him for something he was not and a good many of them did that he would have been ill satisfied he wanted her to think him splendid because he was splendid and the more he reflected the more clearly he saw that he had done a big thing how many men would have had the courage to rick their foot as he had done he shivered when he thought of it and even of these spartans how many would have let the reward slip through their fingers rather than wound the feelings of a girl these had not been his thoughts when he made confession he had spoken on an impulse but now that he could step out and have a look at himself he saw that this made it a still bigger thing he was modestly pleased that he had not only got grizel's admiration but earned it and he was very kind to her when next she came to see him no one could be more kind to them than he when they admired him he had the most grateful heart had our tommy when next she came to see him that was while his ankle still nailed him to the chair a fortnight or so during which tommy was at his best sending gracious messages by elspeth to the many who called to inquire and writing hard at his new work pad on knee so like a brave soul whom no unmerited misfortune could subdue that it would have done you good merely to peep at him through the window grizel came several times and the three talked very ordinary things mostly reminiscences she was as much a plain-spoken princess as ever but often he found her eyes fixed on him wistfully and he knew what they were saying they spoke so eloquently that he was a little nervous lest elspeth should notice it was delicious to tommy to feel that there was this little unspoken something between him and grizel he half regretted that the time could not be far distant when she must put it into words as soon say as elspeth left the room an exquisite moment no doubt but it would be the plucking of the flower don't think that tommy conceived grizel to be in love with him on my sacred honor that would have horrified him curiously enough she did not take the first opportunity elspeth gave her of telling him in words how much she admired his brave confession she was so honest that he expected her to begin the moment the door closed and now that the artistic time had come for it he wanted it but no he was not hurt but he wondered at her shyness and cast about for the reason he cast far back into the past and caught a little girl who had worn this same wistful face when she admired him most he compared those two faces of the anxious girl and the serene woman and in the wistfulness that sometimes lay on them both they looked alike was it possible that the fear of him which the years had driven out of the girl still lived a ghost's life to haunt the woman at once he overflowed with pity as a boy he had exulted in grizel's fear of him as a man he could feel only the pain of it there was no one he thought less to be dreaded of a woman than he oh so sure tommy was of that and he must lay this ghost he gave his whole heart to the laying of it few men and never a woman could do a fine thing so delicately as he but of course it included a divergence from the truth for to tommy afloat on a generous scheme the truth was a buoy marking sunken rocks she had feared him in her childhood as he knew well he therefore proceeded to prove to her that she had never feared him she had thought him masterful and all his reminiscences now went to show that it was she who had been the masterful one you must often laugh now he said to remember how i feared you the memory of it makes me afraid of you still i assure you i juke it back as corp would say that day i saw you in church it was the instinct of self-preservation here comes grizel to lord it over me again i heard something inside me saying you called me masterful and yet i had always to give in to you that shows what a gentle yielding girl you were and what a masterful character i was 
His intention, you see, was, without letting Grizel know what he was at, to make her think he had forgotten certain unpleasant incidents in their past, so that, seeing they were no longer anything to him, they might the sooner become nothing to her. And she believed that he had forgotten, and she was glad. She smiled when he told her to go on being masterful, for old acquaintance had made him like it. Hers, indeed, was a masterful nature. She could not help it, and if the time ever came when she must help it, the glee of living would be gone from her. She did continue to be masterful, to a greater extent than Tommy, thus nobly behaving, was prepared for, and his shock came to him at the very moment when he was modestly expecting to receive the prize. She had called when Elspeth happened to be out, and though now able to move about the room with the help of a staff, he was still an interesting object. He saw that she thought so, and perhaps it made him hobble slightly more, not vaingloriously, but because he was such an artist. He ceased to be an artist suddenly, however, when Grizel made this unexpected remark. How vain you are! Tommy sat down, quite pale. Did you come here to say that to me, Grizel? he inquired and she nodded frankly over her high collar of fur. He knew it was true as Grizel said it, but though taken aback he could bear it, for she was looking wistfully at him, and he knew well what Grizel's wistful look meant. So long as women admired him, Tommy could bear anything from them. "'God knows I have little to be vain of,' he said humbly. "'Those are the people who are most vain,' she replied, and he laughed a short laugh which surprised her. She was so very serious." "'Your methods are so direct,' he explained. "'But of what am I vain, Grizel? Is it my book?' "'No,' she answered. "'Not about your book, but about meaner things. "'What else could have made you dislocate your ankle "'rather than admit that you had been rather silly?' "'Now, silly is no word to apply to a gentleman, "'and, despite his forgiving nature, "'Tommy was a little disappointed in Grizel. "'I suppose it was a silly thing to do,' he said, "'with just a touch of stiffness.' It was an ignoble thing, said she, sadly. I see. And I myself am the meaner thing than the book, am I? Are you not? she asked so eagerly that he laughed again. It is the first compliment you have paid my book, he pointed out. I like the book very much, she answered gravely. No one can be more proud of your fame than I. You are hurting me very much by pretending to think that it is a pleasure to me to find fault with you. There was no getting past the honesty of her, and he was touched by it. Besides, she did admire him, and that, after all, is the great thing. "'Then why say such things, Grizel?' he replied good-naturedly. "'But if they are true?' "'Still, let us avoid them,' said he, and at that she was most distressed. "'It is so like what you used to say when you were a boy,' she cried. "'You are so anxious to have me grow up,' he replied with proper dolefulness. If you like the book, Grizel, you must have patience with the kind of thing that produced it. That night in the den, when I won your scorn, I was in the preliminary stages of composition. At such times an author should be locked up. But I had got out, you see. I was so enamored of my little fancies that I forgot I was with you. No wonder you were angry. I was not angry with you for forgetting me, she said sharply. There was no catching, Grizel, however artful you were. "'But you were sighing to yourself. "'You were looking as tragic as if some dreadful calamity had occurred.' "'The idea that had suddenly come to me was a touching one,' he said. "'But you looked triumphant, too. "'That was because I saw I could make something of it. "'Why did you walk as if you were lame?' "'The man I was thinking of,' Tommy explained, had broken his leg. "'I don't mind telling you that it was Corp. "'He ought to have minded telling her, for it could only add to her indignation.' but he was too conceited to give weight to that. "'Corp's leg was not broken,' said practical Grizel. "'I broke it for him,' replied Tommy, and when he had explained, her eyes accused him of heartlessness. "'If it had been my own,' he said in self-defense, "'it should have gone crack just the same.' "'Poor Gavinia! Had you no feeling for her?' "'Gavinia was not there,' Tommy replied triumphantly. "'She had run off with a soldier.' "'You dared to conceive that?' It helped. Grizel stamped her foot. You could take away dear Gavinia's character with a smile. On the contrary, said Tommy, my heart bled for her. Did you not notice that I was crying? 
but he could not make Grizel smile. So, to please her, he said, with a smile that was not very sincere. I wish I were different, but that is how ideas come to me, at least all those that are of any value. Surely you could fight against them and drive them away. This to Tommy, who held out sugar to them, to lure them to him. But still he treated her with consideration. That would mean my giving up writing altogether, Grisel, he said kindly. Then why not give it up? Really? But she admired him, and he still bore with her. I don't like the book, she said, if it is written at such a cost. People say the book has done them good, Grisel. What does that matter if it does you harm? In her eagerness to persuade him, her words came pell-mell. If writing makes you live in such an unreal world, it must do you harm. I see now what Mr. Cathro meant long ago when he called you sent it— Tommy winced. I remember what Mr. Cathro called me, he said, with surprising hauteur for such a good-natured man. But he does not call me that now. Nobody calls me that now except you, Grizel. What does that matter, she replied distressfully, if it's true? In the definition of sentimentality in the dictionary. He rose indignantly. You have been looking me up in the dictionary, have you, Grizel? Yes, the night you told me you would hurt your ankle intentionally. He laughed without mirth now. I thought you had put that down to vanity. I think, she said, it was vanity that gave you the courage to do it and he liked one word in this remark. Then you do give me credit for a little courage. I think you could do the most courageous things, she told him, so long as there was no real reason why you should do them. It was a shot that rang the bell. Oh, our Tommy heard it ringing. But to do him justice, he bore no malice. He was proud, rather, of Grizel's markmanship. At least, he said meekly, it was courageous of me to tell you the truth in the end. But to his surprise, she shook her head. No, she replied. It was sweet of you. You did it impulsively because you were sorry for me, and I think it was sweet. But impulse is not courage. So now Tommy knew all about it. His plain-spoken critic had been examining him with a candle, and had paid particular attention to his defects, but against them she set the fact that he had done something chivalrous for her, and it held her heart though the others were in possession of the head. How like a woman, he thought, with a pleased smile. He knew them. Still, he was chagrined that she made so little of his courage, and it was to stab her that he said, with subdued bitterness, I always had a suspicion that I was that sort of person, and it is pleasant to have it pointed out by one's oldest friend. No one will ever accuse you of want of courage, Grizel. She was looking straight at him, and her eyes did not drop, but they looked still more wistful. Tommy did not understand the courage that made her say what she had said, but he knew he was hurting her. He knew that if she was too plain-spoken it was out of loyalty, and that to wound Grizel because she had to speak her mind was a shame. Yes, he always knew that. But he could do it. He could even go on. And it is satisfactory that you have thought me out so thoroughly, because you will not need to think me out any more. You know me now, Grizel, and can have no more fear of me. When was I ever afraid of you? she demanded. She was looking at him suspiciously now. Never as a girl? he asked. It jumped out of him. He was sorry as soon as he had said it. There was a long pause. So you remembered it all the time, she said quietly. You have been making pretense again! He asked her to forgive him, and she nodded her head at once. But why did you pretend to have forgotten? I thought it would please you, Grizel. Why should pretense please me? She rose suddenly in a white heat. You don't mean to say that you think I am afraid of you still? He said no a moment too late. He knew it was too late. Don't be angry with me, Grizel, he begged her earnestly. I am so glad I was mistaken. It made me miserable. I have been a terrible blunderer, but I mean well. I misread your eyes. My eyes? They have always seemed to be watching me, and often there was such a wistful look in them. It reminded me of the past. You thought I was still afraid of you. Say it, said Grizel, stamping her foot. But he would not say it. It was not merely fear that he thought he had seen in her eyes, you remember. 
this was still his comfort and i suppose it gave the touch of complacency to his face that made grizel merciless she did not mean to be merciless but only to tell the truth if some of her words were scornful there was sadness in her voice all the time instead of triumph for years and years she said standing straight as an elephant i have been able to laugh at all the ignorant fears of my childhood and if you don't know why i have watched you and been unable to help watching you since you came back i shall tell you but i think you might have guessed you who writes books about women it is because i liked you when you were a boy you were often horrid but you were my first friend when every other person was against me you let me play with you when no other boy or girl would let me play and so all the time you have been away i have been hoping that you were growing into a noble man and when you came back i watched to see whether you were the noble man i wanted you so much to be and you are not do you see now why my eyes look wistful it is because i wanted to admire you and i can't she went away and the great authority on women raged about the room oh but he was galled there had been five feet nine of him but he was shrinking by and by the red light came into his eyes End of chapter 8chapter nine of tommy and grizel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand tommy and grizel by j m barry chapter nine gallant behavior of t sandys there were now no fewer than three men engaged each in his own way in the siege of grizel nothing in common between them except insulted vanity one was a broken fellow who took for granted that she preferred to pass him by in the street his bow was also an apology to her for his existence he not only knew that she thought him wholly despicable but agreed with her in the long ago yesterday for instance he had been happy courted esteemed he had even esteemed himself and so done useful work in the world but she had flung him to earth so heavily that he had made a hole in it out of which he could never climb there he lay damned hers the glory of destroying him he hoped she was proud of her handiwork that was one thomas sandys the one perhaps who put on the velvet jacket in the morning but it might be number two who took that jacket off at night he was a good-natured cynic vastly amused by the airs this little girl put on before a man of note and he took a malicious pleasure in letting her see that they entertained him he goaded her intentionally into expressions of temper because she looked prettiest then and trifled with her hair but this was in imagination only and called her a quaint child but this was beneath his breath the third he might be the one who wore the jacket was a haughty boy who was not only done with her forever but meant to let her see it his soul cried oh oh for a conservatory and some of society's darlings and grizel at the window to watch how he got on with them and now that i think of it there was also a fourth sandys the grave author whose life in two volumes eight vo i ought at this moment to be writing without a word about the other tommies they amused him a great deal when they were doing something big he would suddenly appear and take a note of it the boy who was stiffly polite to her when tommy was angry he became very polite told her that he had been invited to the spittle the seat of the rintoul family and that he understood there were some charming girls there i hope you will like them grizel said pleasantly if you could see how they will like me he wanted to reply but of course he could not and unfortunately there was no one by to say it for him tommy often felt this want of a secretary the abject one found a glove of grizel's that she did not know she had lost and put it in his pocket there it lay unknown to her he knew that he must not even ask them to bury it with him in his grave this was a little thing to ask but too much for him he saw his effects being examined after all that was mortal of t sandys had been consigned to earth and this pathetic little glove coming to light ah then then grizel would know by the way what would she have known i am sure i cannot tell you nor could tommy forced to face the question in this vulgar way have told you yet whatever it was it gave him some moist moments 
if grizel saw him in this mood her reproachful look implied that he was sentimentalizing again how this little chit understood him the man of the world sometimes came upon the glove in his pocket and laughed at it as such men do when they recall their callow youth he took walks with grizel without her knowing that she accompanied him or rather he let her come she was so eager in his imagination for bright were the dreams of thomas he saw her looking longingly after him just as the dog looks and then not being really a cruel man he would call over his shoulder put on your hat little woman you can come then he conceived her wandering with him through the den and caddam wood clinging to his arm and looking up adoringly at him what a loving little soul it is he said and pinched her ear whereat she glowed with pleasure but i forgot he would add bantering her you don't admire me hi ho grizel wants to admire me but she can't he got some satisfaction out of these flights of fancy but it had a scurvy way of deserting him in the hour of greatest need where was it for instance when the real grizel appeared and fixed that inquiring eye on him he went to the spittle several times elspeth with him when she cared to go for lady rintoul and all the others had to learn and remember that unless they made much of elspeth there could be no tea sandies for them he glared at any one male or female who on being introduced to elspeth did not remain obviously impressed by her side give pleasure to elspeth or away i go was written all over him and it had to be the right kind of pleasure too the ladies must feel that she was more innocent than they and talk accordingly he would walk the flower garden with none of them until he knew for certain that the man walking it with little elspeth was a person to be trusted once he was convinced of this however he was very much at their service and so little to be trusted himself that perhaps they should have had careful brothers also he told them one at a time that they were strangely unlike all the other women he had known and held their hands a moment longer than was absolutely necessary and then went away leaving them and him a prey to conflicting and puzzling emotions lord rintoul whose hair was so like his skin that in the family portraits he might have been painted in one color could never rid himself of the feeling that it must be a great thing to a writing chap to get a good dinner but her ladyship always explained him away with an apologetic smile which went over his remarks like a piece of india rubber so that in the end he had never said anything she was a slight pretty woman of nearly forty and liked tommy because he remembered so vividly her coming to the spittle as a bride he even remembered how she had been dressed her white bonnet for instance for so long tommy said musing i resented other women in white bonnets it seemed profanation how absurd she told him laughing you must have been quite a small boy at the time but with a lonely boy's passionate admiration for beautiful things he answered and his gravity was a gentle rebuke to her it was all a long time ago he said taking both her hands in his but i never forgot and dear lady i have often wanted to thank you what he was thanking her for is not precisely clear but she knew that the artistic temperament is an odd sort of thing and from this time lady rintoul liked tommy and even tried to find the right wife for him from among the families of the surrounding clergy his step was sometimes quite springy when he left the spittle but grizel's shadow was always waiting for him somewhere on the way home to take the life out of him and after that it was again oh sorrowful delusion oh world gone gray grizel did not admire him t sandys was no longer a wonder to grizel he went home to that as surely as the laborer to his evening platter and now we come to the affair of the slugs corp had got a holiday and they were off together fishing the drumley water by lord rintoul's permission they had fished the drumley many a time without it and this was to be another such day as those of old the one who woke at four was to rouse the other never had either waked at four but one of them was married now and any woman can wake at any hour she chooses so at four corp was pushed out of bed and soon thereafter they took the road grizel's blinds were already up do you mind corp said how often when we had boasted we were to start at four and didna get roaded till six we wriggled by that window so grizel shouldna see us 
She usually did see us, Tommy replied ruefully. Grizel always spotted us, Corp, when we had anything to hide, and missed us when we were anxious to be seen. There was no juke in her, said Corp. Do you mind how that used to bother you? A senseless remark to a man whom it was bothering still, or shall we say to a boy. For the boy came back to Tommy when he heard the drumly singing. It was as if he had suddenly seen his mother looking young again. There had been a thunder shower as they drew near, followed by a rush of wind that pinned them to a dike, swept the road bare, banged every door in the glen, and then sank suddenly as if it had never been, like a mole in the sand. But now the sun was out, every fence and farmyard rope was a string of diamond drops. There was one to every blade of grass, they lurked among the wild roses, larks, drunken with song, shook them from their wings. The whole earth shone so gloriously with them that for a time Tommy ceased to care whether he was admired. We can pay nature no higher compliment. But when they came to the slugs. The slugs of Kenny is a wild crevice through which the drumly cuts its way, black and treacherous, into a lovely glade where it gambles for the rest of its short life. You would not believe, to see it laughing, that it had so lately escaped from prison. To the slugs they made their way not to fish, for any trout that are there are thinking forever of the way out and of nothing else, but to eat their luncheon, and they ate it sitting on the mossy stones the persons had long ago helped to smooth, and looking at a roan branch, which now as then was trailing in the water. There were no fish to catch, but there was a boy trying to catch them. He was on the opposite bank, had crawled down it, only other boys can tell how, a barefooted urchin of ten or twelve, with an enormous bag full of worms hanging from his jacket button. To put a new worm on the hook without coming to destruction, he first twisted his legs about a young birch and put his arms around it. He was after a big one, he informed Corp, though he might as well have been fishing in a treatise on the art of angling. Corp exchanged pleasantries with him, told him that Tommy was Captain Ure, and that he was his faithful servant, Alexander Bett, both of Edinburgh. Since the birth of his child, Corp had become something of a humorist. Tommy was not listening. As he lolled in the sun, he was turning, without his knowledge, into one of the other Tommies. Let us watch the process. He had found a half-fledged Mavis lying dead in the grass. Remember also how the larks had sung after rain. Tommy lost sight and sound of Corp and the boy. What he seemed to see was a baby lark that had got out of its nest sideways, a fall of half a foot only, but a dreadful drop for a baby. You can get back this way, its mother said, and showed it the way, which was quite easy, but when the baby tried to leap, it fell on its back. Then the mother marked out lines on the ground, from one to the other, of which he was to practice hopping, and soon it could hop beautifully so long as its mother was there to say every moment, How beautifully you hop! Now teach me to hop up, the little lark said, meaning that it wanted to fly, and the mother tried to do that also, but in vain. She could soar up, up, up bravely, but could not explain how she did it. This distressed her very much, and she thought hard about how she had learned to fly long ago last year. But all she could recall for certain was that you suddenly do it. Wait till the sun comes out after the rain, she said, half remembering. What is sun? What is rain? the little bird asked. If you cannot teach me to fly, teach me to sing. When the sun comes out after rain, the mother replied, then you will know how to sing. The rain came and glued the little bird's wings together. I shall never be able to fly nor to sing, it wailed. Then of a sudden it had to blink its eyes, for a glorious light had spread over the world, catching every leaf and twig and blade of grass in tears, and putting a smile in to every tear. The baby bird's breast swelled, it did not know why, and it fluttered from the ground, it did not know how. The sun has come out after the rain, it trilled. Thank you, sun. Thank you, thank you. Oh, mother, did you hear me? I can sing. And it floated up, 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 crying, thank you, thank you, thank you, to the sun. Oh, mother, do you see me? I am flying. And being but a baby, it soon was gasping, but still it trilled to the same ecstasy, and when it fell panting to the earth it still trilled, and the distracted mother called to it to take breath or it would die, but it could not stop. Thank you, thank you, thank you, it sang to the sun, till its little heart burst. With filmy eyes Tommy searched himself for the little pocket book in which he took notes of such sad thoughts as these, and in place of the book he found a glove wrapped in silk paper. 
He sat there with it in his hand, nodding his head over it so broken-heartedly you could not have believed that he had forgotten it for several days. Death was still his subject, but it was no longer a bird he saw. It was a very noble woman, and his white, dead face stared at the sky from the bottom of a deep pool. I don't know how he got there, but a woman who would not admire him had something to do with it. No sun after rain had come into that tragic life. To the water that had ended it, his white face seemed to be saying, Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was the old story of a faithless woman. He had given her his heart, and she had played with it. For her sake he had striven to be famous. For her alone he had toiled through the dreary years in London. The goal, her lap, in which he should one day place his book. A poor, trivial little work, he knew, yet much admired by the best critics. Never had his thoughts wandered from one instant of that time to another woman. He had been as faithful in life as in death, and now she came to the edge of the pool and peered down at his staring eyes and laughed. He had got this far when a shout from Corp brought him, dazed, to his feet. It had been preceded by another cry as the boy and the sapling he was twisted round toppled into the river together, uprooted stones and clods pounding after them and discoloring the pool into which the torrent rushes between rocks to swirl frantically before it dives down a narrow channel and leaps into another cauldron. There was no climbing down those precipitous rocks. Corp was shouting, gesticulating, impotent. "'How can you stand so still?' he roared. For Tommy was standing quite still, like one not yet thoroughly awake. The boy's head was visible now and again as he was carried round in the seething water. When he came to the outer ring down that channel he must infallibly go, and every second or two he was in a wider circle." Tommy was awake now, and he could not stand still and see a boy drown before his eyes. He knew that to attempt to save him was to face a terrible danger, especially as he could not swim, but he kicked off his boots. There was some gallantry in the man. "'You wouldn't a dare!' Corp cried, aghast. Tommy hesitated for a moment, but he had an abundance of physical courage. He clenched his teeth and jumped, but before he jumped he pushed the glove into Corp's hand, saying, "'Give her that, and tell her it never left my heart.' He did not say who she was. He scarcely knew that he was saying it. It was his dream intruding on reality, as a wheel may revolve for a moment longer after the spring breaks. Corp saw him strike the water and disappear. He tore along the bank as he had never run before, until he got to the water's edge below the slugs, and climbed and fought his way to the scene of the disaster. Before he reached it, however, we should have had no hero had not the sapling, the cause of all this pother, made amends by barring the way down the narrow channel. Tommy was clinging to it and the boy to him, and, at some risk, Corp got them both ashore, where they lay gasping like fish in a creel. The boy was the first to rise to look for his fishing rod, and he was surprised to find no six-pounder at the end of it. "'She has broke the line again,' he said, for he was sure then and ever afterwards that a big one had pulled him in. Corp slapped him for his ingratitude, but the man who had saved this boy's life wanted no thanks. "'Off to your home with you, wherever it is,' he said to the boy, who obeyed silently. And then to Corp. "'He is a little fool, Corp, but not such a fool as I am.' He lay on his face, shivering, not from cold, not from shock, but in a horror of himself. I think it may fairly be said that he had done a brave, if foolhardy, thing. It was certainly to save the boy that he had jumped— and he had given himself a moment's time in which to draw back if he should choose, which vastly enhances the merit of the deed. But sentimentality had been there also, and he was now shivering with a presentiment of the length to which it might one day carry him. They lit a fire among the rocks at which he dried his clothes, and then they set out for home, Corp doing all the talking. What a town there will be about this in Thrums! was his text, and he was surprised when Tommy at last broke silence by saying passionately, "'Never speak about this to me again, Corp, as long as you live. Promise me that. Promise never to mention it to anyone. I want no one to know what I did today, and no one will ever know unless you tell. The boy can't tell, for we are strangers to him.' "'He thinks you are a Captain Ure, and that I'm Alexander Bett, his servant,' said Corp. "'I telled him that for a divert.' Then let him continue to think that. Of course, Corp promised, and I'll go to the stake afore I break my promise, he swore, happily remembering one of the Jacobite oaths. But he was puzzled. They would make so much of Tommy if they knew. They would think him a wonder. Did he not want that? 
No, Tommy replied. You used to like it. You used to like it most michty. I have changed. Ay, you have, but since when? Since you took to making printed books? Tommy did not say, but it was more recently than that. What he was surrendering no one could have needed to be told less than he. The magnitude of the sacrifice was what enabled him to make it. He was always at home among the superlatives. It was the little things that bothered him. In his present fear of the ride that sentimentality might yet goad him to, he craved for mastery over self. He knew that his struggles with his familiar usually ended in an embrace, and he had made a passionate vow that it should be so no longer. The best beginning of the new man was to deny himself the glory that would be his if his deed were advertised to the world. Even Grizel must never know of it, Grizel, whose admiration was so dear to him. Thus he punished himself, and again I think he deserves respect. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of Tommy and Grizel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry. Chapter Ten. Gavinia on the Track. Corp, you remember, had said that he would go to the stake rather than break his promise, and he meant it, too, though what the stake was and why such a pother about going to it, he did not know. He was to learn now, forever, for to the stake he had to go. This was because Gavinia, when folding up his clothes, found in one of the pockets a glove wrapped in silk paper. Tommy had forgotten it until too late, for when he asked Corp for the glove it was already in Gavinia's possession, and she had declined to return it without an explanation. "'You must tell her nothing,' Tommy said sternly. He was uneasy, but relieved to find that Corp did not know whose glove it was, or even why gentlemen carry a lady's glove in their pocket. At first Gavinia was mildly curious only, but her husband's refusal to answer any questions roused her dander. She tried cajolery, fried his take of trout deliciously for him, and he sat down to them sniffing. They were small, and the remainder of their brief career was in two parts. First he lifted them by the tail, then he laid down the tail, but not a word about the glove. She tried tears. "'Dinna greet, woman,' he said in distress. "'What would the bairn say if he kent I made you greet?' Gavinia went on greeting, and the baby, waking up, promptly took her side. "'Damn the thing,' said Corp. "'Your ain bairn! I meant the glove!' he roared. It was curiosity only that troubled Gavinia. A reader of romance, as you may remember, she had encountered in the printed page a score of ladies who, on finding such parcels in their husbands' pockets, left their homes at once and forever, and she had never doubted but that it was the only course to follow. Such is the power of the writer of fiction. But when the case was her own, she was merely curious— such are the limitations of the writer of fiction. That there was a woman in it she did not believe for a moment. This, of course, did not prevent her saying, with a sob, Was the woman. With great earnestness, Corp assured her that there was no woman. He even proved it. Just listen to reason, Gavinia. If I was such a black as to be chief with only woman, and she wanted to give me a present will, she might give me a pair of gloves. But one glove? What use would one glove be to me? I tell you, if a woman had the impudence to give me one glove, I would fling it in her face. Nothing could have been clearer, as he had put it thus considerately, because when a woman, even the shrewdest of them, is excited, any man knows this, one has to explain matters to her as simply and patiently as if she were a four-year-old. Yet Gavinia affected to be unconvinced, and for several days she led Corp the life of a lodger in his own house. "'Hands off that poor innocent,' she said when he approached the baby. If he reproved her, she replied meekly, "'What can you expect from a woman that does no wear gloves?' To the baby, she said, "'He despises you, my bonnie, because you had no gloves. Ay, that's what makes him turn up his nose at you. But your mother is fond of you. Gloves or no gloves.' She told the baby the story of the glove daily, with many monstrous additions." When Corp came home from his work, she said that a poor, lovelorn female had called with a boot for him, and a request that he should carry it in the pocket of his Sabbath breeks. Worst of all, she listened to what he said in the night. 
Corp had a habit of talking in his sleep. He was usually taking tickets at such times, and it had been her custom to stop him violently. But now she changed her tactics. She encouraged him. I would be lying in my bed, he said to Tommy, dreaming that a man had fallen into the slugs, and instead of trying to save him I cried out, Tickets there, all tickets ready. And first he hands me a glove, and nist he hands me a boot, and havers of that kind such as anybody dreams. But in the middle of my dreams it comes o'er me that I had better waken up to see what Gavinia's doing. And I open my een, and there she is, sitting up, hearkening avidly to my every word, and putting sly questions to me about the glove. What glove? Tommy asked coldly. The glove in silk paper. I never heard of it, said Tommy. Corp sighed. No, he said loyally, neither did I. And he went back to the station and sat gloomily in a wagon. He got no help from Tommy, not even when rumors of the incident at the slugs became noised abroad. A buddy kins about the laddie now, he said. What laddie? Tommy inquired. Him that fell into the slugs. Ah, yes, Tommy said. I've just been reading about that in the paper. A plucky fellow, this Captain Ure who saved him. I wonder who he is. I wonder, Corp said with a groan. There was an Alexander Bet with him, according to the papers, Tommy went on. Do you know any Bet? It's Noah Thrum's name, Corp replied thankfully. I just made it up. What do you mean? Tommy asked blankly. Corp sighed and went back to the wagon. He was particularly truculent that evening when the six o'clock train came in. Tickets there. Look slippy with your tickets. His head bobbed up at the window of another compartment. Tick, he began, and then he ducked. The compartment contained a boy looking as scared as if he had just had his face washed, and an old woman who was clutching a large linen bag as if expecting some scoundrel to appear through the floor and grip it. With her other hand she held on to the boy, and being unused to travel, they were both sitting very self-conscious, humble, and defiant, like persons in church who have forgotten to bring their Bible. The general effect, however, was lost on Corp, for whom it was enough that in one of them he recognized the boy of the slugs. He thought that he had seen the old lady before also, but he could not give her a name. It was quite a relief to him to notice she was not wearing gloves. He heard her inquiring for one Alexander Bett, and being told that there was no such person in Thrums. He's married on a woman of the name of Gavinia, said the old lady, and then they directed her to the house of the only Gavinia in the place. With dark forebodings, Corp skulked after her. He remembered who she was now. She was the old woman with a nutcracker face on whom he had cried in, more than a year ago, to say that Gavinia was to have him. Her mud cottage had been near the slugs. Yes, and this was the boy who had been supping porridge with her. Corp guessed rightly that the boy had remembered his unlucky visit. I'm doomed, Corp muttered to himself, pronouncing it in another way. The woman, the boy, and the bag entered the house of Gavinia, and presently she came out with them. She was looking very important and terrible. They went straight to Ailey's cottage, and Corp was wondering why, when he suddenly remembered that Tommy was to be there at tea today. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Tommy and Grizel This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry, Chapter Eleven: The Tea Party. It was quite a large tea party, and was held in what had been the schoolroom. Nothing there now, however, to recall an academic past, for even the space against which a map of the world, Mercator's projection, had once hung, was gone the colour of the rest of the walls, and with it had faded away the last relic of the Hankey School. It will not fade so quickly from my memory, Tommy said to please Mrs. McLean. His affection for his old schoolmistress was as sincere as hers for him. I could tell you of scores of pretty things he had done to give her pleasure since his return, all carried out, too, with a delicacy which few men could rival, and never a woman, but they might make you like him, so we shall pass them by. Ailey said, blushing, that she had taught him very little. Everything I know, he replied, and then with a courteous bow to the gentleman opposite, except what I learned from Mr. Cathro. "'Thank you,' Cathro said shortly. 
Tommy had behaved splendidly to him, and called him his dear preceptor, and yet the dominie still itched to be at him with the tours as of old. And fine he knows I'm itching, he reflected, which made him itch the more. It should have been the most successful party, for in the rehearsals between the hostess and her maid Christina, every conceivable difficulty had been ironed out. Ailey was wearing her black silk, but without the Honiton lace, so that Miss Sophia Inez need not become depressed, and she had herself taken the chair with the weak back. Mr. Cathro, who, though a lean man, needed a great deal of room at table, had been seated far away from the spinet to allow Christina to pass him without climbing. Miss Sophia and Grizel had the doctor between them, and there was also a bachelor, but an older one, for Elspeth. Mr. McLean, as stout and humorous as of yore, had solemnly promised his wife to be jocular, but not too jocular. Neither minister could complain, for if Mr. Dissart had been asked to say grace, Mr. Glogue knew that he was to be called on for the benediction. Christina, obeying strict orders, glided around the table leisurely, as if she were not in the least excited, though she could be heard rushing along the passage like one who had entered for a race. And lastly, there was, as chief guest, the celebrated Thomas Sandys. It should have been a triumph of a tea party, and yet it was not. Mrs. McLean could not tell why. Grizel could have told why. Her eyes told why every time they rested scornfully on Mr. Sandys. It was he, they said, who was spoiling the entertainment, and for the pitiful reason that the company were not making enough of him. He was the guest of the evening, but they were talking admiringly of another man, and so he sulked. Oh, how she scorned Tommy! That other man was, of course, the unknown Captain Eurer, gallant rescuer of boys, hero of all who admire brave actions except the jealous Sandys. Tommy had pooh-poohed him from the first, to Grizel's unutterable woe. Have you not one word of praise for such a splendid deed? she had asked in despair. I see nothing splendid about it, he replied coldly. I advise you in your own interests not to talk in that way to others, she said. Don't you see what they will say? I can't help that, answered Tommy the Just. If they ask my opinion, I must give them the truth. I thought you were fond of the truth, Grizel. To that she could only wring her hands and say nothing, but it had never struck her that the truth could be so bitter. And now he was giving his opinion at Mrs. McLean's party, and they were all against him except in a measure Elspeth's bachelor, who said cheerily, We should all have done it if we had been in Captain Eurer's place. I would have done it myself, Miss Elspeth, though not fond of the water. He addressed all single ladies by their Christian name with a miss in front of it. This was the mark of confirmed bachelor, and comes upon him at one and twenty. I could not have done it. Grizel replied decisively, though she was much the bravest person present, and he explained that he meant the men only. His name was James Bonthron. Let us call him Mr. James. Men are so brave, she responded with her eyes on Tommy, and he received the stab in silence. Had the blood spouted from the wound, it would have been an additional gratification to him. Tommy was like those superb characters of romance who bear their breasts to the enemy and say, Strike! Well, well, Mr. Cathra observed, none of us was on the spot, and so we had no opportunity of showing our heroism. But you were near by, Mr. Sandys, and if you had fished up the water that day, instead of down, you might have been called upon. I wonder what you would have done. Yes, Tommy was exasperating to him still, as in the long ago, and Cathro said this maliciously, yet feeling that he did a risky thing, so convinced was he by old experience that you were getting in the way of a road machine when you opposed Thomas Sandys. I wonder, Tommy replied quietly. The answer made a poor impression, and Cathro longed to go on. But he was always most dangerous when he was quiet, he reflected uneasily, and checked himself in a sheer funk. Mr. Globe came, as he thought, to Tommy's defence. If Mr. Sandys questions, he said heavily, whether courage would have been a vouchsafe to him at that trying hour, it is right and fitting that he should admit it with Christian humility. Quite so, quite so, Mr. James agreed with heartiness. He had begun to look solemn at the word vouchsafed. For we are differently gifted, continued Mr. Glogue, now addressing his congregation. To some is given courage, to some learning, to some grace. Each has his strong point, he ended abruptly, and tucked reverently into the jam, which seemed to be his.
"'If he would not have risked his life to save the boy,' Elspeth interposed hotly, "'it would have been because he was thinking of me. "'I should like to believe that thought of you would have checked me,' Tommy said. "'I'm sure it would,' said Grizel. Mr. Cathro was rubbing his hands together covertly, yet half wishing he could take her aside and whisper, "'Be canny. It's grand to hear you, but be canny. He is looking most extraordinaire meek, and unless he has cast his skin since he was a laddie, it's not chancy to meddle with him when he is meek.' The doctor also noticed that Grizel was pressing Tommy too hard, and though he did not like the man, he was surprised. He had always thought her so fair-minded. "'For my part,' he said, "'I don't admire the unknown half so much for what he did as for his behaviour afterwards. To risk his life was something, but to disappear quietly without taking any credit for it was finer, and I should say much more difficult.' "'I think it was sweet of him,' Grizel said. "'I don't see it,' said Tommy, and the silence that followed should have been unpleasant to him, but he went on calmly. Doubtless it was a mere impulse that made him jump into the pool. An impulse is not courage.' He was quoting Grizel now, you observe, and though he did not look at her, he knew her eyes were fixed on him reproachfully. And so, he concluded, I suppose Captain Yor knew he had done no great thing, and preferred to avoid exaggerated applause. Even Elspeth was troubled. She must defend her dear brother. He would have avoided him himself, he explained quickly. He dislikes praise so much that he does not understand how sweet it is to smaller people. This made Tommy wince. He was always distressed when timid Elspeth blurted out things of this sort in company, and not the least of his merits was that he usually forbore from chiding her for it afterwards, so reluctant was he to hurt her. In a world where there were no women except Elspeth's, Tommy would have been a saint. He saw the doctor smiling now, and at once his annoyance with her changed to wrath against him for daring to smile at little Elspeth. She saw the smile too and blushed. But she was not angry, she knew that the people who smiled at her liked her, and that no one smiled at her so much as Dr. Gemmell. The Domine said fearfully, I have no doubt that explains it, Miss Sandys. Even as a boy I remember your brother had a horror of vulgar applause. Now, he said to himself, he will rise up and smite me. But no, Tommy replied quietly, I am afraid that was not my character, Mr. Cathro, but I hope I have changed since then, and that I could pull a boy out of the water without wanting to be extolled for it. That he could say such things before her was terrible to Grizel. It was perhaps conceivable that he might pull the boy out of the water, as he so ungenerously expressed it, but that he could refrain from basking in the glory thereof, that, she knew, was quite impossible. Her eyes begged him to take back those shameful words, but he bravely declined. Not even to please Grizel could he pretend that what was not was. No more sentiment for T. Sandys. The spirit has all gone out of him. What am I afraid of? reflected the dominey, and he rose suddenly to make a speech, teacup in hand. Cathro, Cathro, you tatty dooley, you are riding to destruction, said a warning voice within him. But against his better judgment he stifled it and began. He begged to propose the health of Captain Yore. He was sure they would all join with him cordially in drinking it, including Mr. Sandys, who unfortunately differed from them in his estimation of the hero. That was only, however, as had been conclusively shown, because he was a hero himself, and so could make light of heroic deeds, with other sly hits at Mr. Sandys. But when all the others rose to drink the toast, Tommy remained seated. The dominee coughed. Perhaps Mr. Sandys means to reply. Grizel suggested icily, and it was at this uncomfortable moment that Christina appeared suddenly, and in a state of suppressed excitement requested her mistress to speak with her behind the door. All the knowing ones were aware that something terrible must have happened in the kitchen. Miss Sophia thought it might have been the china teapot. She smiled reassuringly to signify that whatever it was she would help Mrs. McLean through, and so did Mr. James. He was a perfect lady. How dramatic it all was, as Ailey said frequently afterwards. She was back in a moment with her hand on her heart. Mr. Sandys, were her astounding words. A lady wants to see you. Tommy rose in surprise, as did several of the others. Was it really you? Ailey cried. She says it was you. I don't understand, Mrs. McLean, he answered. I have done nothing. But she says, and she is at the door. All eyes turned on the door so longingly that it opened under their pressure. 
and a boy who had been at the keyhole stumbled forward. "'That's him,' he announced, pointing a stern finger at Mr. Sandys. "'But he says he did not do it,' Ailey said. "'He's a liar,' said the boy. His manner was that of the police, and it had come so sharply upon Tommy that he looked not unlike a detected criminal. Most of them thought he was being accused of something vile, and the domini demanded with a light heart, "'Who is the woman?' while Mr. James had a pleasant feeling that the lady should be requested to retire, but just then the woman came in, and she was much older than they had expected. "'That's him, Granny,' the boy said, still severely. "'That's the man who saved my life at the slugs.' And then, when the truth was dawning on them all, and there were exclamations of wonder, a pretty scene suddenly presented itself for the old lady, who had entered with the timidest courtesy, slipped down on her knees before Tommy and kissed his hand. That young rascal of a boy was all she had. They were all moved by her simplicity, but none quite so much as Tommy. He gulped with genuine emotion, and saw her through a maze of beautiful thoughts that delayed all sense of triumph, and even made him forget for a little while to wonder what Grizel was thinking of him now. As the old lady poured out her thanks tremblingly, he was excitedly planning her future. He was a poor man, but she was to be brought by him into Thrums to a little cottage overgrown with roses. No more hard work for these dear old hands. She could sell scones, perhaps. She could have a cow. He would send the boy to college and make a minister of him. She should yet hear her grandson preach in the church, to which, as a boy, but here the old lady somewhat imperiled the picture by rising actively and dumping upon the table the contents of the bag, a fowl for Tommy. She was as poor an old lady as ever put a halfpenny into the church plate on Sundays. But that she should present a hen to the preserver of her grandson, her mind had been made up from the moment she had reason to think that she could find him. And it was to be the finest hen in all the country round. She was an old lady of infinite spirit, and daily dragging the boy with her lest he again went a-fishing. She trudged to farms near and far to examine and feel their hens. She was a brittle old lady who creaked as she walked and cracked like a wind-pod in the heat. But she did her dozen miles, or more a day, and passed all the fowls in review, and could not be deceived by the craftiest of farmers' wives. And in the tail of the day she became the possessor, and did herself throw her the neck of the stoutest and toughest hen that ever entered a linen bag head foremost. By this time the boy had given way in the legs, and hence the railway journey its cost defrayed by admiring friends with careful handling he should get a week out of her gift she explained complacently besides two makes of broth and she and the boy looked as if they would like dearly to sit opposite tommy during those seven days and watch him gorging if you look at the matter right it was a handsomer present than many a tiara but if you are of the same stuff as mr james it was only a hen mr james tittered and one or two of the others made ready to titter. It was a moment to try, Tommy, for there are doubtless heroes as gallant as he who do not know how to receive a present of a hen. Grizel, who had been holding back, moved a little nearer. If he hurt that sweet old woman's feelings, she could never forgive him. Never! He heard the titter, and ridicule was terrible to him. But he also knew why Grizel had come closer, and what she wanted of him. Our Tommy, in short, had emerged from his emotion, and once more knew what was what. It was not his fault that he stood revealed a hero. The little gods had done it. Therefore, let him do credit to the chosen of the little gods. The way he took that old lady's wrinkled hand and bowed over it and thanked her was an ode to manhood. Everyone was touched. Those who had been about to titter wondered what on earth Mr. James had seen to titter at, and Grizel almost clapped her hands with joy. She would have done it altogether had not Tommy just then made the mistake of looking at her for approval. She fell back, and intoxicated with himself, he thought it was because her heart was too full for utterance. Tommy was now splendid, and described the affair at the slugs with an adorable modesty. I assure you, it was a much smaller thing to do than you imagine. It was all over in a few minutes. I knew that in your good nature you would make too much of it, and so, foolishly, I can see now, I tried to keep it from you. As for the name of Captain Ure, it was an invention of that humorous dog, Corp, 
and so on, with the most considerate remarks when they insisted on shaking hands with him. I beseech you, don't apologise to me. I see clearly that the fault was entirely my own. Had I been in your place, Mr. James, I should have behaved precisely as you have done, and had you been at the slugs, you would have jumped in as I did. Mr. Cathro, you pain me by holding back. I assure you I esteem my old domine more than ever for the way in which you stuck up for Captain Ewer, though you must see why I could not drink that gentleman's health. And Mr. Cathro made the best of it, wringing Tommy's hand effusively, while muttering, Fool Donard Sturt Gauk! He was addressing himself, and any other person who might be so presumptuous as to try to get the better of Thomas Sandys. Cathro never tried it again. Had Tommy died that week, his old dominie would have been very chary of what he said at the funeral. They were in the garden now, the gentlemen without their hats. Have you made your peace with him? Cathro asked Grizel in a cautious voice. He is a devil's bucky, and I advise you to follow my example, Miss McQueen, and capitulate. I have always found him reasonable so long as you bend the knee to him. I am not his enemy, replied Grizel loftily. And if he has done a noble thing, I am proud of him, and will tell him so. I would tell him so, said the dominie, whether he had done it or not. Do you mean, she asked indignantly, that you think he did not do it? No, 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 he answered hurriedly. Or oh, mercy's sake, don't tell him I think that. And then, as Tommy was out of earshot, But I see there is no necessity for my warning you against standing in his way again, Miss McQueen, for you are up in arms for him now. I admire brave men, she replied, and he is one, is he not? You'll find him reasonable, said the dominey dryly. But though it was thus that she defended Tommy when others hinted doubts, she had not yet said that she was proud of him to the man who wanted most to hear it. For one brief moment, Grizel had exulted on learning that he and Captain Ewer were one, and then suddenly, to all the emotions now running within her, a voice seemed to cry, Halt! and she fell to watching sharply the doer of noble deeds. Her eyes were not wistful, nor were they contemptuous, but had Tommy been less elated with himself, he might have seen that they were puzzled and suspicious. To mistrust him in face of such evidence seemed half a shame. She was indignant with herself, even while she did it, but she could not help doing it. The truth about Tommy was such a vital thing to Grizel. She had known him so well, too well, up to a minute ago, and this was not the man she had known. How unfair she was to Tommy while she watched, when the old lady was on her knees thanking him, and every other lady was impressed by the feeling he showed, it seemed to Grizel that he was again in the arms of some such absurd sentiment as had mastered him in the den. When he behaved so charmingly about the gift, she was almost sure he looked at her, as he had looked in the old days before striding his legs and screaming out, "'Oh, am I not a wonder?' I see by your face that you think me a wonder. All the time he was so considerately putting those who had misjudged him at their ease, she believed he did it considerately that they might say to each other, How considerate he is! When she misread Tommy in such comparative trifles as these, is it to be wondered that she went into the garden still tortured by a doubt about the essential? It was nothing less than torture to her. When you discover what is in her mind, Tommy, you may console yourself with that. He discovered what was in her mind as Mr. Cathro left her. She felt shy, he thought, of coming to him after what had taken place, and with the generous intention of showing that she was forgiven, he crossed good-naturedly to her. "'You are very severe, Grizel,' he said, "'but don't let that distress you for a moment. It served me right for not telling the truth at once.' She did not flinch. "'Do we know the truth now?' she asked, looking at him steadfastly. I don't want to hurt you, you know that, but please tell me, did you really do it? I mean, did you do it in the way we have been led to suppose? It was a great shock to Tommy. He had not forgotten his vows to change his nature, and had she been sympathetic now, he would have confessed to her the real reason of his silence. He wanted boyishly to tell her, though, of course, without mention of the glove, but her words hardened him. Grissel, he cried reproachfully, and then in a husky voice, "'Can you really think so badly of me as that?' "'I don't know what to think,' she answered, pressing her hands together. "'I know you're very clever.' He bowed slightly. "'Did you?' she asked again. 
She was no longer chiding herself for being over-careful. She must know the truth. He was silent for a moment. Then, Grizel, he said, I am about to pain you very much, but you give me no option. I did do it precisely as you have heard, and may God forgive you for doubting me, he added with a quiver, as freely as I do. You will scarcely believe this, but a few minutes afterwards, Grizel having been the first to leave, he saw her from the garden going not home, but in the direction of Corpse's house, obviously to ask him whether Tommy had done it. Tommy guessed her intention at once, and he laughed a bitter ho-ho-ha, and wiped her from his memory. Farewell, woman, I am done with you, are the terrible words you may conceive Tommy saying. Next moment, however, he was hurriedly bidding his hostess good night could not even wait for Elspeth, clapped his hat on his head, and was off after Grizel. It had suddenly struck him that, now the rest of the story was out, Corp might tell her about the glove. Suppose Gavinia showed it to her. Sometimes he had kissed that glove passionately, sometimes pressed his lips upon it with the long tenderness that is less intoxicating but makes you a better man. But now, for the first time, he asked himself bluntly, Why had he done those things? with the result that he was striding to Corpse's house. It was not only for his own sake that he hurried. Let us do him that justice. It was chiefly to save Grizel the pain of thinking that he whom she had been flouting loved her, as she must think if she heard the story of the glove. That it could be nothing but pain to her he was boyishly certain, for assuredly this scornful girl wanted none of his love and though she was scornful, she was still the dear companion of his boyhood. Tommy was honestly anxious to save Grizel the pain of thinking that she had flouted a man who loved her. He took a different road from hers, but to his annoyance they met at Cowthie's corner. He would have passed her with a distant bow, but she would have none of that. You have followed me, with the hateful directness that was no part of Tommy's character. Grizel, you followed me to see whether I was going to question Corp. You were afraid he would tell me what really happened. You wanted to see him first to tell him what to say. Really, Grizel, is it not true? There are no questions so offensive to the artistic nature as those that demand a yes or no for answer. It is useless for me to say it is not true, he replied haughtily, for you won't believe me. Say it and I shall believe you, said she. Tommy tried standing on the other foot, but it was no help. I presume I may have reasons for wanting to see Corp that you are unacquainted with, he said. Oh, I am sure of it, replied Grizel scornfully. She had been hoping until now, but there was no more hope left in her. May I ask what it is that my oldest friend accuses me of? Perhaps you don't even believe that I was Captain Yore. I am no longer sure of it. How you read me, Grizel. I could hoodwink the others, but never you. I suppose it is because you have such an eye for the worst in any one. It was not the first time he had said something of this kind to her, for he knew that she suspected herself of being too ready to find blemishes in others, to the neglect of their better qualities, and that this made her uneasy, and also very sensitive to the charge. Today, however, her own imperfections did not matter to her. She was as nothing to herself just now, and scarcely felt his insinuations. "'I think you were, Captain Yor, she said slowly, "'and I think you did it, but not as the boy imagines.' You may be quite right, he replied, that I would not have done it had there been the least risk. That, I flatter myself, is how you reason it out. It does not explain, she said, why you kept the matter secret. Thank you, Grizel. Well, at least I have not boasted of it. No, and that is what makes me, she paused. Go on, said he, though I can guess what agreeable thing you are going to say. But she said something else. You may have noticed that I took the boy aside and questioned him privately. I little thought then, Grizel, that you suspected me of being an impostor. She clenched her hands again. It was all so hard to say, and yet she must say it. I did not. I saw he believed his story. I was asking him whether you had planned his coming with it to Mrs. McLean's house at that dramatic moment. You actually thought me capable of that? It makes me horrid to myself, she replied woefully. But if I thought you had done that, I could more readily believe the rest. "'Very well, Grizel,' said he. "'Go on thinking the worst of me. "'I would not deprive you of that pleasure if I could.' "'Oh, cruel, cruel,' she could have replied. "'You know it is no pleasure.' 
You know it is a great pain. But she did not speak. I have already told you that the boy's story is true, he said, and now you ask me why I did not shout it from the housetops myself. Perhaps it was for your sake, Grizel. Perhaps it was to save you the distress of knowing that in a momentary impulse I could so far forget myself as to act the part of a man. She pressed her hands more tightly. I may be wronging you, she answered. I should love to think so, but you have something you want to say to Corp before I see him. Not at all, said Tommy. If you still want to see Corp, let us go together. She hesitated, but she knew how clever he was. I prefer to go alone, she replied. Forgive me if I ask you to turn back. Don't go, he entreated her. Grizel, I give you my word of honour. It is to save you acute pain that I want to see Corp first. She smiled wanly at that, for though as we know it was true, she misunderstood him. He had to let her go on alone. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Tommy and Grizel This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry Chapter 12 In which a comedian challenges tragedy to bowls. When Grizel opened the door of Corpse's house, she found husband and wife at home, the baby in his father's arms. What is more, Gavinia was looking on, smiling and saying, You bonny litlin, you're windy to have in dandling you, and no wonder, for he's a father to be prouder. Corp was accepting it all with a complacent smirk. Oh, agreeable change since last we were in this house. Oh, happy picture of domestic bliss. Oh, but no, these are not the words. What we meant to say was, Gavinia, you limmer, so you've got the better of that man of yours at last. How had she contrived it? We have seen her escorting the old lady to the dovecot corpse skulking behind. Our next peep at them shows Gavinia back at her house, Corp peering through the window and wondering whether he dare venture in. Gavinia was still bothered, for though she knew now the story of Tommy's heroism, there was no glove in it, and it was the glove that maddened her. No, I care nothing about a glove, the old lady had assured her. Not a syllop was said about a glove, maintained Christina, who had given her a highly coloured narrative of what took place at Mrs. McLean's parlour. And yet there's a glove in it, as sure as there's a quirk in it, Gavinia kept muttering to herself. She rose to have another look at the hoddy place in which she had concealed the glove from her husband, and as she did so she caught sight of him at the window. He bobbed at once, but she hastened to the door to scarify him. The clock had given only two ticks when she was upon him, but in that time she had completely changed her plan of action. She welcomed him with smiles of pride. This was the nimbleness of women's wit measured once and for all. They need two seconds if they are to do the thing comfortably. Never to have told me, and you behave so grandly, she cried with adoring glances that were as a carpet on which he strode pompously into the house. It wasn't a me that did it, it was him, said Corp, and even then he feared that he had told too much. I can know what you're speaking about, he added loyally. Corp, she answered, you need not be so canny, for the laddie is in the town, and Mr. Sandys has confessed all. The whole of it? Every raison. About the glove, too? Glove and all, said wicked Gavinia, and she continued to feast her eyes so admiringly on her deceived husband that he passed quickly from the gratified to the dictatorial. Let this be a lesson to you, woman, he said sternly, and Gavinia intimated with humility that she hoped to profit by it. Having got the glove in so solemn a way, he went on, it would have been ill done of me to blab to you about it. Do you see that now, woman? She said it was as clear as day to her, and a solemn way it was, she added, and then waited eagerly. My opinion continued Corp, lowering his voice as if this were not a matter for the child, is that it's a love token for some London woman. But here's, cried Gavinia, else what he asked would make him hand it to me so solemn-like, and tell me to pass it on to her if he was drowned. I didn't think of that at the time, but it has come to me, Gavinia, it has come. This was a mouthful indeed to Gavinia, so the glove was the property of Mr. Sandys, and he was in love with a London lady. And, no, this is too slow for Gavinia. 
She saw these things in passing as one who jumps from the top of a house may have lightning glances through many windows on the way down. What she jumped to was the vital question. Who was the woman? She was too cunning to ask a leading question. Ay, she's his lady love, she said, controlling herself. But I forget her name. It was a very wise-like thing of you to spear the woman's name. But I dinner. You dinner? He was in the water in a clink. Had Gavinia been in Corpse's place, she would have had the name out of Tommy Water or no, but she did not tell her husband what she thought of him. Aye, of course, she said pleasantly. It was after you helped him out that he told you her name. Did he say he told me her name? He did. Well then, I've fair forgot it. Instead of boxing his ears, she begged him to reflect, a result of reflection that if the name had been mentioned to Corp, which he doubted, it began with M. Was it Mary? That was the name. Or was it Martha? It had a taste of Martha about it. It was not Margaret? It might have been Margaret. Or Matilda? It was fell like Matilda. And so on. But with all your wheedling, Corp reminded his wife, bantering her from aloft, you couldn't get a scraping out of me till I was free to speak. He thought it was a good opportunity for showing Gavinia her place once and for all. In small matters, he said, I give you your ain way, for though you may be wrong, thinks I to myself, she's but a woman. But in important things, Gavinia, if I humoured you, I would spoil you. So let this be a telling to you that there's no diddling a determined man. To which she replied by informing the baby that he had a father to be proud of. A father to be proud of. They were the words heard by Grizel as she entered. She also saw the Gavinia looking admiringly at her man and in that doleful moment she thought she understood all. It was Corp who had done it, and Tommy had been the looker-on. He had sought to keep the incident secret because, though he was in it, the glory had been won by another. Oh, how base! And now, profiting by the boy's mistake, he was swaggering in the other's clothes. Oh, baser still! Everything was revealed to her in a flash, and she stooped over the baby to hide a sudden tear. She did not want to hear any more. The baby cried. Babies are aware that they can't do very much, and all of them who knew Grizel were almost contemptuously confident of their power over her. And when this one saw, they are very sharp, that in his presence she could actually think of something else, he was so hurt that he cried. Was she to blame for thinking so meanly of Tommy? You can blame her with that tear in her eye if you choose, but I can only think of the gladness that came afterwards when she knew she had been unjust to him. Thank you, thank you, thank you, the bird sang to its creator when the sun came out after rain, and it was Grizel's song as she listened to Corpse's story of heroic Tommy. There was no room in her exultant heart for remorse. It would have shown littleness to be able to think of herself at all when she could think so gloriously of him. She was more than beautiful now, she was radiant, and it was because Tommy was the man she wanted him to be. As those who are cold hold out their hands to the fire, did she warm her heart at what Corp had to tell, and the great joy that was lit within her made her radiant. Now the baby was in her lap smiling back to her. He thought he had done it all. So you thought you could resist me, the baby crowed. The glove had not been mentioned yet. The sweetest thing of all to me, Grizel said, is that he did not want me to hear the story from you, Corp, because he knew you would sing his praises so loudly. I'm thinking, said Gavinia archly, he had another reason for not wanting you to question Corp. Maybe he didn't want you to care about the London lady and her glove. Will you tell her, man, or will I? They told her together, and what had been conjectures were now put forward as facts. Tommy had certainly said a London lady, and as certainly he had given her name. But what it was, Corp could not remember. But give her this and tell her it never left my heart. He could swear to these words, and no words could be stronger, Gavinia said triumphantly. She produced the glove and was about to take off its paper wrapping when Grizel stopped her. We have no right, Gavinia. I suppose we hear But I'm thinking the pocket it came out of is feeling gay too without it. Will you take it back to him? It was very wrong of you to keep it, Grizel answered, but I can't take it to him, for I see now that his reason for not wanting me to come here was to prevent my hearing about it. I am sorry you told me. 
Corp must take it back. But when she saw it being crushed in Corp's rough hand, a pity for the helpless glove came over her. She said, After all, I do know about it, so I can't pretend to him that I don't. I will give it to him, Corp. And she put the little package in her pocket with a brave smile. Do you think the radiance had gone from her face now? Do you think the joy that had been lit in her heart was dead? Oh, no, no. Grizel had never asked that Tommy should love her. She had asked only that he should be a fine man. She did not ask it for herself, only for him. She could not think of herself now, only of him. She did not think she loved him. She thought a woman should not love any man until she knew he wanted her to love him. But if Tommy had wanted it, she would have been very glad. She knew, oh, she knew so well that she could have helped him best. Many a noble woman has known it as she stood aside. In the meantime, Tommy had gone home in several states of mind. Reckless, humble, sentimental, most practical, defiant, apprehensive. At one moment he was crying, Now, Grizel, now when it is too late, you will see what you have lost. At the next he quaked and implored the gods to help him out of his predicament. It was apprehension that, on the whole, played most of the tunes for he was by no means sure that Grizel would not look upon the affair of the glove as an offer of his hand and accept him. They would show her the glove, and she would, of course, know it to be her own. Give her this and tell her it never left my heart? The words thumped within him now. How was Grizel to understand that he meant nothing in particular by them? I wonder if you misread him so utterly as to believe that he thought himself something of a prize. That is a vulgar way of looking at things of which our fastidious Tommy was incapable. As much as Grizel herself, he loathed the notion that women have a thirsty eye on man when he saw them cheapening themselves before the sex that should hold them beyond price he turned his head and would not let his mind dwell on the subject. He was a sort of gentleman was Tommy, and he knew Grizel so well that had all the other women in the world been of this kind, it would not have persuaded him that there was a drop of such blood in her. Then, if he feared that she was willing to be his, it must have been because he thought she loved him. Not a bit of it. As already stated, he thought he had abundant reason to think otherwise. It was remorse that he feared might bring her to his feet, the discovery that while she had been jibing at him, he had been a heroic figure suffering in silence, eating his heart for love of her. Undoubtedly, that was how Grizel must see things now. He must seem to her to be an angel rather than a mere man, and in sheer remorse she might cry, I am yours. Vain though Tommy was, the picture gave him not a moment's pleasure. Alarm was what he felt. Of course he was exaggerating Grizel's feelings. She had too much self-respect and too little sentiment to be willing to marry any man because she had unintentionally wronged him. But this is how Tommy would have acted had he happened to be a lady. Remorse, pity, no one was so good at them as Tommy. In his perturbation, he was also good at maidenly reserve. He felt strongly that the proper course for Grizel was not to refer to the glove, to treat that incident as closed unless he chose to reopen it. This was so obviously the correct procedure that he seemed to see her adopting it like a sensible girl, and relief would have come to him had he not remembered that Grizel usually took her own way and that it was seldom his way. There were other ways of escape, for instance, if she would only let him love her hopelessly. O Grizel had but to tell him there was no hope, and then how finely he would behave. It would bring out all that was best in him. He saw himself passing through life as her very perfect knight. Is there no hope for me? He heard himself begging for hope, and he also heard her firm answer, None. How he had always admired the outspokenness of Grizel. Her none was as splendidly decisive as of yore. The conversation thus begun ran on in him, Tommy doing the speaking for both, though his lips never moved, and feeling the scene as vividly as if Grizel had really been present and Elspeth was not. Elspeth was sitting opposite him. At least let me wait, Grizel, he implored. I don't care for how long. Fix a time yourself, and I shall keep to it and I promise never to speak one word of love to you until that moment comes, and then, if you bid me go, I shall go. Give me something to live for. It binds you to nothing, and oh, it would make such a difference to me. 
Then Grizel seemed to reply gently, but with the firmness he adored, I know I cannot change, and it would be mistaken kindness to do as you suggest. No, I can give you no hope, but though I can never marry you, I will watch your future with warm regard, for you have today paid me the highest compliment a man can pay a woman. How charmingly it was all working out. Tommy bowed with dignity and touched her hand with his lips. What is it they do next in Pym, and even more expensive authors? Oh, yes. If at any time in your life, dear Grizel, he said, you are in need of a friend, I hope you will turn first to me. It does not matter where your message reaches me. I will come to you without delay. In his enthusiasm, he saw the letter being delivered to him in Central Africa, and immediately he wheeled round on his way to Thrums. There is one other little request I should like to make of you, he said huskily. Perhaps I ask too much, but it is this. May I keep your glove? She nodded her head. She was so touched that she could scarcely trust herself to speak. But you will soon get over this, she said at last. Another glove will take the place of mine. The time will come when you will be glad that I said I could not marry you. Grizel, he cried in agony. He was so carried away by his feelings that he said the word aloud. Where? asked Elspeth, looking at the window. Was it not she who passed just now? he replied promptly. And they were still discussing his mistake when Grizel did pass, but only to stop at the door. She came in. My brother must have the second sight, declared Elspeth gaily, for he saw you coming before you came. And she told what had happened, while Grizel looked happily at Tommy, and Tommy looked apprehensively at her. Grizel, he might have seen, was not wearing the tragic face of sacrifice. It was a face shining with gladness. A girl, still too happy in his nobility, to think remorsefully of her own misdeeds. To let him know that she was proud of him, that was what she had come for chiefly, and she was even glad that Elspeth was there to hear. It was an excuse to her to repeat Corpse's story, and she told it with defiant looks at Tommy that said, You are so modest. You want to stop me, but Elspeth will listen. It is nearly as sweet to Elspeth as it is to me, and I shall tell her every word, yes, and tell her a great deal of it twice. It was not modesty which made Tommy so anxious that she would think less of him, but naturally it had that appearance. The most heroic fellows, I am told, can endure being extolled by pretty girls, but here seemed to be one who could not stand it. You need not think it is of you we are proud, she assured him light-heartedly. It is really ourselves. I am proud of being your friend. Tomorrow when I hear the town ringing your praises, I shall not say, yes, isn't he wonderful? I shall say, talk of me. I, too, am an object of interest, for I am his friend. I have often been pointed out as his sister, said Elspeth complacently. He did not choose his sister, replied Grizel, but he chose his friends. For a time he could suck no sweetness from it. She avoided the glove. He was sure only because of Elspeth's presence, but anon there arrived to cheer him a fond hope that she had not heard of it, and as this became conviction, exit the Tommy who could not abide himself and enter another who was highly charmed therewith. Tommy had a notion that certain whimsical little gods protected him in return for the sport he gave them, and he often kissed his hand to them when they came to the rescue. He would have liked to kiss it now, but gave a grateful glance instead to the corner in the ceiling where they sat chuckling at him. Grizel admired him at last, tra-la-la. What a dear girl she was! Into his manner there crept a certain masterfulness, and instead of resisting it, she beamed from Titum. If you want to spoil me, he said lazily, you will bring me that footstool to rest my heroic feet upon. She smiled and brought it. She even brought a cushion for his heroic head, adoring little thing that she was. He must be good to her. He was now looking forward eagerly to walking home with her. I can't tell you how delicious he meant to be. When she said she must go, he skipped upstairs for his hat, and wafted the gods at their kiss. But it was always the unexpected that lay in wait for Tommy. He and she were no sooner out of the house than Grizel said, I did not mention the glove as I was not sure whether Elspeth knew of it. He had turned stone cold. Corp and Gavinia told me, she went on quietly, before I had time to stop them. Of course, I should have preferred not to know until I heard it from yourself. Oh, how cold he was. But as I do know, I want to tell you that it makes me very happy. 
They had stopped for his legs would carry him no farther. Get us out of this! Every bit of him was crying, but not one word could Tommy say. I knew you would want to have it again, Grizel said brightly, producing the little parcel from her pocket, so I brought it to you. The frozen man took it and held it passively in his hand. His gods had flown away. No, they were actually giving him another chance. What was this Grizel was saying? I have not looked at it, for to take it out of its wrapping would have been profanation. Corp told me she was a London girl, but I know nothing more, not even her name. You are not angry with me for speaking of her, are you? Surely I may wish you and her great happiness. He was saved. The breath came back quickly to him. He filled like a released ball. Had ever a heart better right to expand? Grizel, looking so bright and pleased, had snatched him from the slugs. Surely you'll be nice to your preserver, Tommy. You'll not be less grateful than a country boy. Ah, me, not even yet have we plumed his vanity, but we are told to do it now. He could not have believed it of himself, but in the midst of his rejoicings, he grew bitter, and for no better reason than that Grizel's face was bright. I am glad, he said quite stiffly, that it is such pleasant news to you. His tone surprised her, but she was in a humble mood and answered without being offended. It is sweet news to me. How could you think otherwise? So it was sweet to her to think that he was another. He who had been modestly flattering himself a few moments ago that he must take care not to go too far with this admiring little girl. Oh, woman, woman, how difficult it is to know you, and how often, when we think we know you at last, have we to begin again at the beginning. He had never asked an enduring love from her, but surely, after all that had passed between them, he had a right to expect a little more than this. Was it maidenly to bring the glove and hand it to him without a tremor? If she could do no more, she might at least have turned a little pale when Corp told her of it, and then have walked quietly away. Next day she could have referred to it with just the slightest break in her voice. But to come straight to him looking delighted? And after all, I am entitled to know first, Grizel said, for I am your oldest friend. Friend! He could not help repeating the word with bitter emphasis. For her sake, as it seemed to him now, he had flung himself into the black waters of the Drumley. He had worn her glove upon his heart. It had been the world to him. And she could stand there and call herself his friend. The cup was full. Tommy nodded his head sorrowfully three times. So be it, Grizel, he said huskily. So be it. Sentiment could now carry him where it willed. The reins were broken. I don't understand. Neither did he, but why should you? What is it to you, he cried wildly. Better not to understand, for it might give you five minutes pain, Grizel. A whole five minutes, and I should be sorry to give you that. What have I said? What have I done? Nothing, he answered her. Nothing. You have been most exemplary. You have not even got any entertainment out of it. The thing never struck you as possible. It was too ludicrous. He laughed harshly at the package, which was still in his hand. Poor little glove, he said, and she did not even take the trouble to look at you. You might have looked at it, Grizel. I have looked at it a great deal. It meant something to me once upon a time when I was a vain fool. Take it and look at it before you fling it away. It will make you laugh. Now she knew, and her arms rocked convulsively. Joy surged to her face and she drove it back. She looked at him steadfastly over the collar of her jacket. She looked long, as if trying to be suspicious of him for the last time. Ah, Grizel, you are saying goodbye to your best friend. As she looked at him thus, there was a mournfulness in her brave face that went to Tommy's heart and almost made a man of him. It was as if he knew that she was doomed. Grizel, he cried, don't look at me in that way. And he would have taken the package from her, but she pressed it to her heart. Don't come with me, she said, almost in a whisper, and went away. He did not go back to the house. He wandered into the country quite objectless when he was walking fastest seeing nothing when he stood still and stared. Elation and dread were his companions. What elation whispered he could not yet believe, no, he could not believe it. While he listened, he knew that he must be making up the words. 
By and by he found himself among the shadows of the den. If he had loved Grizel, he would have known that it was here she would come, to the sweet den where he and she had played as children, the spot where she had loved him first. She had always loved him, always, always. He did not know what figure it was by the cuttle well until he was quite close to her. She was kissing the glove passionately, and on her eyes lay little wells of gladness. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of Tommy and Grizel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry. Chapter Thirteen Little Wells of Gladness. It was dusk, and she had not seen him. In the silent den, he stood motionless within a few feet of her, so amazed to find that Grizel really loved him that for the moment self was blotted out of his mind. He remembered he was there only when he heard his heavy breathing, and then he tried to check it that he might steal away undiscovered. Diver's emotions fought for the possession of him. He was in the meeting of many waters, each capable of whirling him where it chose, but two only imperious, the one the fierce joy of being loved, the other an agonizing remorse. He would fain have stolen away to think this tremendous thing over, but it tossed him forward. Grizel, he said in a husky whisper, Grizel. She did not start. She was scarcely surprised to hear his voice. She had been talking to him, and he had answered. Had he not been there, she would still have heard him answer. She could not see him more clearly now than she had been seeing him through those little wells of gladness. Her love for him was the whole of her. He came to her with the opening and the shutting of her eyes. He was the wind that bit her and the sun that nourished her. He was the lowliest object by the cuttle well, and he was the wings on which her thoughts soared to eternity. He could never leave her while her mortal frame endured. When he whispered her name, she turned her swimming eyes to him, and a strange birth had come into her face. Her eyes said so openly they were his, and her mouth said it was his. Her whole being went out to him. In the radiance of her face could be read immortal designs. The maid kissing her farewell to innocence was there, and the reason why it must be, and the fate of the unborn. It was the first stirring for weal or woe of a movement that had not endured on earth, but must roll on, growing lusty on beauty, or dishonour till the crack of time. This birth, which comes to every woman at that hour, is God's gift to her in exchange for what he has taken away, and when he has given it, he stands back and watches the man. To this man she was a woman transformed. A new bloom upon her face entranced him. He knew what it meant. He was looking on the face of love at last, and it was love coming out, smiling from its hiding place, because it thought it had heard him call. The artist in him who had done this thing was entranced, as if he had written an immortal page. But the man was appalled. He knew that he had reached the critical moment in her life and his, and that if he took one step farther forward he could never again draw back. It would be comparatively easy to draw back now. To remain a free man he had but to tell her the truth, and he had a passionate desire to remain free. He heard the voice of his little gods screaming to him to draw back, but it could be done only at her expense, and it seemed to him that to tell this noble girl who was waiting for him that he did not need her, would be to spill forever the happiness with which she overflowed, and sap the pride that had been the marrow of her during her twenty years of life. Not thus would Grizel have argued in his place, but he could not change his nature, and it was sentimental Tommy in an agony of remorse for having brought dear Grizel to this path, who had to decide her future and his in the time you may take to walk up a garden path. Either her mistake must be righted now or kept hidden from her forever. He was a sentimentalist, but in that hard moment he was trying to be a man. He took her in his arms and kissed her reverently, knowing that after this there could be no drawing back. In that act he gave himself loyally to her as a husband. He knew he was not worthy of her, but he was determined to try to be a little less unworthy, and as he drew her to him a slight quiver went through her, so that for a second she seemed to be holding back. For a second only, and the quiver was the rustle of wings on which some part of the Grizel we have known so long was taking flight from her. 
Then she pressed close to him passionately, as if she grudged that pause. I love her more than ever, far more, but she is never again quite the Grizel we have known. He was not unhappy. In the near hereafter he might be as miserable as the damned. The little gods were waiting to catch him alone and terrify him. But for the time, having sacrificed himself, Tommy was aglow with the passion he had inspired. He so loved the thing he had created that, in his exaltation, he mistook it for her. He believed all he was saying. He looked at her long and adoringly, not as he thought because he adored her, but because it was thus that look should answer look. He pressed her wet eyes reverently because thus it was written in his delicious part. His heart throbbed with hers that they might beat in time. He did not love, but he was the perfect lover. He was the artist trying in a mad moment to be as well as to do. Love was their theme, but how to know what was said when, between lovers, it is only the loose change of conversation that gets into words. The important matters cannot wait to slow the messenger, while the tongue is being charged with them, a look, a twitch of the mouth, a movement of finger transmits the story, and the words arrive, like Blucher, when the engagement is over. With a sudden pretty gesture, ah, so like her mother's, she held the glove to his lips. It is sad because you have forgotten it. I have kissed it so often, Grizel, long before I thought I should ever kiss you. She pressed it to her innocent breast at that. And had he really done so? And which was the first time, and the second, and the third? Oh, dear glove, you know so much, and your partner lies at home in a drawer knowing nothing. Grizel felt sorry for the other glove. She whispered to Tommy as a terrible thing. I think I love this glove even more than I love you. Just a tiny bit more. She could not part with it. It told me before you did, she explained, begging him to give it back to her. If you knew what it was to me in those unhappy days, Grizel, I want it to tell me, she whispered. And did he really love her? Yes, she knew he did. But how could he? Oh, Grizel, how could I help it? He had to say it, for it was the best answer. But he said it with a sigh, for it sounded like a quotation. But how could she love him? I think her reply disappointed him. Because you wanted me to, she said, with shining eyes. It is probably the commonest reason why women love, and perhaps it is the best, but his vanity was wounded. He had expected to hear that he was possessed of an irresistible power. Not until I wanted you to? I think I always wanted you to want me to, she replied naively. But I would never have let myself love you, she continued very seriously, until I was sure you loved me. You could have helped it, Grizel. He drew a blank face. I did help it, she answered. I was always fighting the desire to love you. I can see that plainly, and I always won. I thought God had made a sort of compact with me that I should always be the kind of woman I wanted to be if I resisted the desire to love you until you loved me. But you always had the desire, he said eagerly. Always, but it never won. You see, even you did not know it. You thought I did not even like you. That was why you wanted to prevent corpses telling me about the glove, was it not? You thought it would pain me only. Do you remember what you said? It is to save you acute pain that I want to see corp first. All that seems so long ago to Tommy now. How could you think it would be a pain to me, she cried. You concealed your feelings so well, Grizel. Did I not, she said joyously. Oh, I wanted to be so careful, and I was careful. That is why I am so happy now. Her face was glowing. She was full of odd, delightful fancies tonight. She kissed her hand to the gloaming. No, not to the gloaming. To the little, hunted, anxious girl she had been. She is looking at us, she said. She is standing behind that tree, looking at us. She wanted so much to grow into a dear good woman that she often comes and looks at me eagerly. Sometimes her face is so fearful. I think she was a little alarmed when she heard you were coming back. She never liked me, Grizel. Hush, said Grizel in a low voice. She always liked you. She always thought you a wonder. But she would be distressed if she heard me telling you. She thought it would not be safe for you to know. I must tell him now, dearest, darlingest. She suddenly called out boldly to the little self she had been so quaintly fond of, because there was no other to love her. I must tell him everything now, for you are no longer your own. You are his. She has gone away rocking her arms, she said to Tommy. No, he replied, I can hear her. She is singing because you are so happy. 
She never knew how to sing. She has learned suddenly. Everybody can sing who has anything to sing about. And do you know what she said about your dear wet eyes, Grizel? She said they were just sweet. And do you know why she left us so suddenly? She ran home gleefully to stitch and dust and beat carpets and get baths ready and look after the affairs of everybody, which she is sure must be going to rack and ruin because she has been away for half an hour. At his words there sparkled in her face the fond delight with which a woman assures herself that the beloved one knows her little weaknesses, for she does not truly love unless she thirsts to have him understand the whole of her and to love her in spite of the foibles and for them. If he does not love you a little for the foibles, madam, God help you from the day of the wedding. But though Grizel was pleased, she was not to be cajoled. She wandered with him through the den, stopping at the lair and the queen's bower, and many other places where the little girl used to watch Tommy suspiciously, and she called half merrily, half plaintively, Are you there, you foolish girl? And are you wringing your hands over me? I believe you are jealous because I love him best. We have loved each other so long, she and I, she said apologetically to Tommy. Ah, she said impulsively, when he seemed to be hurt, don't you see it is because she doubts you that I am so sorry for the poor thing? Dearest darlingest, she called to the child she had been, don't think that you can come to me when he is away and whisper things against him to me. Do you think I will listen to your croakings, you poor wet-faced thing? You child, said Tommy, do you think me a child because I blow kisses to her? Do you like me to think you are one? he replied. I like you to call me child, she said, but not to think me one. Then I shall think you one, he said triumphantly. He was so perfect an instrument for love to play upon that he let it play on and on, and listened in a fever of delight. How could Grizel have doubted Tommy? The god of love himself would have sworn there were a score of arrows in him. He wanted to tell Elspeth and the others at once that he and Grizel were engaged. I am glad to remember that it was he who urged this, and Grizel who insisted on its being deferred. He even pretended to believe that Elspeth would exult in the news, but Grizel smiled at him for saying this to please her. She had never been a great friend of Elspeth's, they were so dissimilar, and she blamed herself for it now, and said she wanted to try to make Elspeth love her before they told her. Tommy begged her to let him tell his sister at once, but she remained obdurate, so anxious was she that her happiness when revealed should bring only happiness to others. There had not come to Gazelle yet the longing to be recognised as his by the world. This love was so beautiful and precious to her that there was an added joy in sharing the dear secret with him alone. It was a live thing that might escape if she let anyone but him look between the fingers that held it. The crowning glory of loving and being loved is that the pair make no real progress. However far they have advanced into the enchanted land during the day, they must start again from the frontier next morning. Last night they had dredged the lover's lexicon for superlatives and not even blushed. Today is that the heavens cracking or merely someone whispering dear? All this was very strange and wonderful to Grizel. She had never been so young in the days when she was a little girl. I can never be quite so happy again, she had said with a wistful smile on the night of nights. But early morn, the time of the day that loves maidens best, retold her the delicious secret as it kissed her on the eyes, and her first impulse was to hurry to Tommy. When joy or sorrow came to her now, her first impulse was to hurry with it to him. Was he still the same, quite the same? She, whom love had made a child of, asked it fearfully, as if to gaze upon him openly just at first might be blinding, and he pretended not to understand. The first, the same as what, Grizel? Are you still what I think you? Ah, Grizel, not at all what you think me. But you do? Coward, you're afraid to say the word. But I do. You don't ask whether I do? No. Why, is it because you are so sure of me? He nodded, and she said it was cruel of him. You don't mean that, Grizel. Don't I? She was delighted that he knew it. No, you mean that you like me to be sure of it. But I want to be sure of it myself. You are. That was why you asked me if I loved you. Had you not been sure of it, you would not have asked. How clever you are, she said gleefully, and caressed a button of his velvet coat. But you don't know what that means. It does not mean that I love you, not merely that. No, it means that you are glad I know you so well. It is an ecstasy to you, 
is it not, to feel that I know you so well? It is sweet, she said. She asked curiously, what did you do last night after you left me? I can't guess, though I dare say you can guess what I did. You put the glove under your pillow, Grizel. She had got the precious glove. However could you guess? It has often lain under my own. Oh, said Grizel, breathless. Could you not guess even that? I wanted to be sure. Did it do anything strange when you had it there? I used to hear its heart beating. Yes, exactly. But this is still more remarkable. I put it away at last in my sweetest drawer, and when I woke in the morning it was under my pillow again. You could never have guessed that. Easily, it often did the same thing with me. Storyteller. But what did you do when you went home? He could not have answered that exhaustively, even if he would, for his actions had been as contradictory as his emotions. He had feared even while he exulted, and exulted when plunged deep in fears. There had been quite a procession of Tommies all through the night. One of them had been a very miserable man, and the only thing he had been sure of was that he must be true to Grizel. But in so far as he did answer, he told the truth. I went for a stroll among the stars, he said. I don't know when I got to bed. I have found a way of reaching the stars. I have to say only, Grizel loves me, and I am there. Without me? I took you with me. What did we see? What did we do? You spoiled everything by thinking the stars were badly managed. You wanted to take the supreme control. They turned you out. And when we got back to Earth? Then I happened to catch sight of myself in a looking glass, and I was scared. I did not see how you could possibly love me. A terror came over me that, in the den, you must have mistaken me for someone else. It was a darkish night, you know. You are wanting me to say you are handsome. No, no, I am wanting you to say I am very, very handsome. To tell me you love me, Grizel, because I am beautiful. Perhaps, she replied, I love you because your book is beautiful. Then goodbye forever, he said sternly. Would not that please you? It would break my heart. But I thought all authors... It is the commonest mistake in the world. We are simple creatures, Grizel, and yearn to be loved for our face alone. But I do love the book, she said, when they became more serious, because it is part of you. Rather that, he told her, than that you should love me because I am part of it. But it is only a little part of me, Grizel, only the best part. It is Tommy on tiptoes. The other part, the part that does not deserve your love, is what needs it most. I am so glad, she said eagerly. I want to think you need me. How I need you. Yes, I think you do. I am sure you do, and it makes me so happy. Ah, he said, now I know why Grizel loves me. And perhaps he did know now. She loved to think that she was more to him than the new book, but was not always sure of it, and sometimes this saddened her, and again she decided that it was right and fitting. She would hasten to him to say that this saddened her, she would go just as impulsively to say that she thought it right. Her discoveries about herself were many. What is it today, he would say, smiling fondly at her. I see it is something dreadful by your face. It is something that struck me suddenly when I was thinking of you, and I don't know whether to be glad or sorry. Then be glad, you child. It is this. I used to think a good deal of myself. The people here thought me haughty. They said I had a proud walk. You still have it, he assured her. The vitality in her as she moved was ever a delicious thing to him to look upon. Yes, I feel I have, she admitted. But that is only because I am yours, and it used to be because I was nobody's. Do you expect my face to fall at that? No, but I thought so much of myself once, and now I am nobody at all. At first it distressed me, and then I was glad, for it makes you everything and me nothing. Yes, I am glad, but... I am just a little bit sorry that I should be so glad. Poor Grizel, said he. Poor Grizel, she echoed. You're not angry with me, are you, for being almost sorry for her? She used to be so different. Where is your independence, Grizel, I say to her, and she shakes her sorrowful head. The little girl I used to be need not look for me any more. If we were to meet in the den, she would not know me now. Ah, if only Tommy could have loved in this way. He would have done it if he could. If we could love by trying, no one would ever have been more loved than Grizel. Am I to be condemned because I cannot, he sometimes said to himself in terrible anguish, 
for though pretty thoughts came to him to say to her when she was with him, he suffered anguish for her when he was alone. He knew it was tragic that such love as hers should be given to him, but what more could he do than he was doing? End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of Tommy and Grizel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry. Chapter Fourteen. Elspeth. Ever since the beginning of the book, we have been neglecting Elspeth so pointedly that were she not the most forgiving creature, we would be afraid to face her now. You are not angry with us, are you, Elspeth? We have been sitting with you, talking with you, thinking of you between the chapters, and the only reason why you have so seldom got into them is that our pen insisted on running after your fascinating brother. That is the way to get around her. Tommy, it need not be said, never neglected her. The mere fact of his having an affair of his own at present is a sure sign that she is comfortable, for unless all were well with Elspeth, no venture could have lured him from her side. Now I am ready for you, he said to the world when Elspeth had been, figuratively speaking, put to sleep. But until she was nicely tucked up, the world had to wait. He was still as in his boyhood when he had to see her with a good book in her hand before he could set off on deeds of darkness. If this was but the story of a brother and sister, there were matter for it that would make the ladies want to kiss Tommy on the brow. That Dr. Gemmell disliked or at least distrusted him, Tommy knew before their acquaintance was an hour old. Yet that same evening he had said cordially to Elspeth, This young doctor has a strong face. She was evidently glad that Tommy had noticed it. Do you think him handsome? she inquired. Decidedly so, he replied, very handsomely, for it is an indiscreet question to ask of a plain man. There was nothing small about Tommy, was there? He spoke thus magnanimously because he had seen that the doctor liked Elspeth and that she liked him for liking her. Elspeth never spoke to him of such things, but he was aware that an extra pleasure in life came to her when she was admired. It gave her a little of the self-confidence she so woefully lacked. The woman in her was stirred. Take such presents as these to Elspeth and Tommy would let you cast stones at himself for the rest of the day and shake your hand warmly on parting. In London, Elspeth had always known quickly, almost at the first clash of eyes, whether Tommy's friends were attracted by her, but she had not known sooner than he. Those acquaintanceships had seldom ripened, but perhaps this was because, though he and she avoided talking of them, he was all the time taking such terrifying care of her. She was always little Elspeth to him, for whom he had done everything since the beginning of her, a frail little female counterpart of himself that would never have dared to grow up had he not always been there to show her the way, like a stronger plant in the same pot. It was even pathetic to him that Elspeth should have to become a woman while he was a man, and he set to undaunted to help her in this matter also. To be admired of men is a woman's right, and he knew it gratified Elspeth, therefore he brought them in to admire her. But beyond profound respect they could not presume to go, he was watching them so vigilantly. He had done everything for her so far, and it was evident that he was now ready to do the love-making also, or at least to sift it before it reached her. Elspeth saw this, and perhaps it annoyed her once or twice, though on the whole she was deeply touched. And the young gentlemen saw it also. They saw that he would not leave them alone with her for a moment, and that behind his cordial manner sat a Tommy who had his eye on them. Subjects suitable for conversation before Elspeth seemed in presence of this strict brother to be limited. You had just begun to tell her the plot of the new novel when T. Sandys fixed you with his gleaming orb. You were in the middle of the rumour about Mrs. Golightly when he let the poker fall. If the newsboys were yelling their latest horror, he quickly closed the window. He made all visitors self-conscious. If she was not in the room, few of them dared to ask if she was quite well. They paled before expressing the hope that she would feel stronger tomorrow. Yet, when Tommy went up to sit beside her, which was the moment the front door closed, he took care to mention incidentally that they had been inquiring after her. One of them ventured on her birthday to bring her flowers, 
but could not present them, Tommy looked so alarming. A still more daring spirit once went the length of addressing her by her Christian name. She did not start up haughtily. The most timid of women are a surprise at times, but the poker fell with a crash. He knew Elspeth so well that he could tell exactly how these poor young men should approach her. As an artist as well as a brother, he frowned when they blundered. He would have liked to be the medium through which they talked so that he could give looks and words their proper force. He had thought it all out so thoroughly for Elspeth's benefit that in an hour he could have drawn out a complete guide for her admirers. At the first meeting, look at her wistfully when she does not see you. She will see you. It might have been the first rule. Rule two, don't talk so glibly. How often that was what the poker meant. Being herself a timid creature, Elspeth showed best among the timid, because her sympathetic heart immediately desired to put them at their ease. The more glibly they could talk, the less she knew were they impressed by her. Even a little boorishness was more complimentary than chatter. Sometimes when she played on the piano which Tommy had hired for her, the visitor was so shy that he could not even mutter thank you to his hat. Yet she might play to him again, and not to the gallant who remarked briskly, How very charming! What is that called? To talk disparagingly of other women is so common a way among men of penetrating into the favour of one that, of course, some tried it with Elspeth. Tommy could not excuse such blundering, for they were making her despise them. He got them out of the house and then he and she had a long talk, not about them, but about men and women in general, from which she gathered once again that there was nobody like Tommy. When they bade each other good night, she would say to him, I think you are the one perfect gentleman in the world. Or he might say, You expect so much of men, Elspeth. To which her reply, You have taught me to do it, and now I expect others to be like you. Sometimes she would even say, When I see you so fond of me and taking such care of me, I am ashamed. You think me so much better than I am. You consider me so pure and good, while I know that I am often mean and even have wicked thoughts. It makes me ashamed, but so proud of you, for I see that you are judging me by yourself. And then this, Tommy would put the gas out softly and go to his own room and, let us hope, blush a little. One stripling had proposed to Elspeth, and on her agitatedly declining him, had flung out of the room in a pet. It spoiled all her afterthoughts on the subject and so roused her brother's indignation with the fellow. If the great baby had only left all the arrangements to Tommy, he could so easily have made that final scene one which Elspeth would remember with gratification for the remainder of her days. For, of course, pride in the offer could not be great unless she retained her respect for the man who made it. From the tremulous proposal and the manly acceptance of his fate to his dignified exit, don't grieve for me, Miss Sandys. You never gave me the least encouragement, and to have loved you will always make me a better man even to a touching way of closing the door with one long last lingering look. Tommy could have fitted him like a tailor. From all which it will be seen that our splendid brother thought exclusively of what was best for Elspeth, and was willing that the gentlemen, having served their purpose, should, if it pleased them, go hang. Also, though he thought out every other possible move for the suitor, it never struck him to compose a successful proposal for the simple reason that he was quite certain Elspeth would have none of them. Their attentions pleased her, but exchange Tommy for one of them? Never. He knew it from her confessions at all stages of her life. He had felt it from the days when he began to be father and mother to her as well as brother. In his heart he believed there was something of his own odd character in Elspeth, which made her as incapable of loving as himself, and some of his devotion to her was due to this belief for perhaps nothing touches us to the quick more than the feeling that another suffers under our own curse. Certainly nothing draws two souls so close together in a lonely comradeship. But though Tommy had reflected about these things, he did not trouble Elspeth with his conclusions. He merely gave her to understand that he loved her, and she loved him so much that neither of them had any love to give to another. It was very beautiful, Elspeth thought, and a little tragic. You are quite sure that you mean that, she might ask timidly, and that you are not flinging away your life on me. You are all that I need, he answered cheerily, and he believed it. Or if he was in another mood, he might reflect that perhaps he was abstaining from love for Elspeth's sake, and that made him cheery also. 
and now David Gemmell was the man, and Tommy genially forgave him all else for liking Elspeth. He invited the doctor, who so obviously distrusted him, to drop in of an evening for a game at the Dambrod, which they both abominated, but it was an easy excuse. He asked him confidently to come in and see Aaron, who had been coughing last night. He put on all the airs of a hail fellow well met, though they never became him, and sat awkwardly on his face. David always seemed eager to come, and tried to rise above his suspicions of Tommy, as Tommy saw, and failed, as Tommy saw again. Elspeth dosed the doctor with stories of her brother's lovely qualities, and Tommy, the forgiving, honestly pitied the poor man for having to listen to them. He knew that if all went well, Gemmell would presently propose, and find that Elspeth, tearful at having to strike a blow, could not accept him. But he did not look forward maliciously to this as his revenge on the doctor. He was thinking merely of what was good for Elspeth. There was no open talk about David between the brother and sister. Some day, Tommy presumed she would announce that the doctor had asked her to marry him, and oh, how sorry she was, and oh, what a good man he was, and oh, Tommy knew she had never encouraged him, and oh, she could never leave Tommy. But until that day arrived, they avoided talking directly about what brought Gemmell there. That he came to see Elspeth, neither of them seemed to conceive as possible. Did Tommy chuckle when he saw David's eyes following her? No. Solemn as a cat, blinking at the fire. Noticed nothing. The most worldly chaperone, the most loving mother, could not have done more for Elspeth. Yet it was not done to find her a husband, but quite the reverse, as we have seen. On reflection, Tommy must smile at what he has been doing, but not while he is working the figures. The artist never smiles at himself until afterwards. And now he not only wondered at times how Elspeth and David were getting on, but whether she noticed how he was getting on with Grizel. For in matters relating to Tommy, Elspeth was almost as sharp as he in matters that related to her, and he knew it. When he proposed to Elspeth that they should ask Gemmell to go fishing with them on the morrow, he has been overworked of late, and it would do him good. He wanted to add in a careless voice, we might invite Grizel also but could not. His lips suddenly went dry, and when Elspeth said the words that were so difficult to him, he wondered, did she say that because she knew I wished it? But he decided that she did not, for she was evidently looking forward to tomorrow, and he knew she would be shuddering if she thought that her Tommy was slipping. I am so glad that it was she who asked me, Grizel said to him when he told her. Don't you see what it means? It means that she wants to get you out of the way. You are not everything to her now as you used to be. Are you glad? Glad? If I could believe it, Tommy said. What else could make her want to be alone with him? Nothing else could have made Grizel want to be alone with him, and she must always judge others by herself. But Tommy knew that Elspeth was different, and that a girl with some of himself in her might want to be alone with a man who admired her without wanting to marry him. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of Tommy and Grizel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry. Chapter Fifteen by Pros and Water. That day by the banks of Pros and Water was one of Grizel's beautiful memories. All the days, when she thought he loved her, became beautiful memories. It was the time of reds and whites, for the glory of the broom had passed, except at great heights, and the wild roses were trooping in. When the broom is in flame, there seems to be no colour but yellow, but when the wild roses come, we remember that the broom was flaunting. It was not quite a lady, for it insisted on being looked at, while these light-hearted things are too innocent to know that there is anyone to look. Grizel was sitting by the side of the stream, adorning her hat fantastically, with roses red and white, and some that were neither. They were those that cannot decide whether they look best in white or red, and so waver, for the whole of their little lives between the two colours. There are many of them, and it is the pathetic thing about wild roses. She did not pay much heed to her handiwork. What she was saying to herself was that in another minute, 
he and she would be alone. Nothing else in the world mattered very much. Every bit of her was conscious of it as the supreme event. Her fingers pressed it upon the flowers. It was in her eyes as much as in her heart. He went on casting his line, moving from stone to stone, dropping down the bank, ascending it, as if the hooking of a trout were something to him. Was he feeling to his marrow that as soon as those other two figures rounded the bend in the stream he and she would have the world to themselves? Ah, uh, of course he felt it. But was it quite as much to him as it was to her? Not quite so much, she said bravely to herself. I don't want it to be quite so much, but nearly. And now they were alone, as no two can be except for those who love. For when the third person leaves them, they have a universe to themselves, and it is closed in by the heavens, and the air of it is the consciousness of each other's presence. She sat motionless now, trembling, exulting. She could no longer hear the talking of the water, but she heard his step. He was coming slowly towards her. She did not look up. She waited, and while she waited, time was annihilated. He was coming to her to treat her as if she were a fond child. That she, of all women, could permit it was still delicious to him, and a marvel. She had let him do it yesterday, but... Perhaps she had regained her independence in the night. As he hesitated, he became another person. In a flood of feeling, he had a fierce desire to tell her the truth about himself. But he did not know what it was. He put aside his rod and sat down very miserably beside her. Grizel, I suppose I am a knave. His lips parted to say it, but no words came. She had given him an adorable look that stopped them as if her dear hand had been placed upon his mouth. Was he a knave? He wanted honestly to know. He had not tried to make her love him. Had he known in time, he would even have warned her against it. He would never have said he loved her had she not first, as she thought, found it out. To tell her the truth then would have been brutal. He had made believe in order that she might remain happy. Was it even make believe? Assuredly he did love her, in his own way in the only way he was capable of. She was far more to him than any other person except Elspeth. He delighted in her, and would have fought till he dropped rather than let any human being injure her. All his feelings for her were pure. He was prepared to marry her. But if she had not made that mistake, oh, what a delight it would have been to him never to marry anyone. He felt keenly miserable. Grizel, I seem to be different from all other men. There seems to be some curse upon me that makes me unable to love as they do. I want to love you, dear one. You are the only woman I ever wanted to love, but apparently I can't. I have decided to go on with this thing because it seems best for you. But is it? I would tell you all and leave the decision to you were it not that I fear you would think I wanted you to let me off. It would have been an honest speech, and he might have said it had he begun at once, for it was in a passion to be out, so desirous was he that dear Grizel should not be deceived. But he tried its effect first upon himself, and as he went on, the tragedy he saw mastered him. He forgot that she was there except as a figure needed to complete the picture of the man who could not love. He saw himself a splendidly haggard creature with burning eyes, standing aside while all the world rolled by in the pursuit of the one thing needful. It was a river, and he must stand parched on the bank forever and ever. Should he keep that sorrowful figure a man or turn it into a woman? He tried a woman. She was on the bank now, her arms outstretched to the flood. Ah, she would be so glad to drink, though she must drown. Grizel saw how mournful he had become as he gazed upon her. In his face she had been seeing all the glories that can be given to mortals. Thoughts had come to her that drew her nearer to her God, her trust in him stretched to eternity. All that was given to her at that moment she thought was also given to him. She seemed to know why, with love lighting up their souls to each other, he could yet grow mournful. Oh, she cried with a movement that was the passionate caress, do you indeed love me so much as that? I never wanted you to love me quite so much as that. It brought him back to himself, but without a start. Those sudden returns to fact had ceased to bewilder him. They were grown so common that he passed between dreams and reality as through tissue paper. I did not mean, she said at last in a tremor, that I wanted you to love me less. 
but I am almost sorry that you love me quite so much. He dared say nothing, for he did not altogether understand. I have those fears too sometimes, she went on. I have had them when I was with you, but more often when I was alone. They come to me suddenly, and I have such eager longings to run to you and tell you of them, and ask you to drive them away. But I never did it. I kept them to myself. You could keep something back from me, Grizel? Forgive me, she implored. I thought they would distress you, and I have such a desire to bring you nothing but happiness. To bear them by myself seemed to be helping you, and I was glad. I was proud to feel myself of use to you, even to that little extent. I did not know you had the same fears. I thought that perhaps they came only to women. Have you had them before? Fears, she continued so wistfully, that it is too beautiful to end happily. Oh, have you heard a voice crying, it is too beautiful, it can never be? He saw clearly now, he saw so clearly that he was torn with emotion. It is more than I can bear, he said hoarsely. Surely he loved her. Did you see me die? she asked in a whisper. I have seen you die. Don't, Grizel, he cried. But she had to go on. Tell me, she begged. I have told you. No, no, never that, he answered her. At the worst I have had only the feeling that you could never be mine. She smiled at that. I am yours, she said softly. Nothing can take away that. Nothing, nothing. I say it to myself a hundred times a day. It is so sweet. Nothing can separate us but death. I have thought of all the other possible things, and none of them is strong enough. But when I think of your dying, oh, when I think of myself being left without you... She rocked her arms in a frenzy and called him dearest, darlingest. All the sweet names that had been the child Grizel's and the old doctor's were Tommy's now. He soothed her, ah, uh, surely, as only a lover could soothe. She was his Grizel, she was his beloved, no mortal could have been more impassioned than Tommy. He must have loved her. It could not have been merely sympathy, or an exquisite delight in being the man, or the desire to make her happy again in the quickest way, or all three combined. Whatever it was, he did not know. All he knew was that he felt every word he said, or seemed to feel it. It is a punishment to me, Grizel said, setting her teeth, for loving you too much. I know I love you too much. I think I love you more than God. She felt him shudder. But if I feel it, she said, shuddering also, yet unable to deceive herself, what difference do I make by saying it? He must know it is so, whether I say it or not. There was a tremendous difference to Tommy, but not of a kind he could explain, and she went on. She must tell him everything now. I pray every night and morning, but that is nothing. Everyone does it. I know I thank God sincerely. I thank him again and again and again. Do you remember how when I was a child you used to be horrified because I prayed standing? I often say little prayers standing now. I am always thanking him for giving me you. But all the time it is a bargain with him. So long as you are well, I love him. But if you were to die, I would never pray again. I have never said it in words until today, but he must know it, for it is behind all my prayers. If he does not know, there cannot be a God. She was watching his face, half woefully, half stubbornly, as if whatever might be the issue of those words she had to say them. She saw how pained he was to admit the possible non-existence of a God when you can so easily leave the subject alone was horrible to Tommy. I don't doubt him, she continued. I have believed in him ever since the time when I was such a lonely child that I did not know his name. I shall always believe in him so long as he does not take you from me. But if he does, then I shall not believe in him any more. It may be wrong, but that is what I feel. It makes you care less for me, she cried in anguish. No, no, dear. I don't think it makes God care less for me, she said very seriously. I think he is pleased that I don't try to cheat him. Somehow Tommy felt uncomfortable at that. There are people, he said vaguely, like one who thought it best to mention no names, who would be afraid to challenge God in that way. He would not be worth believing in, she answered, if he could be revengeful. He is too strong and too loving and too pitiful for that. But she took hold of Tommy as if to protect him. 
Had they been in physical danger, her first impulse would have been to get in front of him to protect him. The noblest women probably always love in this way, and yet it is those who would hide behind them that men seem to love the best. I always feel, oh, I never can help feeling, she said, that nothing could happen to you, that God himself could not take you from me while I had hold of you. Grizel! I mean only that he could not have the heart, she said hastily. No, I don't, she had to add. I meant what you thought I meant. That is why I feel it would be so sweet to be married, so that I could be close to you every moment and then no harm could come to you. I would keep such a grip of you. I should be such a part of you that you could not die without my dying also. Oh, do you care less for me now, she cried. I can't see things as clearly as you do, dearest, darlingest. I have not a beautiful nature like yours. I am naturally rebellious. I have to struggle even to be as good as I am. There are evil things in my blood. You remember how we found out that. God knew it, too, and he is compassionate. I think he makes many pitying allowances for me. It is not wicked, is it, to think that? You used to know me too well, Grizel, to speak of my beautiful nature, he said humbly. I did think you vain, she replied. How odd to remember that. But I was, and am. I love to hear you proving you are not, she said, beaming upon him. Do you think, she asked, with a sudden change of manner to the childish, like one trying to coax a compliment out of him, that I have improved at all during those last days? I think I am not quite such a horrid girl as I used to be, and if I am not, I owe it to you. I am so glad to owe it to you, she told him, that she was trying to make herself a tiny bit more like him by studying his book. It is not exactly the things you say of women that help me, for though they are lovely, I am not sure that they are quite true. I almost hope they are not true, for if they are, then I am not even an average woman. She buried her face in his coat. You say women are naturally purer than men, but I don't know. Perhaps we are more cunning only. Perhaps it is not even a thing to wish. For if we were, it would mean that we are good because there is less evil in us to fight against. Dear, forgive me for saying that. It may be all wrong, but I think it is what nearly all women feel in their hearts, though they keep it locked up till they die. I don't even want you to believe me. You think otherwise of us, and it is so sweet of you that we try to be better than we are. To undeceive you would hurt so. It is not the book that makes me a better woman. It is the man I see behind it. He was too much moved to be able to reply, too much humbled. He vowed to himself that, whether he could love or not, he would be a good husband to this dear woman. Ah, Grizel, he declared by and by, what a delicious book you are, and how I wish I had written you. With every word you say, something within me is shouting, Am I not a wonder? I warned you it would be so as soon as I felt that I had done anything really big, and I have. I have somehow made you love me. Ladies and gentlemen, he exclaimed, addressing the river and the trees and the roses, I have somehow made her love me. Am I not a wonder? Grizel clapped her hands gaily. She was merry again. She could always be what Tommy wanted her to be. Ladies and gentlemen, she cried, how could I help it? David had been coming back for his fly-book, and though he did not hear their words, he saw a light in Grizel's face that suddenly set him thinking. For the rest of the day he paid little attention to Elspeth. Some of his answers showed her that he was not even listening to her. End of chapter 15「Chapter sixteen of Tommy and Grizel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beyond Utopia, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry. Chapter sixteen. How could you hurt your Grizel so? To concentrate on Elspeth so that he might find out what was in her mind was, as we have seen, seldom necessary to Tommy. 
for he had learned her by heart long ago yet a time was now come when he had to concentrate and even then he was doubtful of the result so often he had put that mind of hers to rights that it was an open box to him or had been until he conceived the odd notion that perhaps it contained a secret drawer this would have been resented by most brothers but tommy's chagrin was nothing compared to the exhilaration with which he perceived that he might be about to discover something new about the woman he was like the digger whose hand is on the point of closing on a diamond a certain holiness added what puzzled him was the state of affairs now existing between elspeth and the doctor a week had elapsed since the fishing excursion and david had not visited them too busy tommy knew that it is the busy people who can find time could it be that david had proposed to her at the waterside no he could not read that in elspeth's face he knew that she would be in distress lest her refusal should darken the doctor's life for too long a time but yet shake your fist at him ladies for so misunderstanding you he expected also to note in that sympathetic face a look of subdued triumph as it was not there david could not have proposed the fact of her not having told him about it at once did not prove to tommy that there had been no proposal his feeling was that she would consider it too sacred a thing to tell even to him but that it would force its way out in a week or two on the other hand she could not have resisted dropping shyly such remarks as i think dr jamel is a noble man or how wonderfully good dr jamel is to the poor <laughs> also she would sometimes have given tommy a glance that said i wonder if you guess had they quarrelled tommy smiled if it was but a quarrel he was not merely appeased he was pleased had he had the ordering of the affair he would certainly have included a lover's quarrel in it and had it not been that he had wanted to give her the pleasure of finding these things out for herself he would have taken her aside and addressed her thus no need to look tragic elspeth for to a woman this must really be one of the most charming moments in the comedy you feel that he would not have quarrelled had he had any real caring for you and yet in your heart you know it is a proof that he has to a woman i who know assure you that nothing can be more delicious your feeling for him as you and I well know, is but a sentiment of attraction because he loves you as you are unable to love him, and, as you are so pained by this quarrel, think yourself unhappy just now when you are really in the middle of one of the pleasantest bits of it. Love is a series of thrills, the one leading to the other, and, as your careful guardian, i would not have you miss one of them you will come to the final bang quickly enough and find it the finest thrill of all but it is soon over when you have had to tell him that you are not for him there are left only the pleasures of memory and the more of them there were the more there will be to look back to i beg you elspeth not to hurry loiter rather smelling the flowers and plucking them for you may never be this way again all these things he might have pointed out to elspeth had he wanted her to look at the matter rationally but he had no such wish he wanted her to enjoy herself as the blessed do without knowing why no pity for the man you see but no ill will to him david was having his thrills also and though the last of them would seem a staggerer to him at the time it would gradually become a sunny memory 
the only tragedy is to not have known love so long as you have the experiences it does not greatly matter whether your suit was a failure or successful so tommy decided but he feared at the same time that there had been no quarrel that david had simply drawn back how he saw through elspeth's brave attempts to show that she had never for a moment thought of david's having any feeling for her save ordinary friendship yes they were brave but not brave enough for tommy at times she would say something bitter about life not about the doctor for he was never mentioned and it was painful to her brother to see gentle elspeth grown cynical he suffered even more when her manner indicated that she knew she was too poor a creature to be loved by any man tommy was in great woe about elspeth at this time he was thinking much more about her than about grizel but don't blame him unreservedly for that the two women who were his dears were pulling at him different ways and he could not accompany both he had made up his mind to be loyal to grizel and so all his pity could go to elspeth on the day he had his talk with the doctor therefore he had as it were put grizel aside only because she was happy just now and so had not elspeth need of him the doctor and he had met on the hill whence the few who look may see one of the fairest views in scotland tommy was strolling up and down and the few other persons on the hill were glancing with good-humoured suspicion at him as we all look at celebrated characters had he been happy he would have known they were watching him and perhaps had put his hands behind his back to give them more for their money as the saying is but he was miserable his one consolation was that the blow he must strike elspeth when he told her of his engagement need not be struck just yet david could not have chosen a worse moment therefore for saying so bluntly what he said i hear you are to be married if so i should like to congratulate you tommy winced like one charged with open cruelty to his sister charged with it too by the real criminal is it not true david asked quietly and tommy turned from him glaring i am sorry i spoke of it as it is not true the doctor said after a pause the crow's feet showing round his eyes as always when he was in mental pain and presently he went away after giving tommy a contemptuous look did tommy deserve that look we must remember that he had wanted to make the engagement public at once if he shrank from admitting it for the present it was because of elspeth's plight grizel you might have given her a little time to recover from this man's faithlessness was what his heart cried he believed that grizel had told david and for the last time in his life he was angry with her he strode down to the hill savagely toward Kadam wood where he knew he should find her soon he saw her she was on one of the many tiny paths that lead the stranger into the middle of the wood and then leave him there maliciously or because they dare not venture any farther themselves they could play no tricks on grizel however for she knew and was fond of them all tommy had said she loved them because they were such little paths that they appealed to her like babies and perhaps there was something in it she came up the path with the swing of one who was gleefully happy some of the thrums people you remember said that grizel strutted because she was so satisfied with herself and if you like an ugly word we may say that she strutted to-day it was her whole being giving utterance to the joy within her that love had brought as grizel came up the path on that bright afternoon she could no more have helped strutting 
than the bud to open on the appointed day. She was obeying one of nature's laws, I think promised long ago to tell you of the day when Grizel would strut no more. Well, this is the day. Observe her strutting for the last time. It was very strange and touching to her to remember in the after years that she had once strutted. But it was still more strange and touching to Tommy. She was like one overfilled with delight when she saw him. How could she know that he was to strike her? He did not speak. She was not displeased. When anything so tremendous happened as the meeting of these two, how could they find words at once? She bent and pressed her lips to his sleeve, but he drew away with a gesture that startled her. "'You are not angry,' she said, stopping. "'Yes,' he replied doggedly. "'Not with me.' Her hand went up to her heart. "'With me?' A wounded animal could not have uttered a cry more pathetic. "'Not with me!' she clutched his arm. "'Have I no cause to be angry?' he said. She looked at him in bewilderment. "'Could this be he?' "'Oh, could it be she? "'Cause! "'How could I give you cause?' "'It seemed unanswerable to her. "'How could Grizel do anything "'that would give him the right to be angry with her? "'Oh, men, men, you will never understand "'how absolutely all of her a woman's love can be. "'If she gives you everything, how can she give you more? "'She is not another person.' She is part of you. Does one finger of your hand plot against another? He told her sullenly of his scene with the doctor. I am very sorry, she said, but her eyes were still searching for the reason why Tommy could be angry with her. You made me promise to tell no one, he said, and I have kept my promise, but you... The anguish that was Grizel's then. You can't think that I told him, she cried, and she held out her arms as if to remind him of who she was. You can believe that of your Grizel. I dare say you have not done it wittingly, but this man has guessed, and he could never have guessed it from look or word of mine it must have been i she said slowly tell me she cried like a suppliant how have i done it your manner your face he answered it must have been that i don't blame you grizel but yes it must have been that and it is hard on me he was in misery, and these words leaped out. They meant only that it was hard on him if Elspeth had to be told of his engagement in the hour of her dejection. He did not mean to hurt Grizel to the quick. However terrible the loss of his freedom might be to the man who could not love, he always intended to be true to her. But she gave the words a deeper meaning. She stood so still she seemed to be pondering, and at last she said quietly, as if they had been discussing some problem outside themselves, Yes, I think it must have been that. She looked long at him. It is very hard on you, she said. I feel sure it was that, she went on, and now her figure was erect, and again it broke, and sometimes there was a noble scorn in her voice, but more often there was only pitiful humility. I feel sure it was that, for I have often wondered how everybody did not know. I have broken my promise. I used always to be able to keep a promise. I had every other fault. I was hard and proud and intolerant, but I was true. 
I think I was vain of that, though I see now it was only something I could not help. From the moment when I had a difficulty in keeping a promise, I ceased to keep it. I love you so much that I carry my love in my face for all to read. They cannot see me meet you without knowing the truth. They cannot hear me say your name, but I betray myself. I show how I love you in every movement. I am full of you. How can anyone look at me and not see you? I should have been more careful. Oh, I could have been so much more careful had I loved you a little less. It is very hard on you. The note of satire had died out of her voice. Her every look and gesture carried in it nothing but love for him. But all the unhappy dog could say was something about self-respect. Her mouth opened as if for bitterness, but no sound came. How much self-respect do you think is left for me after today? She said mournfully at last. And then she quickly took a step nearer her dear one, as if to caress the spot where these words had been struck. But she stopped, and for a moment she was the Grizel of old. Have no fear, she said with a trembling, crooked smile. There is only one thing to be done now, and I shall do it. All the blame is mine. You shall not be deprived of your self-respect. He had not been asking for his freedom, but he heard it running to him now, and he knew that if he answered nothing, he would be whistling it back forever. A madness to be free at any cost swept over him. He let go his hold on self-respect and clapped his hand on freedom. He answered nothing, and the one thing for her to do was to go, and she did it but it was only for a moment that she could be altogether the Grizel of old. She turned to take a long, last look at him, but the woefulness of herself was what she was. She cried with infinite pathos, Oh, how could you hurt your Grizel so? He controlled himself and let her go. His freedom was fawning on him, licking his hands and face, and in that madness he actually let Grizel go. It was not until she was out of sight that he gave utterance to a harsh laugh. He knew what he was at that moment, as you and I shall never be able to know him, eavesdrop how we may. He flung himself down in a blueberry bed and lay there doggedly, his weak mouth tightly closed. A great silence reigned. No, not a great silence, for he continued to hear the cry. Oh, how could you hurt your Grizel so? She scarcely knew that she had said it, but to him, who knew what she had been and what he had changed her into, and for what alone she was to blame, there was an unconscious pathos in it that was terrible. It was the epitome of all that was Grizel, all that was adorable, and all that was pitiful in her. It rang in his mind like a bell of doom. He believed its echo would not be quite gone from his ears when he died. If all the wise men in the world had met to consider how Grizel could most effectively say farewell to Tommy, they could not have thought out a better sentence. However completely he had put himself emotionally in her place with the same object, he would have been inspired by nothing quite so good. But they were love's dying words. He knew he could never again, though he tried, be to, to Grizel what he had been. The water was spilled on the ground. She had thought him all that was glorious in man. That was what her love had meant, and it was spilled. 
there was only one way in which he could wound her more cruelly than she was already hurt and that was by daring to ask her to love him still to imply that he thought her pride so broken her independence her maidenly modesty all that made up the loveliness of a girl so lost that by entreaties he could persuade her to forgive him would destroy her altogether it would reveal to her how low he thought her capable of falling i suppose we should all like to think that it would have been thus with grizel but our wishes are of small account it was not many minutes since she left tommy to be his no more his knife still in her heart but she had not reached the end of the wood when all in front of her seemed a world of goblins and a future without him was not to be faced he might beat her or scorn her but not for an hour could she exist without him she wrung her arms in woe the horror of what she was doing tore her in pieces but not all this prevented her turning back it could not even make her go slowly she did not walk back she stole back in little runs she knew it was her destruction but her arms were outstretched to the spot where she had left him he was no longer there and he saw her between the firs before she could see him as he realized what her coming back meant his frame shook with pity for her all the dignity had gone from her she looked as shamed as a dog stealing back after it had been whipped she knew she was shamed he saw she knew it the despairing rocking of her arms proved it yet she was coming back to him in little runs pity chivalry oh surely love itself lifted him to his feet and all else passed out of him save an imperious desire to save her as much humiliation as he could to give her back a few of those garments of pride and self-respect that had fallen from her at least she should not think that she had to come all the way to him with a stifled sob he rose up and ran up the path towards her grizel it is you my beloved how could you leave me oh grizel my love how could you misunderstand me so she gave a glad cry she sought feebly to hold him at arm's length to look at him watchfully to read him as in the old days but the old days were gone he strained her to him oh surely it was love at last he thanked god that he had loved at last end of chapter 16、Chapter、17 Chapter-seventeen-of-Tommy-and-Grizel. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry, Chapter Seventeen. How Tommy saved the flag. He loved at last, but had no time to exult just now, for he could not rejoice with Tommy while his dear one drooped in shame. Ah, so well he understood that she believed she had done the unpardonable thing in woman. And that while she thought so, she must remain a broken column. It was a great task he saw before him, nothing less than to make her think that what she had done was not shameful but exquisite, 
that she had not tarnished the flag of love, but glorified it. Artfulness, you will see, was needed. But, remember, he was now using all his arts in behalf of the woman he loved. You are so long in coming back to me, Grizel. The agony of it. Did it seem long? She spoke in a trembling voice, hiding her face in him. She listened like one anxious to seize his answer as it left his heart. So long, he answered, that it seemed to me that we must be old when we met again. I saw a future without you, stretching before me to the grave, and I turned and ran from it. That is how I felt, she whispered. You? Tommy cried in excellent amazement. What else could have made me come? I thought it was pity that had brought you. Pity for me, Grizel. I thought you had perhaps come back to be angry with me. How could I be? she cried. How could you help it, rather? said he. I was cruel. Grizel, I spoke like a fool, as well as like a dastard. But it was only anxiety for Elspeth that made me do it. Dear one, be angry with me as often as you choose, and whether I deserve it or not, but don't go away from me. Never send me from you again, anything but that. It was how she had felt again, and her hold on him tightened with sudden joy. So well he knew what that grip meant. He did not tell her that he had not loved her fully until now. He would have liked to tell her how true love had been born in him as he saw her stealing back to him, but it was surely best for her not to know that any transformation had been needed. I don't say that I love you now more than ever before, he said carefully. But one thing I do know, that I never admired you quite so much. She looked up in surprise. I mean your character, he said determinedly. I have always known how strong and noble it was, but I never quite thought you could be anything so beautiful as this. Beautiful? She could only echo the word. Many women, even of the best, he told her, would have resorted to little feminine ways of humbling such a blunderer as I have been. They would have spurned him for weeks, made him come to them on his knees, perhaps have thought that his brutality of a moment outweighed all his love. When I saw you coming to meet me halfway, oh, Grizel, tell me that you are doing that. Yes, 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 she answered eagerly, so that she may not detain him a moment. When I saw you, I realized that you were willing to forgive me, that you were coming to say so, that no thought of lowering me first was in your mind, that yours was a love above the littleness of ordinary people, and the adorableness of it filled me with a glorious joy. I saw in that moment what woman in her highest development is capable of, and that the noblest is the most womanly. She said, Womanly? with a little cry. It had always been such a sweet word to her, and she thought it could never be hers again. It is by watching you, he replied, that I know the meaning of the word. I thought I knew long ago, but every day you give it a nobler meaning. If she could have believed it. For a second or two, she tried to believe it, and then she shook her head. How dear of you to think that of me, she answered. She looked up at him with exquisite approval in her eyes. She had always felt that men should have high ideas about women. But it was not to save you pain that I came back, she said bravely. There was something pathetic in the way that the truth had always to come out of her. 
I did not think you wanted me to come back. I never expected you to be looking for me, and when I saw you doing it, my heart nearly stopped for gladness. I thought you were wearied of me, and would be annoyed when you saw me coming back. I said to myself, if I go back, I shall be a disgrace to womanhood. But I came, and now do you know what my heart is saying, and will always be saying? It is that pride and honor and self-respect are gone. And the terrible thing is that I don't seem to care. I, who used to value them so much, are willing to let them go if you don't send me away from you. Oh, if you can't love me any longer, let me still love you. That is what I came back to say. Grizel! Grizel! he cried. It was she who was wielding the knife now. But it is true, she said. We could so easily pretend that it isn't. That was not what he said, though it was at his heart. He sat down, saying, This is a terrible blow. But better you should tell it to me than leave me to find out. He was determined to save the flag for Grizel, though he had to try all the Tommy ways, one by one. Have I hurt you? She asked anxiously. She could not bear to hurt him for a moment. What did I say? It amounts to this, he replied huskily. You love me, but you wish you did not. That is what it means. He expected her to be appalled by this, but she stood still thinking it over. There was something pitiful in a Grizel grown undecided. Do I wish I did not? She said helplessly. I don't know. Perhaps that is what I do wish. Ah, but what are wishes? I know now that they don't matter at all. Yes, they matter, he assured her, in the voice of one looking upon death. If you no longer want to love me, you will cease to do it soon enough. His manner changed to bitterness. So don't be cast down, Grizel, for the day of your deliverance is at hand. But again she disappointed him, and as the flag must be saved at whatever cost, he said, It has come already. I see you no longer love me as you did. Her arms rose in anguish but he went on ruthlessly. You will never persuade me that you do, and I shall never believe it again. I suppose it was a pitiable thing about Grizel. It was something he had discovered weeks ago and marveled over, that nothing distressed her so much as the implication that she could love him less. She knew that she could not, but that he should think it possible was the strangest woe to her. It seemed to her to be love's only tragedy. We have seen how difficult it was for Grizel to cry. When she said, How could you hurt your Grizel so? She had not cried, nor when she knew if she went back to him, her self-respect must remain behind. But a painful tear came to her eyes when he said that she loved him less. It almost unmanned him, but he proceeded for her good. I dare say you still care for me a little, as the rank and file of people love. What right had I, of all people, to expect a love so rare and beautiful as yours to last? It had to burn out like a great fire, as such love always does. The experience of the world has proved it. Oh, she said, and her body was rocking. If he did not stop, she would weep herself to death. Yes, it seems sad, Tommy continued, but if ever man knew that it served him right, I know it. And they maintain the wiseacres who have analyzed love, that there is much to be said in favor of a calm affection. 
the glory has gone but the material comforts are greater and in the end she sank upon the ground he was bleeding for her was tommy he went on his knees beside her and it was terrible to him to feel that every part of her was alive with anguish he called her many sweet names and she listened for them between her sobs but still she sobbed he could bear it no longer he cried he called upon god to smite him she did not look up but her poor hands pulled him back you said i do not love you the same she moaned grizel he answered as if in sad reproof it was not i who said that it was you i put into words only what you have been telling me for the last ten minutes no no she cried oh how could i he flung up his arms in despair is this only pity for me grizel he implored looking into her face as if to learn his fate or is it love indeed you know it is love you know but what kind of love he demanded fiercely is it the same love that it was quick tell me i can't have less if it is but a little less you will kill me the first gleam of sunshine swept across her face and oh how he was looking for it do you want it to be the same do you really want it oh it is it is and you would not cease to love me if you could no 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 she would have come closer to him but he held her back one moment grizel he said in a hard voice that filled her with apprehension there must be no second mistake in saying that love and love alone brought you back you are admitting are you not that you are talking wildly about loss of pride and honour you did the loveliest thing you have ever done when you came back if i were you my character would be ruined from this hour i should feel so proud of myself she smiled at that and fondled his hand if you think so she said all is well but he would not leave it thus you must think so also he insisted and when she still shook her head then i am proud of your love no longer he said doggedly how proud of it i have been a man cannot love a woman without reverencing her without being touched to the quick a score of times a day by the revelations she gives of herself revelations of such beauty and purity that she is abashed in her presence the unspoken prayers he offers up to god at those times he gives her to carry and when such a one returns his love he is proud indeed to me you are the embodiment that is of all that is fair in woman and it is love that has made you so that has taken away your little imperfections love for me ah grizel i was so proud to think that somehow i had done it but even now in the moment when your love has manifested itself most splendidly you are ashamed of it and what i respect and reverence you for most are changes that have come about against your will if your love makes you sorrowful how can i be proud of it henceforth it will be my greatest curse she started up wringing her hands it was something to have got to her feet surely he said like one puzzled as well as pained by her obtuseness you see clearly that it must be so true love as i conceive it must be something passing all knowledge irresistible something not to be resented for its power but worshipped for it something not to fight against 
but to glory in, and such is your love. But you give the proof of it with shame, because your ideal of love is a humdrum sort of affection. That is all you would like to feel, Grizel, and because you feel something deeper and nobler, you say you have lost your self-respect. I am the man who has taken it from you. Can I ever be proud of your love again? He paused, overcome with emotion. What it has been to me, he cried. I walked among my fellows as if I were a colossus. It inspired me at my work. I felt that there was nothing great I was not capable of, all because Grizel loved me. She stood trembling with delight at what he said, and with apprehension at what he seemed to threaten. His head being bent, he could not see her, and amid his grief he wondered a little what she was doing now. But you spoke. She said it timidly, as if to refer to the matter at all was cruel of her. You spoke as if I was disgracing you because I could not conceal my love. You said it was hard on you. She pressed her hands together. Yes, that is what you said. This was awkward for Tommy. She believes I meant that, he cried hoarsely. Grizel believes that of me. I have behaved since then as if that was what I meant, have I? I meant only that it would be hard on me if Elspeth learned of our love at the very moment when this man is treating her basely. I look as if I had meant something worse, do I? I know myself at last. Grizel has shown me what I am. He covered his face with his hands. Strong man as he was, he could not conceal his agony. Don't, she cried. If I was wrong, if you were wrong, I was wrong. I know I was wrong. Somehow it was a mistake. I don't know how it arose, but you love me, and you want me to love you still. That is all I know. I thought you did not, but you do. If you wanted me to come back, if I wanted it, I know you wanted it now, and I am no longer ashamed to have come. I am glad I came, and if you can still be proud of my love and respect me, O oh, Grizel, if, then I have got my pride and my self-respect again. I cannot reason about it, but they have come back again. It was she who was trying to comfort him by this time, caressing his hair and his hands. But he would not be appeased at once. It was good for her to have something to do. You are sure you are happy again, Grizel? You are not pretending in order to please me? So happy. But your eyes are still wet. That is because I have hurt you so. Oh, how happy I should be if I could see you smile again. How would I smile if I saw you looking happy? Then smile at once, sir, she could say presently, for see how happy I am looking. And as she beamed on him once more, he smiled as well as he was able to. Grizel loved him so much that she actually knew when that face of his was smiling, and soon she was saying gaily to his eyes, Oh, silly eyes that won't sparkle, what is the use of you? And she pressed her own upon them, and to his mouth she said, Mouth that does not know how to laugh, poor, tragic mouth. He let her do nearly all the talking. She sat there crooning over him as if he were her child. 
and so the flag was saved he begged her to let him tell their little world of his love for her and especially was he eager to go straight with it to the doctor but she would not have this david and elspeth shall know in good time she said very nobly i am sure they are fond of each other and they shall know of our happiness on the day when they tell us of their own and until that great day came she was not to look upon herself as engaged to tommy and he must never kiss her again until they were engaged i think it was a pleasure to her to insist on this it was her punishment to herself for ever having doubted tommy End of chapter 17chapter 18 of tommy and grizel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by beyond utopia tulsa oklahoma tommy and grizel by j m barry chapter 18 the girl she had been as they sat amid the smell of rosin on that summer day she told him with a glance that said now you will laugh at me what had brought her into caddam wood i came to rub something out he reflected a memory yes of me she nodded an unhappy memory not to me she replied leaning on him I have no memory of you I would rub out. No, not the unhappiest one, for it was you, and that makes it dear. All memories, however sad of loved ones, become sweet, don't they, when we get far enough away from them. But to whom, then, is this memory painful, Grizel? Again she cast that glance at him. To her, she whispered, that little girl yes the child i used to be you see she never grew up and so they are not distant memories to her i try to rub them out of her mind by giving her prettier things to think of i go to the places where she was most unhappy and tell her sweet things about you i am not morbid am i in thinking of her still as someone apart from myself you know how it began in the lonely days when i used to look at her in mamma's mirror and pity her and fancy that she was pitying me and entreating me to be careful always when i think i see her now she seems to be looking anxiously at me and saying oh do be careful and the sweet things i tell her about you are meant to show her how careful i have become are you laughing at me for this i sometimes laugh at myself no it is delicious he answered her speaking more lightly than he felt what a numbskull you make grizel of any man who presumes to write about women i am at school again and you are miss ailie teaching me the alphabet but i thought you lost that serious little girl on that doleful day when she heard you say that you loved me best she came back she has no one but me and she still warns you against me grizel laughed gleefully i am too clever for her she said i do all the talking i allow her to listen only and you must not blame her for distrusting you i have said such things against you to her oh the things i said on the first day i saw you for instance after you came back to thrums it was in church do you remember i should like to know what you said to her about me that day would you grizel asked merrily well let me see 
she was not at church she never went there you remember but of course she was curious to hear about you and i had no sooner got home than she came to me and said was he here yes i said is he much changed she asked he has a beard i said you know that is not really what i mean she said and then i said i don't think he is so much changed that he is impossible to recognize him again tommy interrupted her now what did you mean by that i meant that i thought you were a little annoyed to find the congregation looking at gavinia's baby more than at you grizel you are a wretch but perhaps you were right well what more did the little inquisitor want to know she asked me if i felt any of my old fear of you and i said no and then she clapped her hands with joy then she asked whether you looked at me as if you were begging me to say i still thought you a wonder and i said i thought you did grizel oh i told her ever so many dreadful things as soon as i found them out i told her the whole story of your ankle sir for instance on my word grizel you seem to have omitted nothing ah but i did she cried i never told her how much i wanted you to be admirable i pretended that i despised you merely and in reality i was wringing my hands with woe every time you did not behave like a god they will be worn away grizel if you go on doing that i don't think so she replied nor can she think so if she believes half of what i have told about you since she knows how you saved the boy's life i told her that in the old lair because she had some harsh memories of you there and it was at the cuttle well that i told her about the glove and where asked tommy severely did you tell her that you had been mistaken in thinking me jealous of a baby and anxious to be considered a wonder she hid her face for a moment then she looked up roguishly into his i have not told her that yet she replied it was so audacious of her that he took her by the ears if i were vain tommy said reflectively i would certainly shake you now you show a painful want of tact grizel in implying that i am not perfect nothing annoys men so much we can stand anything except that his merriness gladdened her they are only little things she said and i have grown to love them i know they are flaws but i love them because say because they are mine you owe me that no because they are weaknesses i don't have i have others but not those and it is sweet to me to know that you are weak in some matters in which i am strong it makes me feel that i can be of some use to you are you insinuating that there are more of them tommy demanded sitting up you are not very practical she responded and i am go on and you are just a little inclined to be sent to hush i don't allow that word but you may say if you choose that i am sometimes carried away by a too generous impulse and that it will be my part said she to seize you by the arm and hold you back oh you will give me a great deal to do that is one of the things i love you for it was one of the things i loved my dear mr mcqueen for she looked up suddenly i have told him also about you lately grizel yes in my parlour it was his parlour you know 
and i had kept nothing from him while he was alive that is to say he always knew what i was thinking of and i like to fancy that he knows still in the evenings he used to sit in the armchair by the fire and i sat talking or knitting at his feet and if i ceased to do anything except sit still looking straight before me he knew i was thinking the morbid thoughts that had troubled me in the old days at double dykes without knowing it i sometimes shuddered at those times and he was distressed it reminded me of my mamma i understand tommy said hurriedly he meant let us avoid painful subjects it is years she went on since those thoughts have troubled me and it was he who drove them away he was so kind he thought so much of my future that i still sit by his armchair and tell him what is happening to his grizel i don't speak aloud of course i scarcely say the words to myself even and yet we seem to have long talks together i told him i had given you his coat well i don't think he was pleased at that grizel i have had a feeling for some time that the coat dislikes me it scratched my hand the first time i put it on my hand caught in the hook of the collar you will say but no that is not what i think in my opinion the deed was maliciously done mcqueen always distrusted me you know and i expect his coat was saying hands off my grizel she took it as quite a jest he does not distrust you now she said smiling i have told him what i think of you and though he was surprised at first in the end his opinion was the same as mine ah you saw to that grizel i had nothing to do with it i merely told him everything and he had to agree with me how could he doubt when he saw that you had made me so happy even mamma does not doubt you have told her all oh, this is rather eerie grizel you are not sorry are you she asked looking at him anxiously dr mcqueen wanted me to forget her he thought that would be best for me it was the only matter on which we differed i gave up speaking of her to him you are the only person i have mentioned to her since i became a woman but i often think of her i am sure there was a time before i was old enough to understand when she was very fond of me i was her baby and women can't help being fond of their babies even though they should never have had them i think she often hugged me tight need we speak of this grizel for this once she entreated you must remember that mamma often looked at me with hatred and said i was the cause of all her woe but sometimes in her last months she would give me such sad looks that i trembled and i felt that she was picturing me growing into the kind of woman she wished so much she had not become herself and that she longed to save me that is why i have told her that a good man loves me she is so glad my poor dear mamma that i tell her again and again and she loves to hear it as much as i to tell it what she loves to hear most is that you really do want to marry me she is so fond of hearing that because it is what my father would never say to her tommy was so much moved that he could not speak but in his heart he gave thanks that what grizel said of him to her mamma was true at last it makes her so happy grizel said that when i seem 
to see her now she looks as sweet and pure as she must have been in the days when she was an innocent girl i think she can enter into my feelings more than any other person ever could do is that because she was my mother she understands how i feel just as i can understand how in the end she was willing to be bad because he wanted it so much no no grizel tommy cried passionately you do don't understand that she rocked her arms yes i do she said i do i could never have cared for such a man but i can understand how mamma yielded to him and i have no feeling for her except pity and i have told her so and it is what she loves to hear her daughter tell her best of all they put the subject from them and she told him what it was that she had come to rub out in Caddam. if you have read of tommy's boyhood you may remember the day it ended with his departure for the farm and that he and elspeth walked through Caddam to the cart that was to take him from her and how to comfort her he swore that he loved her with his whole heart and grizel not at all and that grizel was in the wood and heard and how elspeth had promised to wave to tommy in the cart as long as it was visible but broke down and went home sobbing and how grizel took her place and waved pretending to be elspeth so that he might think she was bearing up bravely tommy had not known what grizel did for him that day and when he heard it now for the first time from her own lips he realized afresh what a glorious girl she was and had always been you may try to rub that memory out of little grizel's head he declared looking very proudly at her but you shall never rub it out of mine it was by his wish that they went together to the spot where she had heard him say that he loved elspeth only if you can find it tommy said after all these years and she smiled at his mannish words she had found it so often since there was the very clump of when and here was the boy to match oh who by striving could make himself a boy again as tommy could i tell you he was always irresistible then what is genius it is the power to be a boy again at will when i think of him flinging off the years and whistling childhood back not to himself only but to all who heard distributing it among them gaily imperiously calling on them to dance dance for they are boys and girls again until they stop when to recall him in those wild moods is to myself to grasp for a moment at the dear dead days that were so much the best i cannot wonder that grizel loved him i am his slave myself i see that all that was wrong with tommy was that he could not always be a boy hide there again grizel he cried to her little tommy cried to her stroke the jacobite her captain cried to the lady griselda and he disappeared and presently marched down the path with an imaginary elspeth by his side i love you both elspeth he was going to say and my love for the one does not make me love the other less but he glanced at grizel and she was leaning forward to catch his words as if this were no play but life or death and he knew what she longed to hear him say 
and he said it. I love you very much, Elspeth, but however much I love you, it would be idle to pretend that I don't love Grizel more. A stifled cry of joy came from the clump of wind hard by, and they were man and woman again. Did you not know it, Grizel? No, no, you never told me. I never dreamed it was necessary to tell you. Oh, if you knew how I have longed that it might be so, yes, and sometimes I hated Elspeth, because I feared it could not be. I have tried so hard to be content with second place. I have thought it all out, and said to myself it was natural that Elspeth should be first. Oh, my tragic love, he said. I can see you arguing in that way, but I don't see you convincing yourself. My passionate Grizel is not the girl to accept second place from anyone. If I know anything of her, I know that. To his surprise, she answered softly, You are wrong. I wonder at it myself. But I had made up my mind to be content with second place, and to be grateful for it. I could not have believed it, he cried. I could not have believed it myself, said she. Are you the Grizel? he began. No, she said. I have changed a little. And she looked pathetically at him. It stabs me, he said, to see you so humble. I am humbler than I was, she answered huskily, but she was looking at him with the fondest love. Don't look at me so, Grizel, he implored. I am unworthy of it. I am the man who has made you so humble. Yes, she answered, and she still looked at him with the fondest love. A film came over his eyes, and she touched them softly with her handkerchief. Those eyes that but a little while ago were looking so coldly at you, he said. Dear eyes, said she, though I were to strike you, he cried, raising his hand. She took the hand in hers and kissed it. Has it come to this? he said, and as she could not speak, she nodded. He fell upon his knees before her. I am glad you are a little sorry, she said. I am a little sorry myself. End of chapter 18「Chapter nineteen of Tommy and Grizel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tommy and Grizel by J. M. Barry. Chapter nineteen of the Change in Thomas. To find ways of making David propose to Elspeth, of making Elspeth willing to exchange her brother for David, they were heavy tasks, but Tommy yoked himself to them gallantly, and tugged like an Arab steed in the plough. It should be almost as pleasant to us as to him to think that love was what made him do it, for he was sure he loved Grizel at last, and that the one longing of his heart was to marry her. The one marvel to him was that he had ever longed ardently for anything else. Well, as you know, she longed for it also, but she was firm in her resolve that until Elspeth was engaged, Tommy should be a single man. She even made him promise not to kiss her again so long as their love had to be kept secret. 
it will be so sweet to wait she said bravely as we shall see presently his efforts to put elspeth into the hands of david were apparently of no avail but though this would have embittered many men it drew only to the surface some of tommy's noblest attributes as he suffered in silence he became gentler more considerate and acquired a new command over himself to conquer self for her sake this is in the letters to a young man is the highest tribute a man can pay to a woman it is the only real greatness and tommy had done it now i could give you a score of proofs let us take his treatment of aaron lotta one day about this time tommy found himself alone in the house with aaron and had he been the old tommy he would have waited but a moment to let aaron decide which of them should go elsewhere it was thus that these two ever so uncomfortable in each other's presence contrived to keep the peace now note the change aaron said tommy in the hush that had fallen on that house since quiet elspeth left it i have never thanked you in words for all that you have done for me and elspeth dinna do it now then replied the warper fidgeting i must tommy said cheerily i must and he did while aaron scowled it was never done for you aaron informed him nor for the father you are the marrows of it was done for my mother said tommy reverently i'm none so sure aunt aaron rapped out i think i brought you twa here has bairns that the reminder of my shame should ever stand before me but tommy shook his head and sat down sympathetically beside the warper you loved her aaron he said simply it was an undying love that made you adopt her orphan children a charming thought came to him when you brought us here he said with some elation elspeth used to cry at nights because our mother's spirit did not come to us to comfort us and i invented boyish explanations to appease her but i have learned since why we did not see that spirit for though it hovered round this house its first thought was not for us but for him who succoured us he could have made it much better had he been able to revise it but surely it was touching and aaron need not have said damn which was what he did say one knows how most men would have received so harsh an answer to such gentle words and we can conceive how a very holy man say a monk would have bowed to it even as the monk did tommy submit or say rather with the meekness of a nun i wish i could help you in any way aaron he said with a sigh you can replied aaron promptly by taking yourself off to london and leaving elspeth here with me i never made pretence that i wanted you except because she wouldn't a come without you laddie and man as weel you can you were i a scunner to me and yet said tommy looking at him admiringly you fed and housed and educated us ah aaron do you not see that your dislike gives me the more reason only to esteem you carried away by desire to help the old man he put his hand kindly on his shoulder you have never respected yourself he said since the night you and my mother parted at the cuddle well and my heart bleeds to think of it many a year ago by your kindness to two forlorn children you expiated that sin and it is blotted out from your account forget it aaron as every other person has forgotten it and let the spirit of jean miles see you tranquil once again he patted aaron affectionately he seemed to be the older of the two tack your hand off my shother aaron cried fiercely tommy removed his hand but he continued to look yearningly at the warper another beautiful thought came to him what are you looking so holy about asked aaron with misgivings 
aaron cried tommy suddenly inspired you are not always the gloomy man you pass for being you have glorious moments still you wake in the morning and for a second of time you are in the heyday of your youth and you and jean miles are to walk out to-night as you sit by this fire you think you hear her hand on the latch of the door as you pass down the street you seem to see her coming towards you it is for a moment only and then you are a grey-haired man again and she has been in her grave for many a year but you have that moment aaron rose amazed and wrathful the devil take you he cried how did you find out that perhaps tommy's nose turned up rapturously in reply for the best of us cannot command ourselves altogether at great moments but when he spoke he was modest again it was sympathy that told me he explained and aaron if you will only believe me it tells me also that a little of the man you were still clings to you come out of the moroseness in which you have enveloped yourself so long think what a joy it would be to elspeth it's little she would care if you want to hurt her tell her so i'm no denying but what she's fell fond o me then for her sake tommy pleaded but the warper turned on him with baleful eyes she likes me he said in a grating voice and yet i'm as nothing to her we are all as nothing to her beside you if there hadn't been you i should a become the father to her i craved to be but you had mesmerized her she had eyes for none but you i sent you to the herding meaning to break your power over her and all she could think o oh, was my cruelty in cindering you sign you ran aff with her to london stealing her frae me i was without her while she was growing frae lassie to woman the years when maybe she could hae made o me what she willed magerful tam took the mother frae me and he lived again in you to tack the doctor you really think me masterful me tommy said smiling i suppose you never were aaron replied ironically yes tommy admitted frankly i was masterful as a boy ah and even quite lately how we change he said musingly how we dinna change retorted aaron bitterly he had learned the truer philosophy man he continued looking tommy over there's times when i see mair or your mother than your father in you she was a wonder at making believe the letters about her grandeur that she wrote to thrums when she was starving even you couldna hae wrote them better but she never managed to cheat her cell that's war you sail away frae her i used to make believe aaron as you say tommy replied sadly if you knew how i feel the folly of it now perhaps even you would wish that i felt it less but we must each of us dree his own weird he proceeded with wonderful sweetness when aaron did not answer and so far at least as elspeth is concerned surely i have done my duty i had the bringing up of her from the days when she was learning to speak she got into the way o' letting you do everything for her the warper responded sourly you thought for her you acted for her fray the first you tombed her and then filled her up wi your cell she always needed some one to lean on ay because you had maimed her she grew up in the notion that you were all the earth and the wonder o oh, the world could i help that help it did you try it was the one thing you were sure o oh, yoursel it was the one thing you thought worth anybody's learning you stood before her crowing the whole day i said the now i wished you would go and leave her with me but i wouldna dare to keep her she's helpless without you if you took your arm o oh, wa frae her now she would tumble to the ground i fear it is true aaron tommy said with bent head whether she is so by nature or whether i have made her so i cannot tell but i fear that what you say is true it's true said aaron and yours is the white 
there's no life for her now except what you mac she canna see beyond you go on thinkin yoursel a wonder if you like but mind this if you were to cast her off fray you now she would die like an amputated hand to tommy it was like listening to his doom ah aaron even you could not withhold your pity did you know how this man is being punished now for having made elspeth so dependent on him some such thought passed through tommy's head but he was too brave to appeal for pity if that is so he said firmly i take the responsibility for it but i began this talk ere not to intrude my troubles on you but hoping to lighten yours if i could see you smile aaron drop it cried the warper and then going closer to him you would hae seen me smile ay and heard me laugh gin you had been here when mrs mclean came yont to read your book to me she fair insisted on reading the terrible noble bits to me and she grat they were so sublime but the sublimer they were the mare i laugh for i ken you tommy my man i ken you he spoke with much vehemence and after all our hero was not perfect he withdrew stiffly to the other room i think it was the use of the word tommy that enraged him but in a very few minutes he scorned himself and was possessed by a pensive wonder that one so tragically fated as he could resent an old man's gibe aaron misunderstood him was that any reason why he should not feel sorry for aaron he crossed the hallan to the kitchen door and stopped there overcome with pity the warper was still crouching by the fire but his head rested on his chest he was a weary desolate figure and at the other side of the hearth stood an empty chair the picture was the epitome of his life or so it seemed to the sympathetic soul at the door who saw him passing from youth to old age staring at the chair that must always be empty at the same moment tommy saw his own future and in it too an empty chair yet hard as was his own case at least he knew that he was loved if her chair must be empty the fault was as little hers as his while aaron a noble compassion drew him forward and he put his hand determinedly on the dear old man's shoulder aaron he said in a tremble of pity i know what is the real sorrow of your life and i rejoice because i can put an end to it you think that jean miles never cared for you but you are strangely wrong i was with my mother to the last aaron and i can tell you she asked me with her dying breath to say to you that she loved you all the time aaron tried to rise but was pushed back into his chair love cannot die cried tommy triumphantly like the fairy in the pantomime love is always young he stopped in mid-career at sight of aaron's disappointing face are you done the warper inquired when you and me are alane in this house there's no room for the both o us and as i'll never hae it said that i made jean miles's bairn munt i'll go out my cell and out he went and sat on the dyke till elspeth came home it did not turn tommy sulky he nodded kindly to aaron from the window in token of forgiveness and next day he spent a valuable hour in making a cushion for the old man's chair he must be left with the impression that you made it tommy explained to elspeth for he would not take it from me oh tommy how good you are i am far from it elspeth there is a serenity about you nowadays she said that i don't seem to have noticed before and indeed this was true it was the serenity that comes to those who having a mortal wound can no more be troubled by the pin-pricks there has been nothing to cause it has there elspeth asked timidly only the feeling that i have much to be grateful for he replied i have you elspeth and i have you she said and i want no more i could never care for any one as i care for you tommy 
she was speaking unselfishly she meant to imply delicately that the doctor's defection need not make tommy think her unhappy are you glad she asked he said yes bravely elspeth he was determined should never have the distress of knowing that for her sake he was giving up the one great joy which life contains he was a grander character than most men have often in the world's history made a splendid sacrifice for women but if you turn up the annals you will find that the woman nearly always knew of it he told grizel what aaron had said and what elspeth had said he could keep nothing from her now he was done with the world of make-believe for ever and it seemed wicked of him to hope he declared or to let her hope i ought to give you up grizel he said with a groan i won't let you she replied adorably jemel has not come near us for a week i ask him in but he avoids the house i don't understand it grizel had to admit but i think he is fond of her i do indeed even if that were so i fear she would not accept him i know elspeth so well that i feel i am deceiving you if i say there is any hope nevertheless you must say it she answered brightly you must say it and leave me to think it and i do think it i believe that elspeth despite her timidity and her dependence on you is like other girls at heart and not more difficult to win and even if it all comes to nothing she told him a little faintly i shall not be unhappy you don't really know me if you think i should love to be married so so much as all that it is you grizel he replied who don't see that it is myself i am pitying it is i who want to be married as much as all that her eyes shone with a soft light for of course it was what she wanted him to say these two seemed to have changed places that people could love each other and there the end had been his fond philosophy and her torment now it was she who argued for it and tommy who shook his head they can be very very happy no he said but one of them is not the other he insisted and of course it was again what she wanted him to say and he was not always despairing he tried hard to find a way of bringing david to elspeth's feet and once at least the apparently reluctant suitor almost succumbed tommy had met him near aaron's house and invited him to come in and hear elspeth singing i did not know she sang david said hesitating she is so shy about it tommy replied lightly that we can hear her by stealth only aaron and i listen at the door come and listen at the door and david had yielded and listened at the door and afterwards gone in and remained like one who could not tear himself away what was more he and elspeth had touched upon the subject of love in their conversation tommy sitting at the window so engrossed in a letter to pym that he seemed to hear nothing though he could repeat everything afterwards to grizel elspeth had said in her shrinking way that if she were a man she could love only a woman who was strong and courageous and helpful such a woman as grizel she had said and yet david replied women have been loved who had none of those qualities in spite of the want of them elspeth asked perhaps because of it said he they are noble qualities elspeth maintained a little sadly and he assented and one of them at least is essential she said a woman has no right to be loved who is not helpful she is helpful to the man who loves her david replied he would have to do for her elspeth said the very things she should be doing for him he may want very much to do them said david then it is her weakness that appeals to him is not that loving her for the wrong thing it may be the right thing david insisted for him and at that point tommy said boyishly to grizel i ceased to hear them i was so elated 
i felt that everything was coming right i could not give another thought to their future i was so busy mapping out my own i heard a hammering do you know what it was it was our house going up your house and mine our home grizel it was not here nor in london it was near the thames i wanted it to be upon the bank but you said no you were afraid of floods i wanted to superintend the building but you conducted me contemptuously to my desk you intimated that i did not know how to build that no one knew except yourself you instructed the architect and bullied the workmen and cried for more store closets grizel i saw the house go up i saw you the adoration and terror of your servants i heard you singing from room to room he was touched by this all beautiful thoughts touched him but as a rule though tommy tried to be brave for her sake it was usually she who was the comforter now and he the comforted and this was the arrangement that suited grizel best her one thought need no longer be that she loved him too much but how much he loved her it was not her self-respect that must be humoured back but his if hers lagged what did it matter what are her own troubles to a woman when there is something to do for the man she loves you are too anxious about the future she said to him if he had grown gloomy again can we not be happy in the present and leave the future to take care of itself how strange to know that it was grizel who said this to tommy and not tommy who said it to grizel she delighted in playing the mother to him now you must go back to your desk she would say masterfully you have three hours work to do to-night yet it can wait let me stay a little longer with you grizel he answered humbly ha ah, it was tommy who was humble now not so long ago he would not have allowed his work to wait for any one and grizel knew it and exulted to work sir she ordered and you must put on your old coat before you sit down to write and pull up your cuffs so that they don't scrape on the desk also you must not think too much about me she tried to look business-like but she could scarce resist rocking her arms with delight when she heard herself saying such things to him it was as if she had the old doctor once more in her hands what more grizel i like you to order me about only this good afternoon but i am to walk home with you he entreated no she said decisively but she smiled once upon a time it had been she who asked for this if you are good she said you shall perhaps see me to-morrow perhaps only he was scared but she smiled happily again it had once been she who had to beg that there should be no perhaps if you are good she replied and you are not good when you have such a long face smile you silly boy smile when i order you if you don't i shall not so much as look out at my window to-morrow he was the man who had caused her so much agony and she was looking at him with the eternally forgiving smile of the mother ah grizel tommy cried passionately how brave and unselfish and noble you are and what a glorious wife god intended you to be she broke from him with a little cry but when she turned round again it was to nod and smile to him End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of tommy and grizel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org tommy and grizel by j m barry chapter twenty a love letter some beautiful days followed so beautiful to grizel that as they passed away she kissed her hand to them do you see her standing on tiptoe to see the last of them they lit a fire in the chamber of her soul which is the home of all pure maids and the faggots that warmed grizel were every fond look that had been on her lover's face and every sweet word he had let fall 
she counted and fondled them and pretended that one was lost that she might hug it more than all the others when it was found to sit by that fire was almost better than having the days that lit it sometimes she could scarcely wait for the day to go tommy's fond looks and sweet words there was also a letter in those days and now that i remember a little garnet ring and there were a few other faggots but all so trifling it must seem incredible to you that they could have made so great a blaze nothing else in it on my honour except a girl's heart added by herself that the fire might burn a moment longer and now what's so chilly as the fire that has gone out gone out long ago dear grizel while you crouched over it you may put your hand in the ashes they will not burn you now ah grizel why do you sit there in the cold the day of the letter it began in dread but ended so joyfully do you think grizel grudged the dread it became dear to her she loved to return to it and gaze at the joy it glorified as one sees the sunshine from a murky room when she heard the postman's knock she was not even curious so few letters came to her she thought this must be maggie ann's monthly one from aberdeen and went on placidly dusting at last she lifted it from the floor for it had been slipped beneath the door and then grizel was standing in her little lobby panting as if at the end of a race the letter lay in both her hands and they rose slowly until they were pressed against her breast she uttered some faint cries it was the only moment in which i have known grizel to be hysterical and then she ran to her room and locked herself in herself and it do you know why that look of elation had come suddenly to her face it was because he had not even written the address in a disguised hand to deceive the postmistress so much of the old grizel was gone that the pathos of her elation over this was lost to her several times she almost opened it why did she pause why had that frightened look come into her eyes she put the letter on her table and drew away from it if she took a step nearer her hands went behind her back as if saying grizel don't ask us to open it we are afraid perhaps it really did say the dear things that love writes perhaps it was aghast at the way she was treating it dear letter her mouth smiled to it but her hands remained afraid as she stood irresolute smiling and afraid she was a little like her mother i have put off as long as possible saying that grizel was ever like her mother the painted lady had never got any letters while she was in thrums but she looked wistfully at those of other people they are so pretty she had said but don't open them when you open them they break your heart grizel remembered what her mother had said had the old grizel feared what might be inside it would have made her open the letter more quickly two minds to one person were unendurable to her but she seemed to be a coward now it was pitiable perhaps it was quite a common little letter beginning dear grizel and saying nothing more delicious or more terrible than that he wanted her to lend him one of the doctor's books she thought of a score of trivialities it might be about but the letter was still unopened when david jamel called to talk over some cases in which he required her counsel he found her sitting listlessly something in her lap which she at once concealed she failed to follow his arguments and he went away puckering his brows some of the old doctor's sayings about her ringing loud in his ears one of them was things will be far wrong with grizel when she is able to sit idle with her hands in her lap another she is almost pitifully straightforward man everything that is in grizel must doubt she can hide nothing yet how cunningly she had concealed what was in her hands cunning applied to grizel david shuddered he thought of tommy and shut his mouth tight 
he could do this easily tommy could not do it without feeling breathless they were types of two kinds of men david also remembered a promise he had given mcqueen and wondered as he had wondered a good deal of late whether the time had come to keep it but grizel sat on with her unopened letter she was to meet tommy presently on the croquet lawn of the dovecot when ailey was to play mr james the champion and she decided that she must wait till then she would know what sort of letter it was the moment she saw his face and then she pressed her hands together oh how base of her to doubt him she said it to herself then and often afterwards she looked mournfully in her mother's long mirror at this disloyal grizel as if the capacity to doubt him was the saddest of all the changes that had come to her he had been so true yesterday oh how could she tremble to-day beautiful yesterday but yesterday may seem so long ago how little a time had passed between the moment when she was greeting him joyously in caddam wood and that cry of the heart how could you hurt your grizel so no she could not open her letter she could kiss it but she could not open it foolish fears for before she had shaken hands with tommy in mrs mclean's garden she knew he loved her still and that the letter proved it she was properly punished yet surely in excess for when she might have been reading her first love letter she had to join in discussions with various ladies about berlin wool and the like and to applaud the prowess of mr james with the loathly croquet mallet it seemed quite a long time before tommy could get a private word with her then he began about the letter at once you are not angry with me for writing it he asked anxiously i should not have done it i had no right but such a desire to do it came over me i had to it was such a glory to me to say in writing what you are to me she smiled happily oh exquisite day i have so long wanted to have a letter from you she said i have almost wished you would go away for a little time so that i might have a letter from you he had guessed this he had written to give her delight did you like the first words of it grizel he asked eagerly the lover and the artist spoke together could she admit that the letter was unopened and why oh the pain to him she nodded assent it was not really an untruth she told herself she did like them oh how she liked them though she did not know what they were i nearly began my beloved he said solemnly somehow she had expected it to be this why didn't you she asked a little disappointed i like the other so much better he replied to write it was so delicious to me i thought you would not mind i don't mind she said hastily what could it be but you would have preferred beloved it is such a sweet name surely not so sweet as the other grizel no she said no oh what could it be have you destroyed it he asked and the question was a shock to her her hand rose instinctively to defend something that lay near her heart i could not she whispered do you mean you wanted to he asked dolefully i thought you wanted it she murmured i he cried aghast and she was joyous again can't you guess where it is she said he understood grizel you carry my letter there she was full of glee but she puzzled him presently do you think i could go now she inquired eagerly and leave me it was dreadful of her but she nodded i want to go home is it not home grizel when you are with me i want to go away from home then she said it as if she loved to tantalize him but why i won't tell you she was looking wistfully at the door i have something to do it can wait it has waited too long he might have heard an assenting rustle from beneath her bodice 
do let me go she said coaxingly as if he held her i can't understand he began and broke off she was facing him demurely but exultantly challenging him he could see to read her now just when i am flattering myself that i know everything about you grizel he said with a long face i suddenly wonder whether i know anything she would have liked to clap her hands you must remember that we have changed places she told him it is i who understand you now and i am devoutly glad he made answer with humble thankfulness and i must ask you grizel why you want to run away from me but you think you know she retorted smartly you think i want to read my letter again her cleverness staggered him but i am right am i not grizel no she said triumphantly you are quite wrong oh if you knew how wrong you are and having thus again unhorsed him she made her excuses to ailey and slipped away dr jamel who was present and had been watching her narrowly misread the flush on her face and her restless desire to be gone is there anything between those two do you think mrs mclean had said in a twitter to him while tommy and grizel were talking and he had answered no almost sharply people are beginning to think there is she said in self-defence they are mistaken he told her curtly and it was about this time that grizel left david followed her to her home soon afterwards and maggie ann who answered his summons did not accompany him upstairs he was in the house daily and she left him to find grizel for himself he opened the parlour door almost as he knocked and she was there but had not heard him he stopped short like one who had blundered unawares on what was not for him she was on her knees on the hearth rug with her head buried in what had been dr mcqueen's chair ragged had been the seat of it on the day when she first went to live with him but very early on the following morning or to be precise five minutes after daybreak he had risen to see if there were burglars in the parlour and behold it was his grateful little maid repadding the old armchair how a situation repeats itself without disturbing her the old doctor had slipped away with a full heart it was what the young doctor did now but the situation was not quite the same she had been bubbling over with glee then she was sobbing now david could not know that it was a sob of joy he knew only that he had never seen her crying before and that it was the letter in her hands that had brought tears at last to those once tranquil and steadfast eyes in an odd conversation which had once taken place in that room between the two doctors jamel had said but the time may come without my knowing it and mcqueen's reply was i don't think so for she is so open but i'll tell you this david as a guide i never saw her eyes wet it is one of the touching things about her that she has the eyes of a man to whom it is a shame to cry if you ever see her greeting david i'm sore doubting that the time will have come as david jamel let himself softly out of the house to return to it presently he thought the time had come what he conceived he had to do was a hard thing but he never thought of not doing it he had kept himself in readiness to do it for many days now and he walked to it as firmly as if he were on his professional rounds he did not know that the skin round his eyes had contracted giving them the look of pain which always came there when he was sorry or pitiful or indignant he was not well acquainted with his eyes and had he glanced at them now in a glass would have presumed that this was their usual expression grizel herself opened the door to him this time and maggie ann he is found she cried victoriously evidently she had heard of his previous visit we have searched every room in the house for you she said gaily and had you disappeared for much longer maggie ann would have had the carpets up he excused himself on the ground that he had forgotten something and she chided him merrily for being forgetful as he sat with her 
david could have groaned aloud how vivacious she had become but she was sparkling in false colours after what he knew had been her distress of a few minutes ago it was a painted face to him she was trying to deceive him perhaps she suspected that he had seen her crying and now attired in all a woman's wiles she was defying him to believe his eyes grizel garbed in wiles alack the day she was shielding the man and jamel could have driven her away roughly to get at him but she was also standing over her own pride lest any one should see that it had fallen and do you think that david would have made her budge an inch of course she saw that he had something on his mind she knew those puckered eyes so well and had so often smoothed them for him what is it david she asked sympathetically i see you have come as a patient to-night as one of those patients he rejoined who feel better at mere sight of the doctor fear of the prescription said she not if you prescribe yourself grizel david she cried he had been paying compliments i mean it so i can see by your face oh david how stern you look dr mcqueen and i he retorted used to hold private meetings after you had gone to bed at which we agreed that you should no longer be allowed to make fun of us they came to nothing do you know why because i continued to do it no but because we missed it so much if you stopped you are nice to-night david she said dropping him a curtsy we liked all your bullying ways he went on we were children in your masterful hands i was a tyrant david she said looking properly ashamed i wonder you did not marry just to get rid of me have you ever seriously wondered why i don't marry he asked quickly oh david she exclaimed what else do you think your patients and i talk of when i am trying to nurse them it has agitated the town ever since you first walked up the merry well bray and we can't get on with our work for thinking of it seriously grizel she became grave at once if you could find the right woman she said wistfully i have found her he answered and then she pressed her hands together too excited to speak if she would only care a little for me he said grizel rocked her arms i am sure she does she cried david i am so glad he saw what her mistake was but pretended not to know that she had made one are you really glad that i love you grizel he asked it seemed to daze her for a moment not me david she said softly as if correcting him you don't mean that it is me she said coaxingly david she cried say it is not me he drooped his head but not before he had seen all the brightness die out of her face is it so painful to you even to hear me say it he asked gravely her joy had been selfish as her sorrow was for nigh a minute she had been thinking of herself alone it meant so much to her but now she jumped up and took his hands in hers poor david she said making much of his hand as if she had heard it but david jamel's was too simple a face to oppose to her pitying eyes and presently she let his hand slip from her and stood regarding him curiously he had to look another way and then she even smiled a little forlornly do you mind talking it over with me grizel he asked i have always been well aware that you did not care for me in that way but nevertheless i believe you might do worse no woman could do better she answered gravely i should like you to talk it over david if you begin at the beginning and she sat down with her hands crossed i won't say what a good thing it would be for me was his beginning we may take that for granted i don't think we can she remarked but it scarcely matters at present that is not the beginning david he was very anxious to make it the beginning i am weary of living in lodgings he said the practice suffers by my not being married 
many patients dislike being attended by a single man i ought to be in mcqueen's house it has been so long known as the doctor's house and you should be a doctor's wife you who could almost be the doctor it would be a shame grizel if you who are so much to patients were to marry out of the profession don't you follow me i follow you she replied but what does it matter you have not begun at the beginning he looked at her inquiringly you must begin she informed him by saying why you ask me to marry you when you don't love me she added in answer to another look from him you know you don't there was a little reproach in it oh david what made you think i could be so easily taken in he looked so miserable that by and by she smiled not so tremulously as before how bad at it you are david she said and how good at it she was he thought gloomily shall i help you out she asked gently but speaking with dignity you think i am unhappy you believe i am in the position in which you placed yourself of caring for someone who does not care for me grizel i mistrust him she flushed she was not quite so gentle now and so you offer me your hand to save me it was a great self-sacrifice david but you used not to be fond of doing showy things i did not mean it to be showy he answered she was well aware of that but oh david she cried that you should believe i needed it how little you must think of me does it look as if i thought little of you he said little of my strength david little of my pride i think so much of them that how could i stand by silently and watch them go you think you have seen that she was agitated now he hesitated yes he said courageously her eyes cried david how could you be so cruel but they did not daunt him have you not seen it yourself grizel he said she pressed her hands together i was so happy she said until you came have you not seen it yourself he asked again there may be better things she retorted than those you rate so highly not for you he said if they are gone she told him with a flush of resentment it is not you who can bring them back but let me try grizel said he david can i not even make you angry with me no grizel you can't i am very sorry that i can make you angry with me i am not she said dispiritedly it would be contemptible in me and then eagerly but david you have made a great mistake indeed you have you you are a dreadful bungler sir she was trying to make his face relax with a tremulous smile from herself to encourage him but the effort was not successful you see i can't even bully you now she said did that capacity go with the others david try a little harder he replied i think you will find that i submit to it still very well she forced some gaiety to her aid after all how could she let his monstrous stupidity wound a heart protected by such a letter you have been a very foolish and presumptuous boy she began she was standing up smiling wagging a reproachful but nervous finger at him if it were not that i have a weakness for seeing medical men making themselves ridiculous so that i may put them right i should be very indignant with you sir put me right grizel he said he was sure she was trying to blind him again know then david that i am not the poor spirited humble creature you seem to have come here in search of but you admitted how dare you interrupt me sir yes i admit that i am not quite as i was but i glory in it i used to be ostentatiously independent now i am only independent enough my pride made me walk on air now i walk on the earth where there is less chance of falling i have still confidence in myself but i begin to see that ways are not necessarily right because they are my ways in short david i am evidently on the road to being a model character they were gay words but she ended somewhat faintly 
i was satisfied with you as you were was the doctor's comment i wanted to excel you explain nothing grizel he said reproachfully why have you changed so because i am so happy do you remember how in the old days i sometimes danced for joy i could do it now are you engaged to be married grizel she took a quiet breath you have no right to question me in this way she said i think i have been very good in bearing with you so long but she laid aside her indignation at once he was so old a friend the sincerity of him had been so often tried if you must know david she said with a girlish frankness that became her better i am not engaged to be married and i must tell you nothing more she added shutting her mouth decisively she must be faithful to her promise he forbids it jamel asked mercilessly she stamped her foot not in rage but in hopelessness how incapable you are of doing him justice she cried if you only knew tell me i want to do him justice she sat down again sighing my attempt to regain my old power over you has not been very successful has it david we must not quarrel though holding out her hand which he grasped and you won't question me any more she said it appealingly never again he answered i never wanted to question you grizel i wanted only to marry you and that can't be i don't see it he said so stoutly that she was almost amused but he would not be pushed aside he had something more to say dr mcqueen wished it he said above all else in the world he wished it he often told me so he never said that to me grizel replied quickly because he thought that to press you was no way to make you care for me he hoped that it would come about it has not come about david with either of us she said gently i am sure that would have been sufficient answer to him no grizel it would not not now he had risen and his face was whiter than she had ever seen it i am going to hurt you grizel he said and every word was a pang to him i see no other way it has got to be done dr mcqueen often talked to me about the things that troubled you when you were a little girl the morbid fears you had then and that had all been swept away years before i knew you but though they had been long gone you were so much to him that he tried to think of everything that might happen to you in the future and he foresaw that they might possibly come back if she were ever to care for some false loon he had said to me and then grizel he could not go on grizel beat her hands if he could not go on she said it was not because he feared what i should do no no david answered eagerly he never feared for that but for your happiness he told me of a boy who used to torment you oh all so long ago and of such little account that he had forgotten his name but that boy has come back and you care for him and he is a false loon grizel she had risen too and was flashing fire on david but he went on if the time ever comes he said to me when you see her in torture from such a cause speak to her openly about it tell her it is i who am speaking through you it will be a hard task to you but wrestle through with it david in memory of any little kindness i may have done you and the great love i bore my grizel she was standing rigid now is there any more david she said in a low voice only this i admired you then as i admire you now i may not love you grizel but of this i am very sure he was speaking steadily he was forgetting no one that you are the noblest and bravest woman i have ever known and i promised he did not draw the promise from me i gave it to him that if i was a free man and could help you in any way without paining you by telling you these things i would try that way first and this is the way i could think of no other is it of no avail she shook her head you have made such a dreadful mistake she cried miserably and you won't see it oh how you wrong him i am the happiest girl in the world and it is he who makes me so happy but i can't explain you need not ask me i promised and i won't 
you used not to be so fond of mystery grizel i am not fond of it now ah it is he david said bitterly and he lifted his hat is there nothing you will let me do for you grizel he cried i thought you were to do so much for me when you came into this room she admitted wistfully and said that you were in love i thought it was with another woman he remembered that her face had brightened how could that have helped you he asked she saw that she had but to tell him and for her sake he would do it at once but she could not be so selfish we need not speak of that now she said we must speak of it he answered grizel it is but fair to me it may be so important to me you have shown that you don't care for her david and that ends it who is it he was much stirred if you don't know is it elspeth the question came out of him like a confession and hope turned grizel giddy do you love her david she cried but he hesitated is what you have told me true that it would help you he asked looking her full in the eyes do you love her she implored but he was determined to have her answer first is it grizel yes yes do you david and then he admitted that he did and she rocked her arms in joy but oh david to say such things to me when you were not a free man how badly you have treated elspeth to-day she does not care for me he said have you asked her in alarm no but could she how could she help it she would not tell him what tommy thought oh she must do everything to encourage david and still said he puzzling i don't see how it can affect you and i can't tell you she moaned oh david do do find out why are you so blind she could have shaken him don't you see that once elspeth was willing to be taken care of by some other person i must not tell you then he would marry you she cried in anxiety have i told you or did you find out i found out he said is it possible he is so fond of her as that there never was such a brother she answered she could not help adding but he is still fonder of me the doctor pulled his arm over his eyes and sat down again presently he was saying with a long face i came here to denounce the cause of your unhappiness and i begin to see it is myself of course it is you stupid david she said gleefully she was very kind to the man who had been willing to do so much for her but as the door closed on him she forgot him she even ceased to hear the warning voice he had brought with him from the dead she was re-reading the letter that began by calling her wife End of chapter 20